1960, I was 30 years old. My father taught me Pirkei Ovis, yeah? And Pirkei Ovis says, Bimkom she'ein anoshim yishtada v'yoshish. If there's nobody else doing the job, you've got to do it. can't fail. The Almighty is with us. If He helps us, we can't fail. And He wants to. We have a Torah which is beautiful beyond compare. We just have to present it the right way. We have a people who are thirsty for meaning, who are thirsty for truth, who are idealists in every way, who are the most charitable, the most active for the poor. They want truth, they want meaning. We have to do our job. We can't fail if we just make that effort. campus that there was there was supposed to be 400,000 Jews now they say there's 200,000 Jews we're shrinking it's do or die the Jewish people is is disappearing I say almighty I know that you care about this much more than me I know that you want me to succeed I know that if you help me, we can change the whole world. I know you want to help me. I know I just have to want it enough. Please help me to want it. To feel this pain the way you feel it. So that you can help me do it. That's what you gotta do. My dear friends, we are live on the saddest day of Jewish history. And we started off this live show with Rav Noach Weinberg. And the reason that I felt it's so important to show that video is because he was a man of love. He was a man that said, Ahavat I will love every single Jew baselessly for no reason. I will just love them. And we know that that is the reason for our rebuilding of the temple. That is the reason that we got the temple destroyed. And we also know that uh, that's how we can get the temple to rebuild is through love. And I believe that many people pass away, but we're also taught 
When a generation goes, there's a new generation that comes. And the Jewish people are not alone. We have great people with us. And we wanted to use and utilize this day as a day that we can be inspired, a day that we can use it to have hope. And I've I felt the need to bring on some of the people that have Ahavat Chinam, some people that have love within them, that have baseless love, that they feel that they love the Jewish people and they do it, they do it completely. And my friends, I want to tell you that it's baseless love is not just with people you don't know, because it's sometimes easier to be in kind and loving to the people that you don't know. But it also mainly starts with the people we know. It starts with the people behind our closed doors. And these people, I believe, are people of real love. And it's a day full of hope and inspiration uh, for our people. And um, I believe that all of what happened in the past in our history happened for a reason. We believe that everything happens for a reason. We may not know why, but we believe everything happens for a reason. And we don't just remember sad things uh, for what they were, but we also remember sad things um, because we want to have a hope and an aspiration for the future. We know that on this day, although it's the saddest day in history, and I'm going to tell you why, but also the Mashiach is born. By the way, my son, my oldest son, was born on this day. I don't know if he's Mashiach, but he was born two years ago on this day. And we also believe that in, in the darkest of places, there is a sense of hope. There's a light. There's inspiration that comes. And from here will be born our Yeshua, our salvation for all of our people. So anyone who's out there, you know, with what's going on with COVID-19 and how the world is in such chaos, we need to know that there's a light at the end of this tunnel. And that's why we felt that today we need to spread this light, spread the idea of hope, spread the idea of inspiration, but also remember and understand what happened on this day. So I just want to go quickly before we bring on Rabbi Klatsko, who's coming on at 11 o'clock, just go through some of what happened on this day and um, change the way we think slightly in terms of uh, how we approach our history and the pain that the Jewish people endured. So we know that biblically the story was that on this day, the spies went in to check out Israel and they returned with a bad report. They said that the people are too big and we are nothing. We are like grasshoppers. They didn't believe in themselves and they didn't have the right to interpret themselves that way. And they started crying. It was called a crying for nothing, a baseless cry. Again, that word baseless, but it was a cry that was for no reason. They could have used that energy for something else and they used for prayer, for hope, but they used that energy to cry for nothing. And that was a mistake uh, in terms of the Jewish people. And from then on, the Jewish people were told that we will cry on this day for many generations on. There's much more to that story, but I just want to take you through some of the history of what happened on this day and why we feel like this needs to be a full day of hope and inspiration. On the second, uh, both holy temples were destroyed on this way, on, on this day, uh, 423 uh, BCE, around 500 years before Common Era. The first temple was destroyed and also 70 years, uh, 69 years after Common Era, the temple, the second temple was destroyed. So both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. And by the way, the people that destroyed it didn't know that today is the 9th of Av. They just have their uh, Gregorian calendar. They don't have our calendar, the Jewish calendar, which mixes the, the lunar and solar calendar together. Our calendar always changes every year slightly because we also go by the moon and by the by the sun in terms of calculating our calendar so the people that caused all of this uh, that destroyed our first temple destroyed our second temple Nebuchadnezzar for two and a half years he was surrounding Jerusalem trying to get in and destroy uh, Jerusalem and get to the temple. After two and a half years, he eventually gets in. It was a long time. We had a lot of time to do Teshuvah, to come back, to become better. But eventually he destroyed it. And he destroyed it on a day that he didn't know. And it was the ninth of Av, the day that we were promised that anything bad can happen to us. And again, the second temple, the Jews were shocked to see almost 500 years later, 
that the second temple again was destroyed on the 9th of Av. And the next thing that happened was the big battle of Betal. There was over, there were millions of people living there. And they had this idea that Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Kochba, was uh, the Messiah. And he even Rabbi Akiva believed he was going to save the Jewish people. This was 133 CE, so almost 100 years, 50 years after the second temple was destroyed. And again, that place was uh, destroyed. And many, many Jews, millions of Jews were killed. Uh, on, on, and it happened to be again on the 9th of Av. The Romans plowed the Bet HaMidash. They fulfilled the prophecy of uh, Zion, Sadeh Ticharesh, that Zion, the whole, will be like a field that's emptied out. So they, they actually plowed out the temple. Uh, in 1290, many years later, in 1290, the, the Jews were expelled from England. And it happened to be on the day of the 9th of Av. The Jews were banished from Spain. In 1492, and again, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, said that on this day, the Jews need to go and leave the country. It was four months before that they made the decree that leave or convert. And again, the day that it happened was on the 9th of Av. My friends, this is crazy, but both world wars, First World War, 1914, started on Tisha B'Av. No one knows this. The world doesn't know this, but we know that the war started on Tisha B'Av. And again, uh, we know also that Hermann Goring, who came up with the final solution that said that all Jews um, must be killed uh, and we must come up with this way of killing them quickly and efficiently, the, the factory, the killing factory, that was made on the 8th of Av in 1941. Uh, the day before 9th of Av, on 1941, he made that, final solution. And then the year later, in 1942, the first big cart, 400,000 Jews were sent to Treblinka and the largest ghetto uh, and, and was killed. And that was the first train to go there to Treblinka was on, um, on 1942, the next year after, and it was on Tisha B'Av. So we see that Tisha B'Av uh, can, can, has been a big part of our history in the, a lot of the pain that we've had. The Chazon Ish was asked, so why don't we, you know, make an, a part of the Jewish religion a Holocaust Memorial Day? We should have a separate day to remember the Holocaust. One of the greatest rabbis that lived just after the Holocaust for many years after, but he, he was the greatest rabbi at the time. And they came to him and they said, listen, why don't we make part of the religion a Holocaust Memorial Day. And he said, no, 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 we have Tisha B'Av. And he was adamant about it. He says, we don't remember sad things just um, to remember sad things. We also have to use it for a hope for a better future. And when we see that there's a pattern, when we see there's a plan, we may not know and understand why, but when we see a plan, we also see that there's a hope. There's a hope for a future. And I will just tell you this, because whenever I say this to people, I'm like, look, here's the greatest proof, the greatest proof ever that we are the Jewish people. There's many anti-Semites that are saying, hey, look, you are not the same Jews as you used to be. Yeah, you, the Jews of today are not the real Jews. This is the new trope that's being used. Well, have you ever heard of Tisha B'Av? All of our history, all the bad things that happen in our history, and by the way, whenever they hurt us, they knew and they said clearly that we are Jews, right? In order to cause pogroms, they'll say we're Jews. They'll put our stars on us and they'll clearly point out that we're Jews. And throughout that history, right? It, Ferdinand and Isabella clearly said we were Jews and said we had to be banished from Spain. Hitler clearly said we were Jews. But it's if it's in your agenda to say we're not the real Jews, they'll use it. But wait a second, have you heard of 9th of Av? Have you heard of 9th of Av? 9th of Av is something that the world doesn't know about. But we know about and all our history, all of the bad things that happened in history happened on this day. Now, I'm going to just say one minute, take Rabbi Klatsko's time of one more minute. But I just need to say this as well. So many people come to me and say, OK, so how can God let this happen? How can God let this happen? And I tell them, you have to read what we read today in Echa. 
in the book of Lamentations that was written by Yirmiyahu, by the way, before the temple was destroyed. And on that book, he says, Hashem kilo tamu kilo chalu rachamav. Ha- The kindness of Hashem doesn't end. His mercy doesn't end. And he also says in the book of Lamentations, Mipi elyon lo It doesn't come from God, bad and good. Bad and good doesn't come from God. All that happened in the history happened on a certain date to remind us, hey, God's with us. But don't think that God did it. The Nazis did it. They, they, you're blaming the Nazis and God? Nachmanides says that before um, he asks a question when the Jews came into Egypt and they were, they were already foretold that they were going to go to Egypt. So why were the Egyptians punished? We knew Abraham was told before we even went into Egypt that we were going to be enslaved by the Egyptians. The decree came before. So why were the Egyptians punished? And Nachmanides explains we were punished because the Egyptians didn't have to be so cruel. Yes, we had to be slaves. We had to be subjugated by Egyptian uh, slavery. That was our exile then. But it didn't have to be that they were so cruel. They didn't have to take our children and, and kill them and hang them on walls. And what Pharaoh did was the source of all evil. They didn't have to be so cruel. And I say the same with the Nazis and the same with all our history. God kind of says, listen, if you don't follow a certain path, if you don't be a light, then I'm going to have to step back and let the world just do itself. And that's what happened. But it wasn't that God did it. It doesn't come from God. And there's somewhere else where it comes from as well. It comes from us. Our problems come from us. That's a Jewish philosophy. We look internally and say, Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? That is the words that we start on this lamentation. So I'm going to call up Rabbi Klatsko. Maybe I'll speak a bit more later on, but we have Rabbi Klatsko waiting here. I do not want to keep him. I'm going to call up uh, Rabbi Klatsko here and he's going to be speaking about his song, how he used songs to bring us closer and to understand what happened to the Jewish people. Here's Rabbi Klatsko with us. Thank you, Rabbi, for being here. It's uh, my pleasure. One day this is going to be a Yantif, so I'll already wish you all a good Yantif. And um, uh, we should feel, you know, the truth of the matter is there's a Yantif aspect to today that already exists. The Yantif aspect is that we care so much that we commemorate. That itself is a reason to celebrate how many how many Egyptians cry over broken pyramids or the Sphinx. They're not crying over it or old temples. They don't even care. And here Napoleon said this. Napoleon, uh, 200 years ago, he, uh, he conquered a, a country and went from city to city to check out its inhabitants. And there was this one large building, which turned out to be a bit Knesset, and he saw uh, the lights were on. So he and his soldiers walked in, and there were Jews sitting on the ground, and they were crying. And he said, what's the matter? Why are you crying like that? And they said, because our temple was destroyed. He said, where, 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 when did it happen? Yesterday, two days ago? Let me help you rebuild it. They said, no, 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 it happened 2,000 years ago. And he said, you're still crying about that? He said, if you're still crying, it means that one day you're going to get back because you care so much, you love so much. If a parent lost a child and stops crying, the parent has given up. But if the crying is still there, the longing is still there, it's going to happen. And uh, I, I thank you, Rabbi Malul, for putting together such a great program. I, I looked at the list of speakers I don't know what I'm doing on that list because oh, yes, really, really, really special people. And, and um, I hope that well, everyone if, I don't, if you don't mind me saying publicly that this is a day of uh, chesed. This is a day of understanding what it means to do chesed, to, to have avat chinam. And I believe that, Rabbi, you are an example of that. So we're very thankful that you are here hosting so many people for Shabbat. Unfortunately, I know your pain because we can't host so many people anymore on Shabbat. And it really is painful. For me and my wife, every Shabbat, we sit there and we say, where are all our Jewish brothers and sisters who are single and alone and they're without their families and we want them here with us. And it's just heartbreaking. And we want to open our home. Our doors are open still waiting for that day where we can have our Jewish brothers and sisters together again. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is painful, uh, but it also forces us to be creative. Like you're being creative now with this program. Exactly. It makes us think, um, what can I do that I never thought of before? What tools can I use? And Rabbi, I, can I ask you, can I, at, at any point, I have the video to show that you created to everybody. And I would love to show it to the community uh, that's watching here, the audience, because it, it really is so touching. Um, sure. it, last why night. We, why don't we start with that? Yeah. Last night I was, you know, you know, I have four little kids. So for them, they see daddy sitting on the floor, eating an egg and ashes and trying to be serious. And I'm crying, you know, and they jump on top of me and they think, oh, daddy's on the floor. So, my, you know, my, they all jump on top of me. And I said, right. you know what, let me just put on this video. And I put on your video, Rabbi, and um, I, I covered one or two parts because it's not for little children. But um, but in general, it's such a powerful message, and they really felt the churban. So I want to play it, and then you could tell us a bit about the videos. Okay, thank absolutely. you, Rabbi. Absolutely. Uh...
Wow. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi, for the beautiful work that you did. Was everyone able to hear my my explanation? Um, I hope not. I was explaining it to my uh, Facebook group <laughs> who are watching. Okay. So shall we continue? Yeah, please, okay. Rabbi, maybe explain and tell us uh, some some ideas of behind it, how it okay. was made. So, what's, what's the idea? Um, we have to take a, a few steps back. Um, the I'm a levy, and that's that means it would have been my job to sing in the base on Mikdash. Unfortunately, I'm over 50, so I would have had to retire because in the base on Mikdash at the age of 50, if you're a levy, you retire. So, uh, unless I go back in time, I'm not going to be able to sing in the base on Mikdash. However, uh, music was always very much part of my life. And when I was young, I was brought in front of Ramesha Feinstein to sing to him some of my compositions I brought was brought to his house. And it was very meaningful. Uh, obviously, Ramesha Feinstein has a lot to do with his time instead of listening to a young Bacher sing. But he, he was machshev. Uh, he was machshev of me, he was machshev of it, and it was very inspiring to be able to sing in front of Ramosha. I'm going to actually lower this a little more. Okay. And, and, I, and I'll be forever grateful that I was able to do that because uh, that gave me inspiration to do music. Uh, my kids are writing a safer, two of my kids, um, and the name of the safer is going to be called Shevas Achim. And it's really just the questions and answers that they asked and answered to each other. So one of my sons, the Bo Baruch Hashem, Talmid HaChachamim, one would ask, the other would answer, and back and forth. And one of the questions that I saw in this upcoming Sefer was uh, one of the one of my sons wanted to know if the, these words for the Chassam Sofer are accurate. The Chassam Sofer said he would give up his a third of his learning, a third of his Torah knowledge in order to understand the Shar Anigun, the, 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 the gates of music. And, uh, you know, the other son answered that it actually could be an accurate quote. Um, when I made up this song, this song, uh, I made it many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I think I was married at the time. Uh, you know, I wasn't singing my own stuff. I don't have a great voice, as you heard. But, you know, it's it's decent enough if you put a nice video. And I offered it with a few other songs. And MBD, Mordechai Ben David, who's a very popular Hasidic singer, he 
uh, he wanted this song, and I decided not to not to give it away. And maybe to one day I produce my own album. And years later, I started producing an album, and it was unique. It had A.B. Rottenberg on it. It was a very famous singer. Emma Schmendewitz and Israel Williger. And this song was actually done 22 years ago originally. And then my brother passed away, and uh, the, the album, which was probably 75% done, ended. I, I just had to stop. I went into the Rabbanus. I went into Kiruv. I started, I moved to California, UCLA. There was no time to do music, musical production. And in those days where music was not done digitally, it was done analog, it took a long time to produce even one song. So I always thought, okay, maybe one day I'll get back to it. And I never really did. And that song, the music and the vocals, everything about it was just dated, old. It just didn't, didn't sound so nice anymore. And over COVID, a little before COVID, but then certainly during COVID, when we had a little more time at home, uh, I found myself a music producer. He actually ended up in uh, my house stuck during COVID. He ended up living here. And we began churning out music. And, uh, oh, you know, I have hundreds of compositions. And I, I said, I'll just keep you busy the entire time. I'll give you one song after the next, after the next. And uh, I'll even just put in a little a little promo. Uh, this song was a very heavy song. Uh, as soon as... The, as soon as Tisha B'Av is over, maybe the next week, we're putting out a totally different kind of song. Uh, and the name of the song is called The Aliyah Song. The Aliyah Song. And the song is all about that people should consider making Aliyah. Now, it sounds strange because I live in Muncie. So why am I telling everyone to do Aliyah? Well, number one, I, I do expect to live in Eretz Israel. It's part of, my, part of the plan. My house is even on the market. Uh, always one foot out the door. But the idea that we love Eretz Yisrael so much, uh, I wanted one song out there uh, that would really just say, fellas, pack your bags, board your flight. The time is right. And the time really is right. So I teamed up with a, a dear friend. Actually, we made the video for his organization called uh, Bring, Bring Them Home. It's the name of the organization. Helps people with Aliyah. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'll even give you the, the website. We'll give a little, a little promo for Bring Them Home. Uh, and, av and after we made this, uh, this thing called Bring Them Home, um, together with his name is Josh Wander and another lady by the name of Yafi Dykeman, together we made this video. And it's happy. It's upbeat. It shows falafel and cafe, cafe and beautiful. Uh, just the whole thing is, is uh, something that's very inspiring for people. And uh, IsraelToro.org is the website. So if you're interested, go to IsraelToro.org. And it's all about considering making Aliyah. Anyhow, so that was an upbeat song. This, this song, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it again. After all, I've been holding on to it forever. And uh, I, I can't give it to you, but it's not, it's not up yet. I will give it to Rabbi Malul uh, as soon as we put it on. YouTube, you'll you'll enjoy it very much. You'll, uh, I showed it to a few people, and two people came over, and they said, "Where do I sign up? I want to move to Eretz Israel? Where do I sign up?" So that was very exciting that a song could have that effect. But this song could have the same effect when you see a base on Migdash being destroyed. Uh, to me, the most powerful part of a song is actually the shofar being blown. When you hear that shofar, and then you see everyone coming from all the different corners, walking through the streets, heading towards Yerushalayim. Uh, that tells you that w that could be us, that should be us, that will be us. So we have a few minutes over here. So we, we put out this this song. Uh, it's got a little, little interesting backstory to it, which I don't uh, I don't think I'm going to share now. Uh, but I will tell you that, that it's... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of letters and emails and text messages and phone calls from people saying that uh, th this song has inspired them on, on Tisha B'Av and before in ways that they were never that they were never inspired. So I'm very, very grateful to Hashem. Uh, probably uh, going to take it down, uh, at least the a cappella version, after Yom Tov. Uh, but at least um, uh, we're able to see it and feel it, and that's very powerful. 
Rabbi, can you, can you, if you don't mind, translate the words a bit and explain uh, what the words are? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the song, the words are not really Tish above words. The words um, really come from Yom Tov Davening, particularly the, the way these words are broken up. It's a Rosh Hashanah Davening, which is very appropriate because Rosh Hashanah is in exactly, exactly uh, uh, eight weeks. Uh, no, a little bit less. Says seven weeks, seven weeks from now is Rosh Hashanah. So the words are Omitnei Chata Einu. And because of our transgressions, because of our Lashon Ara, because of our Chilul Shabbat, because of our not being careful about Kashrut, because we don't put on Tfilin, because Sniut is not important to us, because of these Averos, Golinu Me'artzenu, we were exiled from our land. And we were sent far from our 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 homeland, our, our earth, that same land that, that Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem, we just read in the Parshvas, Hanan al Hashem. Hashem said, All I want, Moshe Rabbeinu said, All I want is to go to Eretz Yisrael and then I'm, I could die. Let me just walk the length and the width of the land, gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent, stunning Eretz Yisrael. We were sent away from it. I just saw a video, the 10 best countries in the world. And I, I was so disappointed. Why isn't Eretz Yisrael there? Like this non-Jew made the video. And he wrote 10 best countries. And of course, he's got Denmark and Sweden and Germany. America is an honorable mention. It didn't make it in his top 10, even though he's an American. But Israel is nowhere to be found. And I'm thinking, first I'm thinking, one second, I can make a case for Israel. You know, the, the, the low crime rate, uh, the, the, uh, even, even terrorism uh, in Israel proper, in Baruch Hashem, we built a wall, and uh, you don't have uh, such infiltration. Of course, once in a while something happens and it's tragic, but the, the friendliness and the beauty and the scenery and the history, there's so much to love about Eretzel. Why didn't this guy just put Eretzel as one of, the, one of the ten, if not the number one? Then I realized he doesn't get it. Kevin Rachel's not important. The Kaisel's not important to him. To us, the Yalde Yerushalayim, the children of Jerusalem, they have that special chain. We were sent away. And we can't do our obligation, but it's not just an obligation. It's it's our our duty as part of the relationship to have this on mikdash and to have a carbon tumid, the sacrifices and 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 the the avod of the beis mikdash. Can we imagine three times a year? Right, Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuos, we come streaming up by the millions, destroyed, slaughtered. There's a mosque. You know, that's like a. If I would tell you there's a shopping mall where the Beis Hamikdash used to be, you'd shut a shopping mall, a Best Buy, a Target, a shopping mall. Well. We should shudder 50 times more to know that there's a mosque there. And yet, here we go, we got a mosque. Woy, vey, vey, vey. So we end the song, Yiratzon, may it be your will that you should bring us close again. Hashem, my God, God of my fathers, of our fathers, bring us back so we can once again serve you. So, song, let's like stick to the topic. So we want song, we want song. So I want to tell you a story. I uh, ran an Israel trip. And there was a young lady named Stacy who was on that Israel trip. It's a wonderful trip. And during the trip, we went crawling through the Bar Kochvo caves I'm very claustrophobic. It's incredibly uncomfortable for me. Uh, the truth of the matter is I wasn't going to go because uh, I'm claustrophobic. And uh, if you've never crawled through the tunnels to get to the caves, the Markovo caves, 
you know that you're crawling through tunnels that are so narrow that you're underneath the ground, you're in the earth, and you're crawling, and you can't stand up. It's pitch black, and if you're going with a group, you're crawling through these tunnels, and there's 40, 50 people, 20 in front of you, 20 in back of you. So you can't even back out. You're literally squished on all sides with darkness. I know that sounds horrific, but it is horrific. And um, and then there are some places where the tunnel that you're crawling through is so narrow, you can't even crawl. You have to slither like a snake on your stomach. And you can't stand up there like the top of the tunnel is there. And that's, of course, where the... Uh, how the Jews hid from the Romans before the Romans eventually slaughtered all of them. So those tunnels still exist. And I wasn't going to go because I'm claustrophobic. To me, like much greater spaces can can really f make me feel confined. And one of my students turned to me and they said, Rabbi, aren't you always telling us you have to overcome? You have to, you have to become bigger. You've got to overcome your nature and you want us to overcome, not to drive on Shabbat, to, to be careful about new, to be careful about Lashonar, to overcome. So Rabbi, this is a challenge. You want us to overcome? Let's see you overcome. And I'm like, oh no, they have me, they have me cornered. What am I gonna do? And then I thought, okay, I guess I'm gonna try to overcome. And I uh and I went through those tunnels and I'll be honest, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> it was, I, I haven't done it since. It's just way too, way too painful. However, in the bowels of the earth, right when you're crawling, there's a, this cave-like area where you could actually sit up in a group, as a group. And then you continue through this tunnel afterwards. But there's one area in the middle of the ground where you where you could gather. And I guess that's that was the point of it. Bar Kofo and his his group crawling through these caves are we able to be in, in this area. And sometimes the tour guide brings little candles, little tea lights. And when when we lit the candles, I began to sing. And I sang a song, uh, which I'm sure you all know, famous song. That goes like this. Tov lahadas l'ashem. Tov lahadas l'ashem. Ulezamer. You all know the song. It's beautiful. And most of my students didn't know the words. But we try to teach the words. And then for those of them that didn't, that couldn't learn it, we just did the tune. So after singing it, we sang Da 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 la da 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 da. We're singing it so beautiful, it was so holy. And then the trip was over, and we came home. And a lot of the students, we followed up with them, and they got more into their Judaism. But something happened. I don't know, Stacy, who was so into it during the trip and before the trip, went dark. The connection went dark. We didn't know what's going on. Why isn't Stacy coming over for Shabbat? Why isn't and uh, you know it's a little hurtful to be honest. If you're a rabbi and you invest in somebody, and you know they, they, whether or not they're interested in the Judaism, but be a man, say hello, just be, be you know be be nice, be normal. Satov, gratitude, nothing. Then one day I'm on campus, and I see her at the coffee shop. And she's right in front of me. And I'm thinking, okay, do I say something? Am I a little bit strong? Do I say, hey, where are you? Why aren't you returning phone calls? Like, I want to say something. But then I realized, no, now is not the time to say anything. Instead, I looked at her and I just began to sing. And I sang, the Hagid Baboker. She says, okay, Rabbi, I get it, I get it. Okay, we have to meet. So we, I said, let's do it now. We went outside. We each had our cup of coffee. We talked and we reconnected. And we're still connected today. So the power of song is huge. 
The power of song is so important that to bring a carbon, there needs to be music in the background. The power of song is so important that the holiest time in the year, what's the holiest time in the year? <clears throat> of course we know, holiest time is called Friday night. You thought I was going to say Yom Kippur, but no, Friday night. Friday night, when you're welcoming in the angels, when you're welcoming in Shabbos HaMalka, you're welcoming in the Shabbos Queen, the Shechina, and you dress to the nines, and the kids and the family and the food and the smell, it is the perfect moment to be engulfed with Judaism. Those who don't have Shabbos in their lives, I feel bad for them genuinely, truly. You're missing out big time. You're not, you're not activated. That Shabbos, and how do we start it? So I have students who come to me. For some of them, it's their first Shabbos ever. And they're expecting, okay, we're going to eat. No, we don't eat yet. We begin to sing. And in our house, we sing and we dance. There's a lot of tunes for Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. That's the famous tune. And then we used to do Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Ashar. It's the Regesh tune. Recently, we changed tunes. We have a third tune, also a well-known tune, um, a, a more recent tune. But uh, that's our tune probably for the next few years. Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharis, Malachi, Malachi Yelion. If you don't know this, you should look it up because it's so gorgeous. Mihi Melech Malachi, Malachi Amelach, Makadosh, Hakadosh Baruch And we dance around the table. And our guests who have not done Shabbos before, they're looking around and they're saying, that's a little bit strange. I thought we came to eat. I said, no, we came to connect to Hashem. And you know how we connect to Hashem the best? Through singing. That at the heart, the soul, we have to welcome in Shabbos. And then we connect to Judaism and Torah and our wives through another song. It's really so interesting because in Judaism, we don't really have love songs. We don't have, we have love songs to Hashem, but we don't really have love songs to our spouses. It's just, it just has never been part of Judaism. And sometimes I felt like, oh, wow, we're missing out a little bit because we want to be in love with our spouse we are love and we want to express it. And what better way to express it than through song? But there are no love songs in Judaism. But there, there are. And Aisha Chayel is certainly one of them. Shira Shira has, has some more beautiful words that you could use as love songs or make up your own no question. It exists. But that's how we begin Kedusha. We begin with holiness. Yom Kippur. <clears throat> what would Yom Kippur be? Without Kol Nidre, starting off Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre, Vyasare. We bring Yom Kippur upon our shoulders, upon our head, through music. <clears throat> you know when that music was made up? You know when that song was composed, the music for that song? That song was composed during an auto de fe. That's an auto de fe. That's what they did in the Spanish Inquisition when they suspected a Murano of actually being a Jew, a practicing Christian, being a hidden Jew. They would take this Jew, they would force a confession out of this Jew through the worst torture imaginable, and then they would parade the Jew through the street. And when they would parade the Jew through the street, they would put on them this garment like a sign if they confessed they would have a cross and a white background and if they didn't confess they'd have a cross with a red background and they were each brought and they were tortured and then they were brought to the center of town and they were burnt at the stake 
in a gr in a gruesome practice called an auto de fe. I was in Spain and I brought a group to the exact spot where the auto de fe's used to take place, where Jews, you would see a Jew, their skin melted off of them until they were burnt, until they were black. And all that you saw were teeth and skeletal remains. And then soon, even that was simply ash from a person, a living being to ash, all because they practiced Judaism. So there was a great tzaddik. He was burnt at the stake in the order de fe, and somebody saw it, and they composed the tune for Kol Nidre during the order de fe. Music, it inspires, it envelops us, it makes us want to cling and connect to Hashem. Shabbos, we want to welcome Shabbos and Shul. L'chadodi. And it's not just one tune, we do at least two tunes. As the Geula comes closer, as we become more besimcha, so we, we quicken up the tune by Lo Sevoshi. Wherever you go, you could start singing. L'chadodi, l'ikras kala, p'nei Shabbos, n'kabela. And people right away will join in. And if you don't want to do that one, then you do the other one. What's the other one? It's so beautiful. It's so powerful. It's so real. It's the it's the the koach of sheer. You can move mountains with music. Aside from COVID. I bring my group to Eretz Yisrael and we sing L'chadodi in Tzvat where it was composed by Rishlom Al-Kabetz and we, we're on top of the mountain and we're singing and dancing L'chadodi L'chadodi L'kra and it's so holy and then finally we get up to the very end of Lechadodi, Boi Shalom. And I say, everyone, let's just stand on the mountaintop and welcome in Shabbat. We all stand and we meditate, overlooking as the sun has set in Tzvat and as it creeps down and as Meron and Tiveria get darker, you see them in the mountaintop, from the mountaintop of Tzvat. And we sing, it's so beautiful, it's so holy. You want to bring Geula? I have I, I have a little bit of a little bit of advice for you. Get into Jewish music. Crank down the non-Jewish music. I have a lot of reasons for saying that. Often the messages are not our messages. Sometimes they're over-sexualized, they're debasing, they're degrading. The people who sing them, coming out more and more if you follow the news, some of them are actual Jew haters, the literal anti-Semites. Could we listen to music from an anti-Semite? Many of them are people who cheat on their marriages. They're people who, as as people, they're just not. They're not the they're not the role models. They're not the examples. And we know music. That's an outpouring of the neshama. It's an outpouring of the soul. How do we listen to music from a person whose very innards are decrepit and 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 rotten and and and, uh, and corrupt? Even if they could, even if they could sing a good beat or make up cute and fancy lyrics. But why in the world would I want that to, to get into my ears, into my head, into my heart? I was young. There was very little good Jewish music out there. There was very little Jewish music at all. There was Mordechai ben David and Shalma Kalbach and the Rabbi Sons and Orchad. There was very little. Today, there's every style, every type. If you haven't heard him yet, there's a wonderful singer. I hope one day to meet him. His name is Yishai Rebo. 
my wife and my children, we all enjoy his music so from the heart, so sincere, so pure, so real. That's what music can do. We have the ability to bring the geula, but we can't leave out the equation of music. So if there are songs that you sing at the Shabbat table, but they're not, you don't enjoy the music, then it's hard to say that you're being inspired by them. So maybe compose a different one or find a different one. I'll even tell you, uh, one of my goals is to compose new Shabbat music. I'm sure the rabbi will pass it on, look up and see on Klatsko. You'll see a beautiful Yona Matza, a beautiful Yedid Nefesh, a beautiful Chai Hashem. We're coming out with a Duror Yikra soon. We shouldn't lose the opportunity to use music to bring the geula. And so it was when the Levian, together with the rest of Klai Yisrael, were schlepped out of Eretz Yisrael and they left Yerushalayim. The Babylonians, they saw them with their harps, their, their, their lyres, their, their, uh, their musical instruments, and they said, guys, Sing something for us. Sing the songs that you sang in the temple. We heard that they're extraordinarily beautiful. We want you to sing for us. And the Jewish people answered, as we read in Al Naros Bavel and that part of Psalms and that part of Tehillim, the Jews said, Eich Nashir Shir Hashem, Al Admas Nechar. How can we sing? the holy songs, the songs of the Almighty on this foreign land to a foreign people as if it was just their plaything. God forbid. God forbid. Music has that power to stir within us the longer to come home, the longer to be more Jewish, more connected Jewishly. I'll tell you a little secret. I'll end with this. Do you want to know how connected you are to Judaism? Siman ledavar, a sign. Here's the sign. How much Jewish music do you know? Sounds strange. I bet you never heard a rabbi say this, but it's true. If you go to some non-religious camps or gatherings, they all know the same 10 songs. Hava Nagilai Venu Shalom, Shalom. You know the 10. I know the 10. If I were to take any of my kids who are growing up with a passion for Judaism, they easily know more than more than a thousand songs. Easily more than a thousand. Why is it that the more connected to Hashem you are, the more music you know? It's simple. Because music says, I want to connect to you. And the more connected you are, the more ways you want to express that connection. So you'll think of 10 Ani Mamans and 12 Acha Shaltis. Because it's so beautiful. I want to connect to you, Hashem, so badly. I'm going to think of all sorts of ways. A fast Ani Maman and a slow Ani Maman. So this Tish above, my time is up over here. This Tish above. I want to wish you each a bracha, a blessing that you should absorb the song of Yiddishkeit, the song of Yahadut. Remember, next week we have the Aliyah song. Let song sweep you off your feet and let it bring you to the promised land, both emotionally, spiritually, and Bezrat Hashem physically. Som kal, everyone, easy, fast, and meaningful fast. Thank you, Rabbi Klatsko, for your beautiful words of inspiration and hope through song. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. We should. Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Menashuva Chadeshi Amenu Kakedem. Hashem should bring us back and we should feel the renewal and you're helping us get there. So thank you, Rabbi, for your words, for your chesed, for your love. And we should, uh, we should end this day with a celebration, hopefully. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Rebbiton Sharon Shanka. Um, she was just on the studio. I'm sure she will be back. 
Uh, here she is. She's coming up and she works together with us. Um, very fortunate. Another lady of Chesed, of uh, Olam Chesed Yibane, a person that's so involved with outreach and being there for the Jewish community. So we are here proud to work um, with Rebetzin Shankar. She works on a different division, but part of HLA. So we are very thankful that she's here. Thank you, Rebetzin, uh, for being here Hi. with us today. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Ready. Yep, they can. Hi, Rabbi, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Everyone else is on YouTube or Facebook watching can you. you nod now. if you can hear me because it's completely silent from where I am. And hi, everyone. You can. Okay, great. So, so today, it's Tisha B'Av. It's the day when we're mourning the loss of the two temples. So how are we going to rebuild the next temple? We, we know that Tisha B'Av was, the temples were destroyed because of baseless hatred. And we have to like find positive love. So we have two temples on the side of our minds, on the side of our heads, on the side of our brains that hold the seat of our minds. And that's where destruction begins. These two temples contain within it our thoughts, our responses, our choices, our actions. Every thought defines how we're going to feel. Our emotions create our emotions, but it all starts here. So I want to talk today about judging favorably because every single day as we walk about our day, we judge people negatively, positively. We look them up and down and we decide, we put them into a box. Are they like us? Are they not like us? So but the Torah's got this intriguing mitzvah. And the mitzvah is that we have to judge. The Torah says you've got to judge your fellow man justly. But the commentary explains, judge your fellow man ju judge, um, justly, and you have to judge all of his actions and words only to the good. So I want to say that in here is our ability to make excuses to make the other person look good. Imagine a world where everybody did that, they thought, they, they acted, they spoke in certain ways, but you walked around with the mindset inside of these two temples of my job is to create excuses to make everyone look good. Not only would you have greater positivity, but you would exude that into the rest of the world. So this is 3,000 years ago, before the advent of cognitive psychology. I'm a therapist as well. The Torah came along and recognized that our attitudes, our attitudes, and therefore our words and our actions, because that's what flows from how we think, are formed not by what other people say and do, but it's by the way we interpret what other people say and do. So our attitudes aren't formed by what we see everyone else do. They're formed by the way we interpret that. And that's why I can be standing next to Sarah or Jim or anyone seeing exactly the same thing, hearing exactly the same thing. I can perceive it negatively and they can perceive it positively because it's by the way we interpret. And that happens up here. That happens between our two temples. And we don't want to come from a place of destruction. We want to come from a place of love. So how do we interpret what they do? That comes from our family background, our past relationships, the last movie that we saw, social media, um, the cultural background that we're from is created who we are. Our childhood memories, the insights that we have from that. That's our makeup, but we can modify that. We can change that, but it starts by being aware. So therefore, the Torah says you've got to find and devise a favorable interpretation, make excuses to make everyone else look good. Now, there are two positions that we can be in ever. <sighs> position of strength, P for position, O for of, and S for strength, P-O-S, positive. You're smiling. POS, position of strength, you're positive, you're happy, you're smiling, things bounce off you. Or a position, P for position, O for of, W for weakness, a position of weakness, position of strength or a position of weakness. 
position of weakness, P-O-W, you're like a prisoner of war. You're defensive. You hold contempt. You're ready to fight back. You're throwing back the punches all the time. So a position of strength looks like this. My husband can come down in the morning and say, oh, you're wearing that. And I say, yes, I love this top. Isn't it wonderful? Such a nice color. Makes me feel so good. He can come down the next morning, same intonation in his voice and say, oh, you're wearing that. Now, if I'm in a position of weakness, I'm defensive, ready to throw a punch. I'm going to say, yes, but I'm leaving the house right now. Is there a problem with that? I don't look good. Does it make me look fat? How's it? What's going Oh, come on. And I would get angry with the sender because I'm in a position of weakness. Things don't bounce. I'm not happy. So you can, and that's with the boss, with the mother, with the sister, with the sibling, with the partner, with the children. It's all about if I'm in a position of strength or weakness. So how can I change from a position of weakness to strength? Again, it's giving the benefit of the doubt. Dan um, being able to give the benefit of the doubt and judge favorably. So, it means that I get to go through my day creating excuses to make the other person look good. If they're late, if they're late to meet me, oh, they must have got stuck on the, on the freeway. Oh, the traffic on the 405, isn't it a nightmare? So what this mitzvah does is it pulls away the rug from under your feet that has this critical condemning uh, attitude that characterizes a lot of our relationships. We don't want it to be that way. Today is a day where we say, let's build awareness. Let's understand what's happening in our thoughts that create discontent in relationship, that create and build resentment. So this mitzvah pulls the rug, judging favorably, making excuses to make other people look good. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. So the result is we get to create this positive, sympathetic attitude towards others. When we don't think badly about them, we don't speak badly about them, we don't act in vengeful, nasty behaviors about them. So the um, so we're going to practice, okay? I know I can't hear you and I can't see you, so I'm going to leave it to you to come up with your own ideas and I'll fill in the gap. So let's say. There's a, there's a group of women in Jerusalem, by the way, this is only in an Israel story, group of women in Jerusalem. They meet every single week and they just come up with scenarios where they can practice making excuses to make the other person look good and doing this mitzvah. They're stellar in the mitzvah of judging favorably. So here's a few examples that I think might work for you. So let's say you, you're in a group of friends and Everyone, someone's, someone's getting married, everyone gets an invite, and you don't. Rather than building resentment and being unhappy and ugh, what's going to be and how can they do that, and that's so, let's make excuses. What do you think? Perhaps it got lost in the mail. Perhaps they had to make a smaller ceremony and they're not as close to you as they are with other people. Perhaps they were meant to get your address and, and then they never got around to it. Perhaps they forgot. Perhaps the list was cut in half by the mother-in-law. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. But when you think this way, it changes the negativity to positivity or at least balance. It takes the edge off. There's another one. Let's say you, you go to a store and Nordstrom, Nordstrom Rack, and you're in the store in Nordstrom Rack, and you're getting up to the counter. There's a long line. You finally get to the counter, and the person behind the counter is just takes you, not giving you eye contact, and she's moody, and she's bringing your products to her with huffs and puffs. And she finally, you finally say, okay, and she says, okay, card, can you put your card in? And she's really showing attitude. So what can you do? You can either move into this, ugh, this woman is disgusting this critical condemning attitude, or you could do the mitzvah of judging favorably. What could happen? Come up with an excuse. Okay, I'm assuming you've come up with something. I'll fill in the gaps. Maybe her dog died. Maybe the woman in front of you at the counter was so rude to her, it put her into a negative space. Maybe her boss just said, this was the last day that she was gonna be working. She has to finish out her shift. Maybe she didn't eat that morning because she couldn't afford it. 
Maybe she just broke up with her boyfriend. Maybe maybes enable you to act with compassion and love and understanding. And perhaps when you do that, they turn to you and say, oh, thank you for being so nice. I really, I really appreciated you. But it's about the focus on the giving. Let's say you're walking down the street with loads of heavy packages and it starts raining and your friend drives past in a minivan and all the seats are empty. They're all empty. And she doesn't offer a ride. She doesn't even offer you a ride. She doesn't even notice you. But you do get a little bit of eye contact as she drives on. What could have happened? Rather than calling up a friend, she just drove past me. Isn't that so rude? I'm here with my bags and it's just started. Right? Da, 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 which gives you the attention, makes you the victim. Let's trade that around. How can I make excuses to make her look good? How about she's about to pick up eight people in the eight-seater van? How about she didn't notice you? How about she's only, she has, it's not her car and she's got to rush back to go somewhere. How about she is really sick and doesn't want you in the car to spread germs? And again, it goes on and on. It's your job between these temples for you to act. And your thoughts determine the, the experience, the reality of your day. So it's up to you. But it doesn't just stop here. It impacts everyone around you. It impacts all the people, your family, your friends, your, your colleagues at work. When you go in down and frustrated and angry or you go in balanced and calm in a position of strength, not one of weakness. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you three strategies in order to do this mitzvah, especially on a day like today where we can judge people favorably give them the benefit of the doubt to exude love with purpose because it's a mitzvah. Strategy number one, it says in Ethics of the Fathers, don't judge your friend until you reach their place. We're never in someone else's place, but don't judge your friends or you can't walk a mile unless you're in someone else's moccasins. That's an American quote. I hope I've got it correct. You can't ever really be in someone else's shoes. So you have to give the benefit of the doubt. If, you know, I heard a story that someone employed a, a guy and the guy was so happy that he started working with this mentor and he gave him everything and he learned from him and he, he doubled his business and he worked and worked and worked. And the guy let him go after a year and a half. And, and he didn't understand what happened. So perhaps if you had his, his mortgage or his size family or his debt or his problems, you would have done the same thing. But we don't know because you're not in the other person's shoes. Maybe you would have done the same thing in that situation. But let's say also the other way around, your employee quits to go and work for your main competitor who might be paying a little bit more. Again, maybe you don't have their debt or their worries or their size family. We can never judge someone unless we're in their shoes. So there was a, a video that went around probably 10 years ago. You can all check it out. It's on YouTube. Just type in get service and, or, you, or on uh, Google and it will come up, get service. So there's this guy and he's walking down the front stairs. He's desperate to get a coffee and to come back to his home office. He's got to work. And the entire video is a, 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 a speech of what's happening inside his head, his internal grumblings, his internal dissatisfaction. And that's what happens. So I want to show you this video. Guy is coming down the stairs and he says, again, inside his mind, oh, I'm, I just need a coffee. I'm so late. Oh, I can't believe this. He gets into the car, puts it into reverse. And as he's backing out, he slams on the brake because there's a kid on the skateboard who's behind his car and he nearly hits him. And he says, oh, where are his parents? Why is never anyone home? This kid's always doing this to me. What's his problem? Where are his parents? He finally gets into the car and he's off and he turns right into a lane of traffic. Why can't the city council deal with this? There need to be more stop signs. There need to be traffic lights. They can't handle this. There's always traffic on this street. They're inept. 
he finally says, got to get my coffee. And he pulls into the parking lot and there are cars in every space. And he's going up and down. There should be more parking here. They need to acquire more space, more lots. This isn't satisfactory. This is what they're doing to me. Oh, and he finally finds a space. And just as he's about to pull into it, this red car takes his place. And he gets so angry and he goes, oh, and a woman gets out the car and he says, oh, princess of parking, look at her. He finally finds the space, gets out his car and walks into the, the coffee shop. And as he does, there's a line all the way to the back of the door. Why can't they get staff that are quick enough to deal with the people here? The people in the back end, they're not working fast enough. Oh, it's always the same way. Why can't anyone do their job properly? I know how to do it all. He finally gets to the counter and the guy in the green apron says to him, hey, mate, I just want to let you know we're, we're a bit back up, backlogged. And if you take a seat, we'll bring you your order. And he's like, oh, he's looking at his watch. This is ridiculous. Why can't you work fast enough? And all of a sudden, the guy who's just finished his order comes back in and says, oh, mate, can I just have a cookie on that order, please? And the man says, um, hello, am I invisible? You've had your turn. Um, wait your turn again. And the guy behind the counter says, yes, mate, I put that on your order. Thank you. And he sits down and he's so unhappy. He's so moody. And all of a sudden, this, this very tall guy in a green suit comes right up to him, right up to this. And he reaches into his pocket as though he's taking a gun out, reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a glasses case and he hands it to him. He's like, oh, what do you want me to do with this? What's going on? And he opens up the case and he puts on these glasses and all of a sudden, everyone he sees has a caption across their chest when he puts these glasses on. And the captions are, what's going on in their life? Because you can never judge someone's strategy one until you're in their shoes, their place. We're told in Pick It Up Us. So the guy who picked up the cookie, all of a sudden he notices he's sitting there with his son. And he says, just lost his job. And he turns around, he sees a woman, it says, fearful of relationships and all of a sudden the guy in the green apron coming with his coffee it says fighting addiction and just left home two weeks ago as a teenager there's another struggling with a sense of purpose struggling with addiction and he just can't take anymore so he leaves the coffee shop and as he leaves it he he pushes open the door and there's this big curly man in a lumberjack shirt with a big mustache, really strong looking. And it says, just needs a hug. And he turns around because he can't cope and he sees a woman holding two kids. It says working two jobs to support her family. And he continues and continues and he gets in his car with his coffee and he drives home. And everyone he sees in the cars next to him even the person who cuts him up, he sees that they're struggling to get to a job interview because they have so much debt, discontent with life, avoids relationship because of fear of pain. And then he, he sees, before he gets in the car, he sees the princess of parking, remember the red car? And it says grieving the loss of her best friend. So maybe she didn't notice could use a ride, ran away from home three days ago, just got diagnosed with a serious illness. And it goes on, he finally pulls into his home. And as he does, the kid on the skateboard rides past him and his caption says, need someone to care for me. And the guy gets out of his car and he runs over, he goes, hey buddy. And he gets down on his knees and he gives him a high five and the video ends with him having this conversation with this kid and showing him love. So get service. How can we add value to other people's lives? It starts here. It starts with our thoughts of giving the benefit of the doubt, of being in a position of strength and, and judging favorably. So strategy number one is you can't judge someone unless you're in their place. All right, number two, it's a good one. Stop applying a double standard. I say it's good because I'm really good at this or not doing it well. Stop applying a double standard. That means that 
everything that you get upset with what other people do, half the time you've done it yourself. So around here, where I'm in Pico, and there's a big supermarket called Glatmart. And all the roads around Glatmart are really, really thin. And there's posters everywhere saying, don't honk, um, don't honk your horn because of the neighbors, please keep the noise down. And every now and again, someone will double park. And it's impossible to get around them in order to get into the parking lot. And this is generally what you do when you double park and you see the person still in the car and you're annoyed because you're having a hard time getting around them. You do this and so that they can see that you're upset as you drive past them. But you know, the other day, and I, I you know, I hit my horn. You know, the other day, uh, I, this happens to be next door to Glatmart. There's a pharmacy and I needed a prescription. So I just pulled up there you know, just for a minute. And I let my son out the car. There wasn't anyone in front of me at the time or by the side of me. There was no line. And I let him out the car and I said, OK, just go get the prescription. I'll wait for you here. And then people started honking me and making rude gestures in the car. I was like, what's your problem? Why are you doing? I'm not going to leave my son. He's going to come out the pharmacy and see I'm not there. I would never do such a thing. But it's a double standard, because if I get upset at someone else parking in that place that makes the whole road narrow, I've done it myself. You ever cut someone off on the freeway or you've ever been driving and driving and all of a sudden you see your exit? Oh, it's not intentional, but I've got to veer off to the side quickly. I might cut you off just a little bit. I'm sorry. But if someone does it to you, oh, we're great at making excuses for other people. Uh, sorry, we're great at making excuses for our own behavior and our own action, but to other people, we have a harder time. You've got to stop applying a double standard. Another um, story I read recently was a woman. She's in a home, her and a hubby. Her hubby is in Israel. Her husband usually sends the kids off to school and uh, he takes them across the road and he goes, okay, you know, like a five-year-old. And he says, off you go, because the younger kids go off to school much earlier in Israel. So this morning, the husband had a meeting, says to his wife, honey, you know, I've got to go. And she says, don't worry, I see little, you know, David across the street. He leaves and time comes to take David across the street. So let him walk to school. And she does. OK, we're ready. I'm coming. She takes David across the street. And as he's there, he says, oh, mommy, mommy, please walk me to the corner, please. She's like, oh, well, you know, I've got to get back. Please, can you walk? Sure. He walks, he walk, she walks David to the corner and then David says, please, can you just, just walk me to my school? She's just here. I'd love, please, 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 please. Fine, fine. Okay, but I've got to get back. No, please. She walks him into the school. Can you just take me into my classroom? Oh, I really, really would love that, love that. Fine. She takes little David into the classroom. And when she gets there, there's no teacher absolutely no supervision. And there's 25 kids completely alone. Anything could have happened. So she leaves the school after setting him in place. She calls the principal straight away. I just dropped my kid off. There's no supervision. There's no one there. Dumb. That night, her husband comes in and David says, mommy took me into my classroom today, not just across the street. It was so awesome. And the husband looks at his wife and says, honey, who was looking after the baby? Who was looking after the other kids? And she went, oh, and, you know, it wasn't meant to be. It was just a second. I only left them for a second. So stop applying a double standard. Make excuses, not only for yourself, but also for other people. Number three. So, so far we've got you can't judge someone till you're in their place. Number two is stop applying a double standard. And number three is admit you don't know the whole story. You step into chapter two half the time and you have no idea what's happened before you. And you're jumping in, making all these assumptions about people. So there was a, a slew of videos, like commercials that came out for AmeriQuest Financial Services, which is a mortgage company. And they had a slogan. And the slogan was, don't judge too quickly. We won't. Right. So meaning if you come here, I'm going to give you a mortgage money. Alex, I'll, I'll give you your loan. Don't worry. Don't judge too quickly. We won't. So I'll tell you a few of the stories. You can check them out also on YouTube. 
So there was a, a guy, he's walking his cute little doggy, and there's a grandmother and a granddaughter. The grandmother's, you know, taking a nice stroll with the granddaughter. Moments before, the, the man who's walking the dog is eating a really yummy chocolate bar, and he drops it, and it lands right between the dog's legs. At that point, the grandmother points out, oh, look, look at the cute doggy, sweetheart. And at the same time, the, the man is walking the dog. He bends down and he picks up the chocolate bar right between the dog's legs and goes, <laughs> at which point the grandmother goes, <gasps> on, the, on the granddaughter's legs. It could be, but don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. Another story is there's a man lying in a hospital bed and there's a, an elevator coming up that enters the bedroom with the mother and the daughter holding a balloon saying, get well soon, daddy. And there's an intern there and a doctor there and oh, 12, 15. There's an intern and a doctor there. And at that very moment, there's a fly going round and round the body of the sleeping father. And the doctor picks up the defibrillator in two hands and he's going, Zzz, and he gets the fly. And he says, as the mother and daughter walk into the room, I've killed them. I've killed him. Don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. So instead of jumping to conclusions, you, you always know where your hands are, but you don't always know where your mind is. And this is what we need to work on today and every day in order to judge favorably and create a beautiful world, build a beautiful world. So I, I want to finish by explaining that if you always, you, you're not stealing anything, but your minds, your imagination grabs a hold of your thinking and creates these amazing scenarios about people. Um, my neighbors across the street, they're drug dealers before marijuana was legalized. They're drug dealers. Why? Because cars would arrive and they would have little boxes that would be loaded into cars. Off they would go. Always drivers coming and going. And one night I went out into the street and it was as though the, our entire street was a massive bong filled with smoke. I called my husband out to come and have a check it out. So they were drug dealers. But we, got, we became friends with them. They had a hat business. So your mind always looks around at people and decides exactly who they are, how they're dressed, the way they're acting. And it all comes from the way you interpret their actions and their words and what they do. So you have an opportunity today and every day to take that critical condemning nature of yourself and turn it into one of positivity and love and balance and giving by creating excuses to make the other person look good. So a quick recap. We understood cognitive psychology came along way before, um, Torah came along way before cognitive psychology to say our job is to judge everyone, everyone justly and interpret their words and actions only to the good. So we have a position of strength and a position of weakness. Position of strength is P-O-S, your positive. Position of weakness, P-O-W, your defensive. You get to check yourself. Anytime I'm being defensive, how do I move? Give the benefit of the doubt. Judge favorably everything that's happening. Three strategies. Number one, you can't judge someone till they're in their place. Number two, you have to recognize that you're living by a double standard many times. And number three is don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. You don't know the whole story. You've only stepped into chapter, you know, the middle chapter. And lastly, Check yourself. You know where your hands are, but your mind goes off creating with your imagination, grabbing hold of your thinking, all these amazing fanciful ideas that you need to rein it back in. Create excuses to make other people look good. And we can start building the third temple through love and giving one brick at a time. Thank you for listening.
I think people can hear me. Sorry. So I was just saying thank you very much to Sharon Shanka. I think people can hear me now. We are very, very excited to have Rabbi Refson join us, the head of Neve. Um, we are so, so thankful that he's here. And um, we are fortunate. Let me bring him in. Thank you, Rabbi, for being here. I'm sorry, my mic was muted. I didn't realize, and I was just speaking. But I'm very glad that you're here. You That's are the one of the founders. Sorry? That's the best setting when you're introducing me is to, should be mute. <laughs> you can't make me laugh at this time of the year. You know, it's, uh, it's meant sorry. to be a sad thing. But, uh, you know, it really is. We're really thankful that you're here. You are one of the founders of the movement of bringing Jews back to Israel and giving them an experience of what Israel is. Um, you work for Neve, you founded Neve, and it's, it's a real, you work for the Jewish people. And we're really fortunate. This is a day of understanding that we need chesed, we need avat chinam, and you are an example of that. So thank you for being here with us. Uh, for being that example again, another person who is an example of what it means to have avat chinam. We are very fortunate to have you here. Thank you, Rabbi. It's a pleasure. Um, indeed, I will not be saying anything in the least humorous today. Um, not that I'm such a comedian the rest of the year, but anyway, the, the not so good news is that in two months' time exactly, there will be another fast just like this. We're exactly two months away from Rosh Hashanah. And uh, that's the not such good news. The good news is <clears throat> that at the end of Yom Kippur, you will feel, I meant Yom Kippur, at the end of Yom Kippur, you will feel much, much better than you do after this fast. And uh, the question is why? We leave, after all, both of the uh, events, Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av, are directed to identical ideas. Tshuva, you've done wrong, you have to have an opportunity to do tshuva. The end of Yom Kippur, we are exhilarated. Hashem Kim, we say seven times, we feel unburdened, we feel that HaKadosh Baruch has been with us. The end of Tisha B'Av, we feel depressed. Nothing seems to have moved. And the whole effort seems to have been arid. Now, of course, we have Shabbos Nachamu straight away, but you have to have big betochen to know that this Nachamu is as big as the problem that, we, that you are leaving. And the question is, what is the difference? So Chazal tell us, that I wouldn't say we don't have to worry, but we do have to know that this problem has been with us for thousands of years. How is it that we have not succeeded in doing Teshuvah when it comes to Tisha B'Av? So Chazal say the famous, if astonishing phrase, that when it comes to Sinas Chinon, the people never realized what they were doing wrong, and therefore, and therefore, they never understood how to do tshuva. Now, what's interesting is that Lashon Hara is described, I'm sorry, that Sinat Chinam is described by the Chofetz Chaim as meaning Lashon Hara. That's what it is. That means that without worrying that you are transgressing on Sinat Chinam, you can make an effigy of someone who you don't like. And after Hamapil, every night, you stick pins in it. 
It's not an abrogation of the din of Sinat Chinam. It might be something you should report to your shrink, but it's not Sinat Chinam. Sinat Chinam is speaking badly of people. Now, what's astonishing is that Lashon Ara is an Aveira that we don't do B'Shoigeg. The vast majority of times when we speak Lashon Ara, it is B'Mezid. I have a friend in America who teaches the laws of, of Lashon Ara from the Sefer Chovetz Chaim. And I told him, I think he should go to the other Sefer of the Chovetz Chaim, Shmir Zaloshan. There may be some arcane details which we are not aware of, but our problem is that we don't have the Yira Shomayim, which prevents us from speaking the Shon Ara. How then can Chazal say, Lainis Galu Avaino? We know the whole time what's wrong. There's no way that we can plead ignorance on this one. There just is no way that we can claim that it's a mishpat, it's clear, we know how much we hate being spoken about negatively. So we have to know without, it's a mishpat, and the Torah tells us this as, a, as an expression of fact, which we should know anyway. What is it that is happening here? My teacher, Abelia Lapian Zatzal, traced this problem back to Reuven, the daughter of the son of Yaakov. We know Chazal make a surprising statement about Reuven. They say that until Reuven came along, the people did not know what real teshuva was about. It was a new era in teshuva when Reuven came along. Why should it be that way? What were they talking about? Explained my teacher that every Avera which had been done before that was a normative Avera. There was an Avera which was obvious, which was evident, and which needed to shove up. What happened in the case of Reuven? Reuven and his mother had lived their whole life under the shadow of the beloved wife, Rachel. Rachel passes away. So Reuven knows that his mother is surely next in line before the Shvachos, so he jumps the gun a little bit, and he moves all of his father's stuff into Leah's tent. And this was a, an affront to his father. This was a affront against Halacha. Children can't do such thing. Said my teacher, the Avera of Reuven was the first example in the Torah of righteous indignation, where a person, when he was doing the Aveira, knew it to be wrong. I'm sorry, I take that back, but when the person doing the Aveira thought he was in the right, he really did think he was doing the right thing. It wasn't a normative Aveira in that sense. Said my teacher, it is the same thing with Sinas Chinom. Sinas Chinom is an example of righteous indignation. Does this mean that Sinas Chinom is always wrong? We know that's not the case. And in fact, we have a poster child in the Torah for righteous indignation. And that is Pinchas. We all know that in, in Parashas Shlach, at the end of Bible, we are told about the fact that a member of Klal Yisrael, a high-ranking member of Klal Yisrael, did something very disgusting. 
together with a, a woman, a foreign woman. And we're told there that Pinchas killed both of them. And this is kinah. This is righteous indignation. And yet, what do we find? We find that he's twice rewarded, that he gets the kahuna, the kana yes kina si besaycham. Akadish Baruch Hu says, he was righteously indignant for me. He knew it was an affront to Akadish Baruch Hu. And as a result, the, the plague that was going on stopped. Akadish Baruch Hu then says that Pinchas was rewarded both with briskuna and with bris shaloi. That's how meritorious the act was. In fact, he challenged, as it were, Kaddish Baruch Hu. He came with the two of them on his roimach, and he said to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, he said, because of these two miserable individuals, you're making a, a, a plague within Klal Yisrael? That immediately ended the play. Kodesh, uh, the Malachim were very upset. That's the way a human being speaks to the Almighty. A Kodesh Baruch said, no, no, no. In that family, <clears throat> they have a high sense of genuine indignation for a Kodesh Baruch Hu, And that, uh, just expressing what they feel, the same thing we have with Aaron Akoyan, says a Kodesh Baruch Hu that when there was a plague after the Maise Kairach, he put an end to it by speaking directly to a Kaddish Baruch Hu in that way. As, as, as Chazal say, Mei Shivchem or Ben Mei Shivchem, it runs in his family, but he turns back this negativity. We have it as well, by the way, with Moshe Rabbeinu. <coughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, early in his career, turns to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and says, Lama Hare Isa, Lama there. How long are you going to treat this people so badly? And there was, we're told as well that the, the Malachim were very upset. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, don't you see, this is out of concern for Am Yisrael. That's why he talks to me in that way. So this is indignation. You do something for a Kaddish Baruch Hu, so then not only is it permitted, but it is meritorious. And he got two wonderful gifts as a result. <clears throat> what is remarkable is that there is another episode very, very similar to this later on. And this is with Eliyahu Anobi, who Chazal tell us Pinchas and Eliyahu are identical people. And the story, in short, is the story of the Nevi'e Abal. 450 so-called prophets of the Baal come together with Pinchos, with Eliyahu, in Ma'ara Carmel, and they have a face-off. And Eliyahu wins hands down. And it's a terrific Kiddush Hashem. All the people, all the Jews get up and say, Hashem Walakim. Now we realize that God is the only God. So this would seem to be something which was really a second time for Pinchas Eliyahu, which, uh, <clears throat> which was very meritorious. We are told that as a result, he has gained the enmity of the king and the queen, Achav, and he has to run away. He's a fugitive, and he has difficult times, and he's in a cave. And a Kaddish who comes to him in, in the cave, and he says, to, he says to him, how are you doing? Malach how are things going for you? And in his answer, Eliyahu says the magical phrase, the magical phrase, the accolade that a Gaddish Baruch Hu had given him at the time of, of the Midbar. He says that, just like you said about me. And then he says, 
I want you to know that the Jews had forsaken Tyra. I was the only one left. But you can rely on me, as you know. You can rely on me to change the situation. A Kaddish Baruch who gives an answer which is less than laudatory towards him. He says to him, a Kaddish Baruch who is labor rash Hashem, a Kaddish Baruch who is not to be found in big noise, a Kaddish Baruch who is not to be found in very big events, but rather in a kail de mamodako, in a small, silent voice. What is the Kaddish Baruch Hu saying to him? The Kaddish Baruch Hu is indicating displeasure. He says, go outside, see the earthquake, see all the, the effects that I can make there. And then he says to him, tell me again. Tell me the story again. And Elio doesn't take the hint. He doesn't realize. He says again, I nisharti levadi. I'm the only one here. The rest of them are useless. They were placed in Malshiasi Ethan. They couldn't decide whether to go in favor of a Kaddish Baruch Hu or to go in favor <coughs> of the Baal. But luckily, I was around, and I pulled it off. Everything's fine now. And here, a Kaddish Baruch Hu says to him. Go, we're going to take you away from this area of Navua. You've got to go and you've got to find, and he tells them who the next one is. Got to go and find the new Navi. He was fired. What was the difference? Why was it in the case in the Midbar? He received such reward, and here he's fired from being the Navi. The answer is simple. In the first case, he presented himself as a member of Klal Yisrael. Kanoi eskinasi b'seicham, from within them. He was talking with pain about his brothers. Because of people like this, you're going to make my brethren suffer? It was all us. When it came to Hara Carmel, it was them. He was talking about Am Yisrael in a way which was unacceptable to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And this is what Chazal tell us. To say, Bonecho, Eim, Bonai, Bnei Avram Yitzchok Yaakov. He can't say them. It's all their fault. They're useless. I saved the day. As soon as you lose the Besaychon, as soon as you, lo you lose this sense of empathy with your fellow Jews, so then righteous indignation becomes forbidden. It's not allowed anymore. What is it? It's a one-upmanship. Rabbi Simcha Zisel says, it comes from a great too much love of yourself, not enough love le left for others. You can do the same things, use the same mid -ice. But if you're not careful, the result can be very different. The Hamek Dava, in his famous introduction, describes this as being the way of the Jews at the end of the Second Temple when it was destroyed. Because they were so chinam. They didn't like others. They thought that people who served God in a way which is different to, the, to them, I'm in the right. Anybody who differs from me is in the wrong, and says the Hamik Dava. And this is what caused the Sinas Chinam. <clears throat> this is called the Sinam Chinam. And the Churban Abayas. We have to learn to empathize with people. We have to learn that we're fight when we are fighting the battle of Hashem, the prerequisite is to see our fellow Jews as us. As soon as we are talking about them 
as them. So then we lose the whole right to represent them. And what we're doing is not on Hashem's behalf. When we say that they didn't know that they were doing an Avera, it wasn't that they didn't know, know that they were doing an Avera. They thought they were doing a mitzvah. They thought that in their attitudes to Jews different to them, they were setting the standards. This is the way to behave. The reason that the sin did not become evident was because in their minds, they were tzaddikim. After all, we know, we say every Friday night, that Oyave Hashem, Sinuro. So people think I may not be that outstanding in, in my Avas Hashem, but I can make up for it when it comes to Rishon by hating them. That isn't the way it is. I will fight the battles for Hashem, but it has to be Hashem's battle. If we are merely expressing one-upmanship, that we are superior to them, so then this leads, this is jealousy, this is condescension, this is everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu dislikes. As I mentioned, Rav Simcha Zissel, who was the teacher of my teacher, said that Sinas Chinam, the reason we have this attitude to others, is that our self-absorption does not allow us to have any love left for other people. All the love that I have is focused inside, inwardly. Now the question is, what do we do about it? First thing we have to know is, because I'll say that the force which combats, as it were, sino, if you have something against people, you have to confront them. You have no choice. Rabbi Rucham says, why is it that even when people come to me and say, are you upset about me for what I did? We tend to say, no, no. What do we mean by that? We are upset. Says Rabbi Rucham, we either mean one of two things. Either we mean to say, I am upset and I want to remain upset, and I don't want any apology from you to get in my way, or, <clears throat> or we're saying that I am upset and I want to remain upset. I want to continue to dislike you. This, which you have done, has given me an opportunity, an excuse to dislike you. And I don't want to lose that. I want to remain in that, not in that state with you. And therefore we say, nothing to, yeah, nothing to ask me Mechila for. Amazing how the mind works. We have to know that if we like people who share the trait of those that we dislike for being less than perfectly observant, this means that it's not on us. It would have to appear to, but uh, it would have to be across the board. People who do this and this, I feel that they're taking from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But if your friend in the same case, you don't have the same negativity, so then it's not on us and it's certainly not Kinas Hashem. It's certainly not something you are doing for a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Chazal give us a number of eights of how to deal with people you don't like. We are told the famous case in Baba Metzia. We are told that when people, that the normal rule is that if there's two animals or two men whose animals require assistance, so first, we have to unload the animal which is spread eagled on the ground because the animal's in pain. And only then do we go 
and load the other animal which needs loading. So Chazal, it's not like that. If the person who you dislike, his animal needs loading, so then go and do that first. Leave your friend whose animal has collapsed, leave it till next. This is good for you. It's good for you to behave this way. It trains you to reverse your natural trend. The second is a posik. It's a posik in Mishle, where <clears throat> Shlema Melech tells us, Im roiv soinecho achilehu lechem. If your friend is hungry, I'm sorry, if your enemy is hungry, give him food. Give him drink. And the ends of the Pothic, Hashem Yishalem. It's not easy for you. But take the high road. Do the right thing. This is the only way of breaking this cycle. If we decide we are going to be the ones to act properly. I would like to make a suggestion for all of us. And that is that this Shabbos, we send someone we don't like a gift with a note saying that this should be a Shabbos Nachamu for both of us to reach out. We have to prove to our Kaddish Baruch Hu that this Tisha B'Av was not a waste. To demonstrate to our Kaddish Baruch Hu how unwashed you are is not, is not enough. We have to show, like we do with Yom Kippur, there is some change that we have made. Let us decide to reach out to someone and to try to mend the relationship with them. And in this chus, we should all be zeicha to the gula shleima b'meheira v'yomeinu. Amen. Amen. Rabbi, thank you so much for your beautiful words. Uh, it's really about action, not just ideas, and that's what you're teaching. So uh, we really appreciate you coming and sharing your wisdom and being here with us. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. I want to uh, tell everybody before we um, go to the next speaker that in the middle uh, of the next speech, it's going to be Chatzot Yom, which means midday. And for those that are sitting on the floor, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, you can actually uh, sit on a regular chair and some of the course of the day changes. Um, so before we actually move on to the next speaker, I want to call up, I want to thank Rabbi Grama, uh, uh, thank Rabbi Refson for speaking to us so wisely and beautifully. Uh, the head of Neve, the founder of Neve, a man that was with the movement of bringing Jews to Israel, bringing Jews back to Judaism um, in the past uh, at least 40 years, if not more, 50 years. So we're really thankful that he was here with us. And we're also thankful that Rabbi Grama, who's a neighbor of ours, um, comes. He has a synagogue right around the corner from us. And I really enjoy his speeches and sermons and his uh, community. And we're really, really thankful for him being here with us. Rabbi Grama, I'm going to call him in. Uh, thank you so much, Rabbi, for being here and for sharing also your words, for be willing to share your words of wisdom to our community, to your community, to everybody that may be listening. So thank you for being here, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Lou, for organizing this very inspiring program on a, on a day that truly needs inspiration. And uh, I commend all of you, the listeners who are, using this very valuable day on our calendar to absorb so many interesting speakers and, and insights for, for ourselves and personal growth. Hold on, my camera's not that great. Sorry. And I do apologize. I'm also sitting on the floor and I'm not looking my prettiest. So that's just an outcome, another outcome of the, of the Tisha B'Av uh, sorrow. Um, and I can't greet you properly because it's Tisha B'Av, as you know, but I do look forward to the opportunity to meet all of you um, at different times. I want to share with you a story that took place about six months ago. Uh, a member of my shul, my synagogue, was hosting a parlor meeting for an organization in Israel. And we had the great merit of having the previous chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Yisrael Lau, 
I don't know if you've heard of him, if you are familiar with him, uh, but that was a was a 38th generation in a same scene of rabbinical leadership. Going back 38 generations, he served as the chief rabbi of Israel, and his son today serves in that position as well. And Bilal was a brilliant speaker and a very, very fascinating person. And he addressed our crowd and he told the story that at that time he said it was the first time he was sharing that story in Los Angeles. And here it goes. Bilal was that, that the story begins when he himself was a young rabbi aspiring in the growth of his career in Israel. And he was a, uh, a rabbi in a small synagogue outside, right outside of the Tel Aviv area. You know, in Israel, the way to get the, the ladder of success is you start off in become, if you become the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, then you move on typically as a stepping stone to get to the, the, the chief rabbi position altogether. But he has a, he was in a small city, small township outside of Tel Aviv. And one day he gets a phone call. And the phone call, the man, the caller says, Hi, I'm calling on behalf of the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben Gurion. And the Prime Minister would like to have an appointment with you. He's presently in the hospital, the Siroka Hospital in Tel Aviv, and he'd like to meet with you. And I was like wondering, is this like an early version of uh, pranks? Is this an early version of, you know, pulling a prank on him, candid camera? But he had to play along because he wasn't sure if it was true or not true. So this caller says that, you know, the Prime Minister is in, is, is in the hospital and he has some questions on on the, on the Bible, on the Navi, on the prophets. Ben-Gurion, was, although he was a secular Jew, was extremely well-read. And um, he was given your name. So of course, the chief rabbi acquiesced and he said, sure, and they made up to meet the next day at three o'clock. But Bilal's brother, his older brother, worked in a government position in Israel. And he quickly calls him up. He says, Naftali, do me a favor. I know that you know the guy, because it is what everyone always knows, someone knows somebody. I know that you know the guy who work, who knows the prime minister's schedule. Find out for me if he has a schedule tomorrow morning, tomorrow at three o'clock, or is this a fake? He gets a phone call back 15 minutes later from his older brother. And Naftali says, no, it's real and you're on him. Rabbi Lau goes to the, to the scheduled appointment and visits the prime minister in the hospital. And, uh, you know, they have a long, long conversation. At the end of the conversation, the rabbi says to the prime minister, may I ask you a question about a story they say about you? I wanted to verify if it's true or not. He said, of course. He says, the story is that there was a, a gathering of public country leaders. And even though the, 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 um, the meeting took pl place prior to Israel's birth, but Ben-Gurion at that time was the head of the World Zionist Organization, and he was invited to participate. And supposedly an English ambassador, I don't remember the name now, came over to him. And in the crowd, in the audience, sitting to gather around was also a representation, representation for all the major Arab countries. And the ambassador, ambassador says to, to, to Ben-Gurion, he says, Mr. Ben-Gurion, where are you from? He says, well, I'm from Eastern Europe. And he says, where is Chaim Weizmann from also? And he begins to go through all the names of the leading Zionists at that time. And where are they from? And each one came from a different country, a different city in Eastern Europe. So the ambassador says to him, he says, Mr. Ben-Gurion, if you, all of you, you and all your Zionist friends come from Eastern Europe, why should I give you the land of Palestine? And they turn to the Arab delegates and said, not give it to them who all live in the Middle East. Ben-Gurion had next to him a book, the Tanakh. For those who are not familiar, Tanakh is the acronym for the three words, Torah, Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and Ksubim, which means scriptures. And those are the three books of our larger written law. And many times they're published together in a single book. And he picks up the book, he says, Mr. Ambassador, in this book, we have a deal, a deed from God. Over 3,000 years ago, God promised us this land to our forefathers. He promised it to us through Moses in the promise when we saw and still in Egypt. The reason why we have claimed to that land is because we have a deed from God, a commitment from God written in this text. And Ben-Gurion nods his head and says, Emet, a true story. Now, Many times on Tisha B'Av, we talk about the Holocaust. 
There was a previous Holocaust that came before the one that we talk about in 1930s and 1940s. The first Holocaust of the Jewish people took place by the destruction of the first temple. It was a Holocaust. They were out to destroy us. They were out to kill us. They wanted to wipe us off the face of the map. They wanted to get rid of us. After they were exiled, the story of Purim took place. They went to Persia, to Babylonia for 70 years, as we know. And post that era, after 70 years, they were able to return to the land of Israel. And a couple, about 100, 200 years later, there was a story of the, one of the great sages, a name you might have heard of, was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, one of the leading sages of the Mishnah. It was a few hundred years after that. And one time his students were revisiting that event of the exile of the Jewish people. And then they also began to revisit the history of the Jewish people living in Persia under the rule of King Ahasuerus. And we know that there was a huge threat to annihilate the entire Jewish world because Haman, as we know, was the right hand man of Ahasuerus. And Ahasuerus was the king, the ruling king over the entire world. So the students turned to their rabbi and said, Rabbi, tell us, we, re we are revisiting history. We want to understand what happened in that history that the Jews at that time deserved that threat of annihilation. And interestingly enough, the rabbi said back to them, what do you think? Let me hear your perspective. And they told them because they believed and they talked about it amongst themselves. They analyzed the story. And they said, because we know that there was a great party that was made by King Ahasuerus. And the reason why he made that party, as many of his predecessors did as well, was because all of the kings at that time were banking on one statement. The entire political dominion was riding on one statement. A statement from the prophet of Jeremiah, Yemiyo, the one who authored Eicha, which we read last night. And the prophet told the Jewish people that after 70 years, they're going to be redeemed and brought back to the land of Israel. So every subsequent quick king from Nebuchadnezzar II, after he destroyed the temple, after the temple was destroyed under his reign, and they all went on further, every single king who lived would count 70 years, would calculate 70 years to see if the words of the prophet were going to come true. Because if not, for 70 years passed, they knew the Jews were over. And it was time to celebrate. And the time ago to great length to discuss why each king made a wrong calculation from when they should start counting, a long discussion. Ahasuerus became the king, and he began to calculate 70 years. And the 70 years came, according to his calculation, his miscalculation uh, uh, completed, and he made a part, part of the celebrate. So the story that opens up, when Megillus asked if you ever read the story, if you heard the story, the opening story of that celebration was beginning with that celebration, that party that he was making, only for one reason, to celebrate the fact that the Jews were no longer loved by God. And the prophet was wrong. And the Jews attended that party. And the students of this great rabbi said, we believe after reviewing the history and studying the events, we conclude that the reason why the Jews deserve such a huge threat of annihilation was because they went in and they benefited. They didn't just go for political purposes, but they went and they benefited from that meal. Now you have to understand what that means. What does it mean to benefit from that type of meal? Because imagine, imagine if you have, I'll tell you a fascinating story that I read years ago. And it stuck in me so strongly because it was such a bizarre story. The story was written in a book called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. And one day there's a man who was telling all over the story that he was sitting in his apartment. He gets a knock on the door right after the Holocaust, still living in Germany. And enters a man with a non-Jewish woman, a German woman. And the man, the guest, begins to speak to the host, to the person who lives in the apartment, says, Yankel Horowitz, you don't remember me? And Yankel Horowitz, the host, is looking at this man. He says, the voice is familiar, but the face, I can't, he said, I can't, I can't get it. Yankel, come on, we're old buddies, you don't remember me? And he finally said, it's me, Moshe. 
Moshe Goldstein. Moshe Goldstein. Moshe Goldstein was a shochet. He was a, he was the official ritual slaughter in his city. We grew up. We lived. He was recognized as a very pious person. And once he saw Moshe saw the shock on the face of his friend, he turned to his non-Jewish German girlfriend. He says, "She's the future. Here's the future." A bizarre story. This man was so impacted by the impact of, of the trauma of the Holocaust. That not only did he leave his faith, but he connected to that group of people specifically who tried to destroy him. What a traumatic impact. Eventually he repented and came back to our people, to our faith. But can you imagine what it means for the Jews at that time who were living in the city of Shushan, who are now attending a party that was sponsored by the king of the world for one purpose because of the demise of their people. These Jews who lived in Shushan were the first surviving generation after at that, that Holocaust called the Chorban. Could you imagine if Jews today, if Jews 30, 40 years ago, the first generation after the Holocaust would get together with Germans, with the children of the German Nazis, with Mengel, his children, and have a party with them and celebrate with them. Can you imagine? What were the Jews thinking? And therefore the disciples said, we believe that the reason why God threatened this people with annihilation wasn't just as a punishment, but rather because when you disconnect from your past, when you no longer connect your history, when you no longer take pride in the good and in the sorrow, but you don't have a future with us. Because without appreciation of your past, you don't have a future. You know, people ask all the time, every year at Tush above, <clears throat> what are we doing? Why are we celebrating or commemorating an event that took place 2,000 years ago? And now we're not just commemorating it, we're, living, we're sitting on the floor, we just heard the announcement that in a few minutes, well, you could actually do it right now if you'd like. At 12.59, you can stand up and say, I'm going to stay seated for now. But everybody else can stand and sit on chairs. We're living, we're literally re-mourning the destruction of our temple. People ask, why? I mean, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll raise a black flag, we'll, we'll do something, but we fast and we mourn and we don't shave and ugh, it's disgusting. You know, there's a famous story, it's more of a legend, a bit of a apocryphal of a story with the French great leader, Napoleon. And legend, ha legend has it that he was once walking by a synagogue and he's on Tisha above night and he saw the people, he looked inside and he saw people sitting on the floor and he heard the crying and, this, and the Echa being chanted. And he asked him, what's going on? So someone said, oh, well, it's the night called Tisha above. We mourn the destruction of our, our temple. And he looks inside the synagogue and he says, these people, they don't just remember their history, they live their history. And people like that can never be destroyed. We're not just commemorating or remembering a day that went by, a tragic day in our calendar. We're reliving that history, whether the story is true or not, but the message is so powerful, so profound. Because if we don't celebrate Tisha B'Av, if we don't commemorate the destruction, we are abdicating our role in our history. Because if you walk away from your past, you have no future. I want to share with you another dimension, continuation. You know, Tisha B'Av is somewhat of a contradistinction within itself because we know it's the saddest day on the calendar. And yet on the other hand, we are taught also based on the wording that says in the verses in Echo, which again, what we read last night, it uses the word mo'ed. Mo'ed is the Hebrew word, biblical word actually, that's used to connote a holiday. So on one hand, it's called the fast day, the sad day, the morning day. On the other hand, it's called a holiday. And this term, by the way, holiday is not just like this fluffy title and accolade that we give it. We actually practice halakhic ramifications. There are different things that we do or don't say in our prayers because we recognize it to be a holiday. There's a certain prayer that we omit today which we omit on Sabbath, on holidays, on happy occasions. So here you have the saddest day of the year. 
is infused, is combined with some level of happiness, what does that mean? What does that mean? So I want to tell you the second half of that story when Rabbi Lau met the Prime Minister Ben Gurion. And Rabbi Lau said to him, if your story is true with the ambassador and the conversation is true, then I have a question for you, Mr. Mr. Ben Gurion. He says, go ahead. There are many other laws in that contract. There are many other statements and clauses in that deed. Why don't you adhere to those also? Jewish chutzpah, we call it. And the prime minister at that time, not the pre, was not prime minister yet, he smiled and nodded his head, but did not answer. What we don't realize is that how we live our life in the present is exactly what's going to connect us to our past. Every mitzvah, every act that we do which connects us to the Torah, which connects us to God, is a connection to our history. Every mitzvah that we perform reminds us that we are alive today in this world because of a history from the past world preparing for the next world. Is a beautiful verse that we say in our prayers. It's a conglomerate of three different statements found in Psalms. It says, Hashem Melech, Hashem is king. Hashem Malach, Hashem was king. Hashem Yimloch, Le'olam, that God will, be, will reign forever. Again, Hashem is king. Hashem was king. And Hashem will always be the king. What's wrong with that statement? Any English literature majors out there? Since when do we put the present term first? I grew up learning past, present, future. Here in our prayer book, we say God is king. And then we say God was, and then we say God will be. Why? If every minute that we live is really a bridge, every second, right now, this, when every second we talk, every second of our existence is a bridge. It's a bridge to what happened to, and it's a bridge to what's going, from what happened to what's about to, what's about to happen. I want to share with another story. There's a great book called The Prime Minister. It's written by a man who used to be an ambassador and a delegate, a secretary, really, for many prime ministers in Israel. And he writes a book called The Prime Minister. It was his experience with seven prime ministers of Israel. He definitely has his political um, preferences, but it's a pretty, pretty um, open-minded book. And basically, he tells a beautiful story of his experiences, the beginning of the states, through the history of the, of, the, of the State of Israel interaction with America. Very, very amazing book. It's definitely worthwhile reading. He tells a story there that took place on, excuse me, May 14th, 1948. For those who don't know, May 14th was the founding date of the State of Israel. He tells a story that him and about 24, 25 other people were committed and sent to dig trenches on the west side of Jerusalem. It was a hot Friday day, but there was rumors. And you have to understand, you're talking about 1948, communication was not that strong. There were rumors that there's going to be an attack from a Jordanian brigade in that part of, the, of Jerusalem. So 25 people, a, mo a motley crew of men, women, religious atheists, all committed to a single function of protecting their, that city. And sure that they began to dig in trenches and trenches, and nighttime came, it was very Friday evening, and many of them were, were religious, and they all agreed they're going to settle down for the Sabbath. And they're sitting by in a trench, and all of a sudden they hear footsteps running towards them. And they grab their rifles. And also they hear a recognized voice from one of their colleagues saying, I have news, I have news. What was the news? Ben Gurion just declared the state of Israel. And they were overwhelmed. They were exuberant, they were dancing, they just were digging trenches, and now they're celebrating the birth of the state of Israel. And you have to know the history because Ben Gurion was not he was going to capitulate to the American pressure. It wasn't clear it was going to happen. But it happened. 
and they were singing and dancing and celebrating. And then they began to say to this person, the messenger said, tell us, what's the name of this new state? And he said, you know, I forgot to ask. And as Jews do, they began to debate. One guy, debate. One guy said, oh, let's call it Zion. Maybe it's going to be called Yehuda. But someone said, no, it's People stuck outside of Jerusalem. They have no idea what they're talking about. But that's the following one says, no matter what the name is, let's drink Lachayim for the new state. And they all dig in. They have these, they had Jews don't travel well without alcohol. And one person, a Hasidic Jew, his name was Nusen, his Hasidic pronunciation said, One second, it's Friday night. It's Kiddush. Let's make Kiddush first. And he was, he was happened to have been a somewhat of a cantor, and he made the most beautiful, inspiring, sweetest Kiddush you've ever heard in your life. And after he makes the last blessing, the Kadesh as a Shabbos, he stands up on his toes, a Hasidic Jew stands up on his toes. He holds up his flask and says, Baruch Atah Hashem, bless you God, Master of the Universe. Shechiyanu v'kihimanu v'giyanu 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 be alive at this moment. And we will see this separation after surviving the, the hell of the Holocaust. Thousands of years of exile, something has begun to happen in their favor. These Jews lived to understand that their present life was connected to their past. They were digging trenches in a place they had no idea whether it was going to be an attack or not. It didn't make a difference. They were committed. They had a mission. They had a purpose. And Newsom had a purpose when he made Kiddush Friday night. He said, it's still Shabbos for us. We cannot begin without making Kiddush because every mitzvah that we do in our present day life connects us to our history. They celebrated their present because they believed in their past. So we're on this bridge and one side of the bridge is our history of thousands of years. History that began for the Jewish people with Abraham that took us to Egypt and then to Moses that took us to, to, Torah, to, to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, that took us throughout the world and some beautiful errors and some very, very harsh, sorrowful errors in times. And the other side of the bridge stands our future, stands the redemption, stands the Gula. And we are sitting in the middle, trying to pull the two sides together. We become that bridge holding our past, bridging it to our future. And this is why we say Hashem Melech, Hashem Molach, Hashem Yemok. God is king, God was king, and God will be king. Because our past only has value if we recognize the present, and our future only has hope if we recognize our past and our present. And only when we combine those two and we bridge them together ourselves, are we truly alive? Are we living as people, as a history, as a nation needs to live? And this is why we sit on the floor in Tisha B'Av, because we're connecting our past, becoming that bridge to the future, as every single generation has been and had the plank on that bridge for the last thousands of years. Someone called me last night, and yeah, it's, a long, it's been a long exile. I said, no, it's been a long redemption. The redemption really began right after the destruction of the second temple. Because once those two temples were gone, the next one's gonna be forever. It's gonna be the future of the Jewish people. And you wanna be there. It's been a long redemption process. This is how we have to live our lives. And what we're seeing today in the world, and I no way mean to get anywhere political, what we're seeing today in the world of the upheaval, the anarchy, the destruction of history is not going to benefit us. I'm not saying everything that happened in history was great, but when you destroy your past, you pretend it didn't exist and worse, you trample on it, 
then your present and your future are up for grabs also. Then it's not real. Let's take the last few hours of this day of Tisha B'Av and remember, it's not just our exile, it's part of our redemption. It's a long redemption and we're trying to hasten it. And every mitzvah that we do, and every commitment that you take upon yourself, as small as it is, as it's still valuable, it's still precious to God. And everything that you do connects you to your history and bridges you to the future. I look forward again, I thank you for listening. I look forward for the opportunity to meet you at a different time. Maybe Rabbi Malou will bring you to our synagogue and um, may we merit to enjoy a full redemption speedily in our days. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much for your beautiful words. Uh, a long exile, you said back, a long redemption. That is so beautiful. And uh, we are on our way. Every tear, every moment is another step towards that redemption. I once saw that the Shla says that you don't celebrate Tisha B'Av on Shabbat because you will be building on Shabbat if you said, if you thought about and went through the thought of Tisha B'Av, you'll be building it, which means that right now the longing allows us to actually have that feeling of wanting to see the, rebu the rebuilding and it will give us that rebuilding of the temples. So we are always on our way to somewhere and this is a beautiful journey. And we're so thankful that you're here with us, Rabbi, and you're part of this community. And um, thank you for your words. It really touched our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to call up uh, Rabbi Jacobs, Rabbi Yitz Jacobs, who um, literally uh, brought us here to LA. So we are very, very thankful that Rabbi Jacobs is here with us today. Um, he literally brought us here um, from Eugene, Oregon. That's where we came from. And um, I'm just getting off that. Yes, and, and we are so thankful that he's here with us um, to inspire us. His, wo his words are always so touching and inspiring and to the point. So we are really thankful, and the community here is thankful for Rabbi Jacobs, especially me and Shira and our family. Um, we are thankful for Rabbi Jacobs. Hashem is thankful for him. He's a real hero of HLA. And with that, I will give him... The floor i will give him the um the talk so thank you rabbi jacobs for being here they can hear you rabbi okay i just had to plug in my mic oh it's okay i can't greet anyone but uh today we are i can thank jack thank you so much and your wife as well for being such incredible inspirations from putting all this together for us um Today, we are mourning the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And I know everyone's talking about this because that's what we're doing. But my question is, how can we relate to this, especially today when we're in such a different place, so far away in time? So let's use an analogy from the coronavirus. Okay, so remember back when, when we all knew a certain type of world. A world where you could go and watch a baseball game. You could go into a store without wearing a mask. You could go to work in the workplace. And in some cases, you still had a job. Remember that world? Well, along came this little thing called a virus. And now the world is in an incredibly different place. The entire world, there's no place that's devoid of this effect. All those things that we took for granted are now gone. And in hindsight, we didn't realize how great we had it. We didn't realize how lucky we were until it was all taken away. So imagine, God forbid, waking up one morning and in those first few fuzzy moments of consciousness, you reorient yourself to the reality that two days ago, God forbid, one of your parents passed away. God forbid. So as soon as you realized that you had woken up in a world without your parent, 
your heart plunges into fathomless grief. It's like waking up into a nightmare that will never end. You go back to sitting on your low chair. Your clothes haven't been washed. You got this beard. The world without your father is not simply the same world minus one person. It's a totally different existence, a totally different world and reality. This altered, diminished world lacks the stability and goodness that was your father. The world feels unstable. It feels incomplete. The laws of mourning from our Torah suggest that it takes at least a year to adapt to this new world, to learn to navigate this new emotional reality. But even 5, 10, 15 years later, it's not and will never, ever be the same world in which your father was so benevolently and lovingly present. But what about the Beis Hamikdash? How could we use that as an analogy? We never knew the Beis Hamikdash. We've never had a relationship with the Beis Hamikdash. We never experienced its love. We've never experienced its glory. We've never lived in a world where God's presence was tangible, where it filled our world, filled our temple, and filled ourselves. We have always lived in a world that's post the destruction. So I'd like to draw a distinction. There are things that we had which were taken away. And that results in a sense of loss and lack. This is one type of mourning. But if we look at tissue above this way, it's going to be very, very hard to mourn. Okay, we could use our imaginations and we can try to imagine what it must have been like, right? Try to get a better sense of what's now missing. But it's not the same as having someone you love and no longer be able to spend time with them. People say you can't miss something you've never experienced. And I think that's true to some extent, but imagine if you were a slave, born into slavery, you can still yearn for freedom, even if you've never had it before. If you were born into darkness, you can still yearn for light, even if you've never experienced it before. Why? Because there are some experiences which, while we haven't experienced it before, we have experienced it before, even if not explicitly within our lifetime or our direct experience. There are some experiences that are part of our souls. When something is part of our soul and we can't express it, like freedom, like light, when something is part of our soul and we can't grasp it, we can't express it, we can't tap into it, we miss it, we yearn for it. A child that never had a mother won't miss a flesh and blood person that they never met but he or she will still yearn for a mother because that relationship is a part of our souls. So we're not just missing the base Hamikdash. We're yearning for it because it's part of our soul. Okay? It's not just some abstract concept or some thing that we had. We're missing something that is a fundamental part of who we are. Okay, that's why we can still mourn the temple even after 2,000 years when we can express a treasured part of our very selves. That yearning for expression of our soul can be felt 20, 200, even 2,000 years later. Tisha B'Av is more like a death then it's like a destruction. We didn't lose a building. We're not mourning bricks. We lost a relationship. It was like a child being born now without a parent. Okay, It's like us 
never knowing how the room lit up when that beloved pair had entered, how other people felt so secure and supported by that pair that we never met. We misrepresented by saying it's the loss of a building. We lost the divine presence. We lost living in a world where we feel Hashem. We lost having a place where you can go to meet Hashem. There were no atheists in the world. Because if someone said, I don't believe in God, you would just say, oh yeah? Well, why don't you go to Yerushalayim and meet him? This is what happened to me when I went to Yerushalayim. He's still there, but not like it was before we had a temple. Okay, we live in a different world, a coarser, dimmer world, where physical reality seems like it's the ultimate truth. And spirituality feels like some vague illusion. And we navigate in this reality without even knowing that we're in it. But we all long for what was lost because it's in our soul. We all long for the divine presence. We all feel that there's something missing in our lives in the way that we know it. Okay, I may be dating myself. But there's a movie in my day called The Matrix, and in it, Neil feels this sense of emptiness and lack. Something's missing, and he gets a uh, uh, he gets told, "What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind." driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. So we feel something. And I'm going to call this thing that we're feeling, which could be called many different things, but I'm going to call it right now a sense of inner emptiness, of lack. And one thing that I've noticed throughout my years, talking to thousands and thousands of people, is that many, many of them have confided in me that they feel a sense of inner emptiness and inner aloneness. Even if they have everything a person can want and are surrounded by people who are close to them, some of them still have a sense of inner emptiness and inner aloneness. Now, feeling empty and alone is a strange and uncomfortable sensation. And even if we learn to live with it, it's never going to feel comfortable. It always feels like something isn't quite right. So what's going on with all of these people, with ourselves? So what's meant to fill that space that we're calling this inner emptiness and inner aloneness? If all of these things and all these people in our lives aren't doing the job. What's meant to fill that space if all these things and all these people aren't filling it? So we wonder, what's going to fill this space? Okay, and we think, well, maybe more things and more people will fill that inner emptiness, right? How do you try to fill up that emptiness? Okay, so some people do it through relationships. More people, gaining approval, caretaking, victimizing, right? Relationships. Okay, other people do it by filling themselves up with things. Food, sugar, alcohol, cigarettes. Other people do it by filling themselves up with activities, such as accumulating different possessions, watching movies, having relations, playing video games, working, shopping, spending, gambling, right? Filling ourselves up with relationships, with substances, with activities, okay? And we think that maybe more and more of this will finally fill the emptiness. Well, they may work for a moment or two, but they never work for very long. Soon the emptiness is back and you're looking for someone or something else to fill it, the black hole of emptiness. Why? That's because none of these external factors are the cause of our emptiness. That's why you can't fill it. Okay, it's not due to an absence of money or not having the 
quality relationships that could also cause emptiness, okay? But it's a different emptiness, okay? It's not any of these situations, okay? And the problem with all these behaviors is, is they only address the symptoms. They don't address the cause. So what's the cause? So to understand the cause, let's look at the temple itself. The temple was the resting place that we originally called the tabernacle, right? Which was a portable Mount Sinai. It was called the Beit HaMikdash. Beit is the word by it. It means house, okay? Often you can translate it as the holy house. So what do we mean when we talk about a holy house in the context of our relationship to God? So in Hebrew, the word house is base or bayit, and the letter of the alphabet, the second one is also base. Okay, for Spartan, it's bait, bayit, I know. Okay, so the base, the letter, is the number two. It has to do with two-ness. Base, a bayit has to do with how two things interact. So imagine two separate individuals. We got Jan and we got Dan. Jan and Dan each have their own lives, their own circle, but they meet each other, okay? And as they meet each other, they get to know each other. What happens is that there's an area of their lives which start to intersect, that start to overlap. Okay, that area of overlap where the two meet is what we call the base or the bias, the house in Judaism. A house brings together is where the two elements that come together live. Okay, and a house is where the two different entities find their common denominator. So a house of marriage includes two people, two distinct people with distinct natures and personalities and interests. And they come together. Now, the part of each spouse that the other finds in unbearable, that can't live in that house, eventually over time gets separated from the house itself. They do those things outside the house, right? The things that remain in the house and get built and accentuated are the things that serve the commonality, okay? The things where these two can thrive together. And over time, the things that detract from the house are relegated to outside, and the things that thrive and build the house remain within. Okay, and that's what creates a healthy marriage. So, how does this relate to God and man? When the two people are inside building their dreams and goals, how does this relate to God, man? in the Beit HaMikdash. So God created a place, a bias, a house in this world that would serve as a place to contain and join himself and mankind. A place where man and God could unite in what they have in common. But what do we have in common with God? Well, we have a peace of God. We have within each and every one of us our divine soul. The place where we join and intersect with God mm -hmm. is through the medium of our divine soul. So that's what was in the house. When we went to the Beit HaMikdash, we felt that place which joins, where we are joined with God. And it was in the world, and everyone felt it, because the Beit HaMikdash killed the world. When we lost the Beit HaMikdash, we lost the place where we experienced our souls joining to Hashem. When our house with God was destroyed, we lost that place of connection. We lost our ability to easily tap into our souls and tangibly experience both our own souls and the living, vibrant God. Without that experience, our souls felt cut off from the source. And we started to see our very selves in a radically different light. Okay. 
we can't forget. We can't cut off. We can't stop yearning for what we lost. We try. We try to forget. We try to move on. We try to fill it with all of these other things, but nothing works. Nothing is going to change and replace what was lost. Realize, Jews, that right now we are far away from home. Whether we're living in Israel or we're living in LA like me, we are far away. We're living in a strange, unfamiliar world. This period of three weeks reminds us what was lost. We forget. It's so intangible. It's to remind us what was lost so we can understand the cause of our inner emptiness. And therefore, we can seek out the true cure. Tisha B'Av reminds us every year before the high holidays, we need Tisha B'Av to remind us before we can start rebuilding the relationship, to remind us we lost a relationship, that something is gone, something that we yearn for, it's gone. We can't fix a relationship that we don't even know is broken because we don't even know it's gone. So this is not about tshuva. Fixing relationships, fixing. This is about mourning. It's about remembering what was lost and how far away we are. Reminding ourselves we're so far away. We lost something so precious. We forgot about it again. I know it's been a year. I forgot again. Yes, me too. We all did. But today's the day to remember what we lost and reconnect to that emptiness. And give it a name. Give it a name. And yearn once again for it to be filled. There's a special mitzvah to cry on Tisha B'Av. And it says that one who cries on Tisha B'Av will merit to experience the joy of its rebuilding. So let's see what this means. I'm going to give you a story to help illustrate it. So once upon a time in the not so distant past, there was a man and he was having hard financial times. He looked at all the different options of what to do. And what seemed like the best is to become an overseas merchant. Okay, taking things from where he lived, going overseas on a ship and trading with people in other countries and bringing back exotic goods in order to uh, sell them where he lived. So this seemed like the best opportunity of the time. And, you know, for many years, he started becoming a sailor and he was fairly prosperous. And one year he's thinking, uh, I'm at a point where this should be my last journey. I don't need to spend six months of the year away from my family ever again. And he gets on the ship when he hopes for it's the last time. And he's away at sea. And then a report comes out and there's a phone call to the family and the family is told we have every reason to believe that the ship that your husband was on that your father was on that your brother was on that it sank and everyone drowned and he's never coming back you can imagine the grief. You can imagine the response of the family, how their whole lives are shattered. Nothing is the same. The tears, the wailing, ruins. Okay? This is the grief. This is the despair. Nothing can console them. The man's friends were also greatly distressed. They cried and they mourned the loss with the family and they suffered tremendous grief from the loss. The man's greater community were also extremely distressed. They held services, they recited speeches, they had a vigil, right? and they commemorated the loss in a heartfelt way. 
And lastly, imagine a man. This man was reading the local newspaper. And he sees there's an article. Local man lost at sea. He's never met this man. He reads the whole article and he feels in his heart, that's terrible. That's so sad. And then he flips the page and he reads about, ooh, they just came up with a new fertilizer for the lawn. Ooh, right? Okay, so imagine now, miracle of miracles that this man, the father, the husband, who was lost at sea, managed to somehow grab a piece of the ship and float days and days later, float to some land where he was found and rescued and managed to get a message back home. So now imagine that message. Imagine that message reaching the ears of his wife, of his kids, of his family, his brothers, his sisters, and nephews, and nieces. Imagine the level of joy. The despair flips to the most incredible joy and celebration that you've never experienced. Words can't describe how they felt. And now imagine his friend. His friend's here. He's alive. That friend is alive. And they feel tremendous elation and joy as well. And then the community hears his shul and his club. He's still alive. And they all say, praise God. Praise God he's alive. That's great. What a great happy day. And lastly, the man with the newspaper. He's looking in his newspaper and he reads an article and it says, oh, local man who had been thought lost at sea miraculously floats to shore and was saved. And he thinks to himself, that's so nice. That's so great. And then he flips the page and he says, oh, there's a great article on lawnmower maintenance. Oh, that's really helpful. So, can you see now why those who really cried over the loss of the base of Mikdash are going to be the ones that are going to most celebrate its rebuilding? The family, you can't describe the grief, and then you couldn't describe the joy when it was rebuilt. And the friends, grief, but they can live their lives and move on with their lives, but still felt very happy when the, base, when, when the man was restored. Then the community, they commemorated it, right? They made it important. And when it was restored, the man was alive, they also commemorated they made it important, right? But it wasn't life-changing. And finally, the man with the newspaper, he said, that's so sad. He said, that's so nice. It occupied about three seconds in his life, each one. Who is going to feel the joy of the rebuilding are those of us right now, out here, when the temple, the house is destroyed, who understand and feel what we've lost who understand and feel that we lost a piece of ourselves, the piece of ourselves that connects us back to God, that creates this inner fullness, this sense of knowingness, this sense of connectivity, this sense of togetherness, this sense of amazingness, the sense of being in the right life, a life of meaning and purpose, and we can't even really understand what it's like to be in the world of the base of Middash. But we, every single one of us, can feel the emptiness right now. We all feel it all the time. We can feel the emptiness and we can give it a name. And we can use that to yearn. To yearn not for a new TV, right? There's one that's thinner now. Not for a new conquest. Not for a new relationship. 
we can use this yearning to yearn for Hashem, to yearn for a life and a world with the, with the temple we built, to yearn and to propel us to do those things which will lead to that outcome. Each and every one of us has this powerful engine, this powerful source of motivation to relieve this emptiness. We all feel it, we all do it all the time. But what efforts are we making and where are these efforts going? So each one of us now has the opportunity to be part of the solution, to take the efforts that we have, that we feel are so important to alleviate the discomfort and rebuild the base of Mikdash in our day. Okay, that doesn't mean I'm taking bricks and I'm going up to the Arab, uh, you know, where the Arabs are, and I'm like taking my brick and I'm putting down the brick and I'm saying, here, get out of the way, I'm building the base of Mikdash. It means that each and every one of us is rebuilding the connection to God from within. Because we are all a Mikdash. We are all, each one of us is a place where God's holy presence can dwell. And that's what we're doing on the world. And the vision, the ultimate vision, is that each and every one of us rebuilds the shattered temple within, rebuilds our inner base on Mikdash. And then, when all the Jews, each one of us is a brick, and when all the Jews are back, all the Jews, each brick is rebuilt, then God will assemble us once again together. Okay, when each Jew is now a place where Hashem's Shechina can dwell, each one of us is a place where God can manifest, then God will take those bricks, and those bricks are going to be the temple, the rebuilt temple. Temple from Harry Mainu. So what do we do with our yearning? We start to build. First we build ourselves, then we build our neighbors and our family and our community, and then we build the world. We realize we're about to be at the high holidays. Okay? The high holidays is the next step. Right now we're there rededicating ourselves to the temple. We dedicating ourselves to the mission. We dedicate ourselves to the purpose. This is where we're at right now. So it's a very sad day because whenever we lose something precious, we feel sad. But in the same vein, it's a very inspiring day because mourning only continues indefinitely, only continues year after year if we just feel that there's nothing we can do to restore the thing that we lost. And sometimes that's true. And we never get over mourning. But in this case, we have something that we can do. And we are promised that we will once again rebuild the temple. So I want to kind of finish with one last idea. And the idea is that each and every one of us can help each other. Okay? That there's a difference between mourning and tshuva. Okay? And that's the difference between Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and between Tisha B'Av. Tshuva is focusing on what's wrong and how to fix it. Mourning is focusing on what we've lost and giving compassion. Okay, just like when we go to a house of mourning, how do we treat that person? Do we say, hey, you probably deserve this. It's just right that you lost this person. It's just right. Do we focus on the justice of it? Do we focus on what's right? Okay, when we or anyone we know is in a state of mourning, that is not helpful. Or oh, even saying things like, look, it must be for the best. Oh yeah, thanks. I just lost my beloved and I'm sure it's for the best, but right now I don't feel that way. And that's not helpful for you to point out in some intellectual notion that it's the best. Okay? I first have to process my feelings. So how do we help each other? How do we help each other during this time? So it's not pointing out what people are doing wrong. 
How do we walk into a house of mourning? We sit and we feel and we support and we love. And that's the avoda to build the temple right now. Just like the temple was built through baseless hatred, the temple we, we rebuilt through baseless love. That means accepting that everyone's doing the best they can, everyone's feeling the same inner edginess and coping with the best that they can, and sharing that together and supporting each other and seeing how can I build a brick in you? How can I build you? And you know what? If I do that, it's going to build that brick in me too. So two things. One, feel the loss. Feel the emptiness. We feel it all the time. We feel it every day. Feel it. Don't run from it. Don't hide it. Don't try to fill it with all this crazy stuff. Feel it and name it. It's the loss of the Shekhinah, the loss of God, the loss of the temple. It's the loss of my essence, the loss of togetherness that comes from being with God. Feel it. Name it. And mourn. Mourn for that loss understand how precious that thing that was lost and treat yourself like you would treat a mourner and treat others like you would treat a mourner with baseless love compassion sensitivity and then use that yearning use that yearning to build to rebuild this world and yourself back in the image of god that is the avoda. That is the mission of Tisha B'Av every year. And please God, we should merit to fulfill, to use this as an opportunity to fulfill our mission. And once again, see Beatle in our days, rebuilding with the base of Mikdash. Rabbi Jacobs, thank you so much for your beautiful words. They were extremely inspiring. Uh, the idea of Tisha B'Av is all about longing and yearning for growth. It's not just a building. And um, that's exactly what you're teaching. And some beautiful things that you just said. I just want to reiterate that thought that you said is that, you know, we, we feel this empty black hole within us. And so many people have this. And it's from your experience of meeting so many people. There's this lacking. And we try and fill it up. So we run after relationships and some people are into their music and some people are into their food and the sugar and the alcohol. And there's so many things that people are just running and running and running. It's the chase. And, you know, like now with COVID-19, so we're all, you know, locked down and that chase has to be, you know, kind of quiet and there's not much you can chase for. And there's always some people that still say, but what am I going to be chasing? I need to chase. I need to chase. And, and it's really about just chasing your inner self and getting to your inner core and getting to know your inner self and realizing I'm longing. I'm longing for meaning. I'm longing for purpose. I'm longing for a deeper lifestyle. I'm longing for real relationships with real people. I'm longing for purpose. And that's the language and that we need to think of and, and we need to think about. And when we long that, we, we, we'll get it back. We'll see it. We'll, even in our lives, even though... We may not actually see the temple because many people, it says, anyone who mourns the destruction of the temple will see it. It says, we'll see it now. So, um, you know, all the past generations that mourned it, they didn't see the temple being rebuilt, but they did because spiritually they were given that sense of meaning. When you feel a sense of longing, you're given a sense of meaning. If you don't feel a sense of longing, then you aren't given a sense of meaning. It's just, that's the language that you're teaching and you, you spoke so eloquently and beautifully. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for being here, Rabbi. And keep being you, keep your energy. Our community loves you and we love your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So, okay. So we, we are now waiting for Rabbit and Hella and it may take her a few minutes. And in the meantime, maybe I'll share some more, get deeper into the words of Torah as we are waiting. Uh, hopefully she can hear me, uh, Rabbi Sanhara. She's going to be speaking soon. 
But for now, um, for the next 10 minutes, I want to share with you an idea. So there, there's a story that I was that I heard recently of a man that went to speak to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef was the chief rabbi of Israel. He was the the, the greatest rabbi of our generation. In the, he passed away five years ago, and his knowledge, his breadth of knowledge, his his wisdom was so far. He, he, it was beyond, and his sensitivity to the words of Torah. People say that his writings are so uh, pure and perfect and so deep that he's like as if he's coming from, from 10 generations behind. He's so holy and beyond. So five years ago, this rabbi, Rabbi Avadi Yosef, passed away. And there were these people that came to get a ordination. Rabbis, a bunch of rabbis came in to his office and they wanted to get ordained. They wanted to become a rabbi. And there's nothing better than getting ordained a certificate saying you are a legitimate and a good rabbi from the head rabbi of all the Jewish people. So um, they all went into Rabbi Vadia Yosef's office and they sat there and he started to test them and he asked them questions and everybody had to answer different questions. And many times he would ask very basic things that were nothing to do with the study that they were studying. Many of them were either studying different laws of um, monetary laws or dayanut, laws of coming a judge in court, in Jewish court. So they were learning very intense things. And he would go off topic and ask them basic decency of humans to humans. He would ask them just different, different questions on, on chesed, on having a bit knesset, of having a synagogue these different basic things. And um, by the time they were finished, obviously everyone went through their, their examination and it was a, an amazing experience that they had. But at the end of it, the rabbi said, do you have any questions you want to ask me about anything? And people started asking questions. And one person said, rabbi, what's going to be with Iran? What's going to be with Iran? You know, Iran and the what they're trying to do with Israel and the Jewish people saying wipe them off the map and they are working towards developing a, uh, a nuclear bomb. Hopefully that's going to take them much longer now, but they've been working towards developing a nu nuclear bomb and they are constantly openly talking about destroying Israel. So what are we going to do about Iran? And the rabbi said, what what's your what's the problem? He says, What do you mean? What's the problem? They have a nuclear bomb and they could throw in Israel. So he says, Azma, so what? As Nizrok Alem od Eser. They throw us one, we'll throw them ten. So what? It was almost like a response that seemed a joke. And people were like, What ma, ma? he said, he laughed. He says, What are you worried about? What's the big deal? Eventually they said but it's dangerous he's okay okay but ma so that was his statement then five minutes later someone else asked in the same room another question and he said rabbi what's going to be with the spirituality of our generation we have something called the internet and everyone's on their phones parents are on their phones when their kids are not around they're not giving attention to their children and people are not um, being looked after in times that they should be. People are exposed to so much death and, and scenes of, you know, if a child sees, even if it's not real, a video of graphic um, action of horrific scenes, it affects the child as if it's real for him. We have to be very careful with what our children see. And we are exposed to thousands and thousands of acts or at least acts of murder, but it affects us. What do we think? It's not going to affect, of course it affects us. And we are affected. There's so much, so much exposure to negativity online. So they asked this to the rabbi, what's going to be with our generation? How are we going to look after our children? What's going to be? And at that point, the rabbi burst into tears with Iran and the nuclear bomb, asthma. But the minute they said, what's well, going to be with the dangers of our spirituality, the rabbi started to cry. And he cried and he cried and he cried and he cried uncontrollably. And the message was, look, we as humans, we think our threat is only physical threats. 
We think our threat is only if people make, uh, if, if people hurt us. No, it's not. That's not our only threat. Our biggest threat is our meaning in life. What are we here for? What are we doing with our life? That's our biggest threat. That is the threat. What am, am I wasting that feeling of what? Echa, where am I? That's the words of lament. Echa, where are you? What did I do? That feeling of ma city, what did I do? That is the feeling that we need to embrace and understand right now. And that's exactly what this rabbi said. We need to understand that we're not mourning just a building. Someone asked me, are we mourning a building? I said to him, are we mourning a building? Of course not just a building. There's so much more than just a building. Of course, yes, the building had an ability, but that was the outcome to bring and help us bring light and God's presence to the world. That was the outcome, but it's not the building. The, the, the source is our inner self. So many people are hurting right now. So many people are angry right now. So many people are alone right now. People feel that they don't have meaning and purpose, and it's all a lack of spirituality. Physically, so many people have. We have. What do we need? Physically, we're okay. We thought maybe people are going to run out of toilet paper. So everyone was running toilet paper, but physically we're okay. The question is, are we okay spiritually? And we don't even know what we're mourning. And that's exactly what Rabbi Jacobs and the other rabbis have been speaking about. We don't even know what we're missing. But let me tell you that feeling that a person gets when they say, what did I do? Why, why did I say that? What did I do? What, a, what is that me? Is that who I am? That is the feeling that we're meant to be mourning right now. We're longing for a connection to Hashem. We're longing for that deeper connection. The world should have a deeper connection. That is one level of what we are longing. So um, that is the message that I thought Rabbi Ovadi Yosef taught in that one class that he, in that one test that he gave for these rabbis was that powerful message. You don't only have to worry about physical comfort. We have to worry about spiritual comfort as well. Are we doing what we do right? Am I going to be another year and another year looking back at myself and saying, nothing changed? Am I going to be looking at the rest of my life and saying, I didn't long if I long, if I want it, if I really, really want, then I will change. If I really long connection, that's the moment that we're in right now. If I really want connection, then in the future, it's going to be Rosh Hashanah. Then it's going to be Yom Kippur. Then it's going to be a new year. But we have to long it. We have to say, what did I do? What am I looking for? Okay, with that, I'm going to call up Rebetz and Hella, who's uh, here. Uh, Baruch Hashem with us, and she's going to be speaking about uh, the language barrier. And I'm sure you can imagine which barrier that is. Not a physical barrier, but a spiritual one. So we're very thankful to have her here. She works again with us, and she is a big part of the founding of HLA, a big part of HLA all the way back. And we are so, so grateful grateful that she's a part of this amazing institution, this amazing organization. Here we are, here we are to have Rebbitz and Hella with us. Thank you, Rebbitzen, for being here. Uh, we are very thankful that you're here to inspire us tonight, today. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Malul. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Sorry about that little technical glitch. Um, no a few problem. years ago, <laughs> a few years ago, I was at a funeral for a friend's father. And one of the friends of the deceased was giving a eulogy and said something that I have never forgotten. He said, Sam never had a bad word to say about anyone. And I thought to myself, wow, that's the kind of person I'd like to be. I'd like to be the kind of person who's never had a bad word to say about anyone. And that's what I would like people to say about me when all is said and done. What do you want people to say about you? The second temple was destroyed because of hatred, Jew against Jew. And when we hate, how is our hatred expressed? Gossip, slander, lies. Evil speech or Lush and Hara is so serious that the temple was destroyed and we were exiled from our land in an exile that's lasted over 2,000 years. And our rabbis say that in every generation that the temple isn't built, we're still making the same mistake the same mistake. We're still hating one another. We're still speaking badly about one another. Why do we do this? 
Speaking badly about another person does not come from a good place, a healthy place. Usually it comes from a place of insecurity or low self-esteem. I don't feel particularly good about myself, but if I speak about your shortcomings, I can feel a little bit about myself, at least temporarily. Did you notice who Sarah's dating now? Eh, he'll dump her after he breaks her heart. She always chooses the losers. The implication is, I wouldn't make such a mistake. I would be much more prudent in my choice of who I would date. By putting Sarah down, I raise myself up in my mind. But that, of course, is only in my imagination. In reality, I've only lowered myself by speaking poorly about another person. Today, many people think nothing of practicing character assassination of people who think differently, like they're members of the other political party, that they're for the other candidate. You can disagree passionately with somebody's, somebody's ideology, but you have to hate them personally. Judaism, Judaism teaches us that we need to be able to differentiate between the two. Yes, you can still love people whose ideology you disagree with. What if your brother, God forbid, became a member of a cult? Do you stop loving him? What if your sister became an ardent BDS advocate and you are a lover of Israel? Would you shame her on social media? We've all seen cases of people unfriending someone because they disagree vehemently with a particular belief. Our mandate is to love other Jews and to love humanity. Even if they're ignorant, misguided, or very intelligent people who you think have gone off the deep end, and even if they're so open-minded that you think their brains fell out. The only people we're permitted to hate are people who are truly evil, and most of our friends, acquaintances, and family members do not fall into that category. Sometimes we speak badly about other people out of revenge. They did something to hurt us, and we're looking for a way to hurt them back, also not coming from a great place. We're taught in Judaism not to take revenge and to try to judge people favorably, as Sharon Shaker spoke about, to look for excuses why a person behaved badly or said something unkind. Maybe she just lost her job, heard some really bad news. Just like we want people to give us the benefit of the doubt, we need to be willing to do the same for others. In fact, Judaism teaches that God judges us in the way we judge others. So let's make sure we do it with kindness. Let's do a short review of Lashon Hara. So Lashon Hara is defined as anything which is derogatory. It is true, and it has no constructive purpose. So three conditions. Derogatory, it's true, and it has no constructive purpose. If I say something that's derogatory and false, it's slander, which is also prohibited, but that is a different prohibition. Much more common is Lashon Hara. We think we can say it because it's true. In fact, that's how we defend ourselves. We say, but it's true. Harry is so cheap. Were you at the Cone's wedding? Oh my gosh, was that the most ostentatious affair you have ever been to? Who are they trying to impress? Everyone knows they'll probably be in debt up to their nose for the next 10 years. Your, your high school re reunion. Oh my gosh, I think that's Lisa over there. I hardly recognized her. Can you believe she was once the homecoming queen? Gossip is called the dirt and the lowdown for a reason. It is low and it's so hurtful. We know how much it hurts when people are talking about us. It's so easy to dish it out and so hard to take. When we gossip, three people are hurt. The speaker, the person spoken about, and the listener. How is each one of them hurt? Well, the speaker has lowered herself by, by speaking poorly about someone. She's just proven herself as somebody who can't be trusted. Would you confide in someone who gossips? There's a saying that goes, if someone will gossip to you, they will gossip about you. The person spoken about, well, this is the easiest one to understand. A few misplaced words, unkind words, you can ruin a person's reputation, their opportunity for a job or a promotion or a marriage prospect. Our words have that much power. And once we've said them, it's impossible to take them back. 
I didn't mean it or I was only joking, doesn't make it better. We have an obligation not to believe the negative things that people say as being 100% true. But how hard is that? Can you really wipe out, wipe something out of your mind completely once you've heard it? I remember as a teenager overhearing my father and a group of men in our living room discussing who they were soliciting for the UJA. They were divvy, divvying up pledge cards when I heard one man say, Ugh, don't bother wasting your time going to so-and-so's home. You'll be lucky if you get $10. This happened to be the father of one of my friends he was talking about. And you can be sure every time I went over to her house or saw this man somewhere, that was the first thing that came to my mind. In fact, 50 years later, I still remember it. People can carry with them what you say for a lifetime. The listener. The listener is actually the most culpable, according to Judaism. Why would that be? We would think that the speaker would be the one who is the most guilty. Well, the speaker couldn't speak without a willing audience. The listener is actually enabling the gossip. He's an active accomplice to the crime. So the next time someone says to you, did you hear about Roy? Think twice before you say, no, what? What would be a constructive reason to say something negative about someone? Let's say someone publicly berated me at work and I am totally embarrassed, humiliated, emotionally distraught. I need to talk to someone about it. Is that okay? Yes, that's a constructive purpose, but there are also conditions when we need to vent. How many people do I really need to talk to to seek the emotional relief that I need? If by the end of the day, my mother knows about it, my best friend, my personal trainer, and my neighbor, well, I've gone overboard. <laughs> Ideally, I should seek one person who can listen and help me process what I'm feeling. And then I need to ask myself, how much do I really need to say to gain the emotional release that I'm seeking? If the person I'm speaking to has no idea who this, who this person is who berated me at work, and they will never know, then I can tell the whole story. But if she knows the identi identity of the perpetrator, I need to be careful to say the minimum that I need to say in order to get the relief that I am seeking. That's a very hard thing to do when you're feeling upset, angry, humiliated. Sometimes people think that they can say anything to a spouse. Certainly lush and horror doesn't apply when it comes to talking to your husband or wife, right? Well, Yes, it does. Even to your spouse, you need to be careful about what you say. In fact, I would suggest that the marital relationship would be the place you want to be the most careful about not gossiping or not venting too much. Of course, in really serious situations, a spouse is your go-to pers person. But personally, I want to put my best foot forward in my relationship with my husband. I care very much about who I am with him, what he thinks about me, that he shouldn't that he should respect me, not think that I'm a gossip or somebody who's always telling him about the latest person who's wronged me in some way. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're much stronger than we think. We think we need to vent every time we're hurt. Or maybe we're just in the habit. I challenge you to ask yourself the next time someone hurts or wrongs you, can you just deal with it yourself? Do you really need to talk to someone about it? If you do, then by all means, do it. But maybe we can be a little bit bigger, work it out by ourselves without bad-mouthing anyone. Remember, your spouse is likely to harbor a grudge against anyone who wronged you, even after you've made up with this person. Gossip is all around us. Be ready with some tools in your toolbox to avoid getting drawn in. Learn how to change the subject. <gasps> oh, that reminds me of something I really need to tell you before I forget. Or maybe you have a sudden urge to use the restroom. Or you forgot that you were supposed to call your mother 10 minutes ago. Oh my gosh. Or maybe you could just honestly say that you feel uncomfortable speaking about so-and-so. We all want to be part of the solution. The exile of the people, of the Jewish people, from our land is a big problem. Hatred between Jew and Jew is a big problem. 
Not having a temple that unites us as a family and connects us intimately to our Father in heaven who loves us is a big problem. It's easy for us to feel powerless that my little effort couldn't make much of a difference, but we couldn't be more mistaken. Healing the world begins with healing ourselves. Healing the, wor the world begins with realizing the tremendous power that resides within each one of us to create a world that's kinder and more compassionate. Even though our world looks pretty dark right now, we should always remain hopeful and take consolation in God's promise that we will surely see much better days with our return to Israel and the rebuilding of our temple. May it happen speedily in our days. Amen. Thank you so much, Robertson, for your beautiful words. Uh, we are so thankful that you're here, thankful to work with you, thankful, thankful for you being part of our making our organization happen, uh, HLA, and uh, everything that you do uh, with JMI, JWI. We are so thankful that we work with you and your words have been so to the point and so thank beautiful. Uh, what I found, of course, of course, thank you, thank you. What I found was so important, the main point that I came out with it was how it starts within our own home. It starts within myself. It starts within my own relationship. It starts with the Jew to Jew. It starts with, you know, in my own closed doors. It's not necessarily only about how I look on the outside. I was speaking just this week with our students and we were speaking how um, we're so politically correct today and we're so about making sure that we sound good in public today. But there's a lot of hate inside. There's a lot of hiddenness going on uh, of hate, you know, online and social media, and behind the clothes, but suddenly when someone's anonymous, the hate can come in. But, and we, I, I, even I remember growing up, and I'm, I'm young, as you can tell, but I remember growing up, and the words that we used to say was, were normal, and today they are completely incorrect. They are completely unaccepted. So we've come this body of, you know, shaming, uh, Everyone has to say perfect words and you don't even know what to say. So you don't say anything. You know, I can't even say the word fat in England. That's normal. You know, I'm a bit fat. Everyone's like looking around at me as if I've lost my mind. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how sensitive we are in public, but insensitive we are in person. And you know that because also your husband is a uh, psychiatrist and, and a, a, a hey, professional a therapist, sorry, therapist. Um, a therapist, and he works with people like this, and he knows that, it, you know, they may look good on the outside, but from the inside, they have, at home, there's a lot of pain, and it starts there. That's where it all starts, so that's really what Lashon Hara is, and we really thank you for being here and joining us and speaking uh, for us today, so thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, we are slightly early um i'm not sure if rabbi becher is okay with starting a bit earlier maybe he is maybe he isn't um but for the meantime i'm gonna uh, okay so maybe rabbi becher is okay so we're very excited that he's here with us and he is okay with starting earlier um the the thing is many people know that you're coming on at 2 30 but they would get your last 15 minutes and it's, that's the best part anyway. So we're really happy to have you here, Rabbi. And we're going to add him to the screen. Rabbi, they can hear you now. They couldn't hear you beforehand. Ah, but since it's a half an hour class, if I start 15 minutes early, they'll miss half the class. I know. Okay, so I'll, I will speak for the idea. next 15 minutes. And Also, as you know, in Jewish tradition, starting on time is a sin. <laughs> starting early is very, very serious. Uh, very serious indeed. <laughs> And uh, Rabbi, I'm not meant to laugh today. How, how do I overcome this? Sorry, <laughs> no, it's okay, but that was brilliant. Um, uh, so you would rather start at 2 30? It's okay, I have stuff to show in the meantime. I would prefer to start, yeah, at, at the time. At I'm, I'm happy to okay. talk with you Perfect. now if Perfect. you like, and we could talk yeah. about other stuff, and then I could start the class five, whatever you want. Yes, yes, that would be great. 
Where are you now, Rabbi? If you don't mind me are asking. Are we online? We're we're live now. Yeah. We're live. Yes, we are. Yes, are. I am in Passaic, New Jersey, oh, uh, nice. which is um, not far from uh, Manhattan. It's a uh, relatively large Jewish community. Um, most people do not work in Passaic. So wow. Uh, Rabbi, what number class is this today that you're about to give? Because you're really uh, busy. Well, you know. Last night, from 10 o'clock till 11, 10.15 to 11.15, I gave a class on the history of pogroms throughout history. No. Um, from I called it from Kishinev to Crown Heights, but I started earlier <laughs> than that. That was last night. Um, this morning, I did a two-and-a-half-hour explanatory service on the kinot, those are the elegies or the uh, morning poems that we read on today on Tisha B'Av. So I explain the historical background and the context and the and the, the language and the hints and the references. And it was a wonderful uh, time, two and a half hours, very meaningful. Uh, wow. After that, I spoke for Neve Yerushalayim, level two, uh, that was for half the people were in Israel, actually, and the rest were scattered around the globe. And I gave a class there on theodicy, understanding divine justice. Um, and uh, now I am on here with you. Oh, I also gave a class for <laughs> Project Nasora, um, in which I discussed the uh, broad historical aspects of Tisha B'Av, not just the temples, but all the way through history, things that occurred on or around Tisha B'Av. So mm -hmm. um, now, and now I have, now I have this. this is my last class for the day. Wow. Unbelievable. You know, we say in the, in one of the keynote, we say misped chadash, a new morning. Uh, I saw that as one of the words that we say in the, the, the language of the kina. I forgot which kina it was, but I saw that word and I was thinking, wow, every year it's a new misped. It's a new morning because you know there's a new reason first of all the temple's not being rebuilt this year and we we know that every year that it's not built it's as if it got destroyed this year but i was wondering did you in any way manage to connect what's going on in the world right now with covid and the challenges of the world to the message of tisha b'av and what was that connection I did not did. do that. Um, I oh, okay. generally, in principle, avoid doing stuff like that because oh, really? I, I, you know, I would say that there was a rabbi called Chazon Ish of Avram Isaiah Karelitz, who uh, was mm -hmm. born in Vilna and passed away in Israel in the 1950s. Rav Avram Ishai Karelitz was known by the name of his work Chazon Ish, which literally means the vision of man. Uh, but he once said he once asked an interesting question. He said, Psalms is considered one of the books of prophets, of prophecy, right? But if you think about it, the Psalms, to heal him, are the exact opposite of prophecy. What is prophecy? If you define prophecy, prophecy is God speaking to the human being. What are Psalms? The human speaking to God. Humans. Right. Correct? What Chazon yep. Ish said is, what we see from here is, not only to know what God says to you, do you need prophecy, but to know what's going on inside of you and to know what's going on in the present, in the world that needs to be expressed, you also need prophecy. So uh, prophecy is not just to know the future, but you also need it to know the present. The present. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to make those connections, I find just not possible uh, now, it is true that we are supposed to uh, engage in introspection and any tragedy that occurs is an opportunity for us to look into ourselves and to try to improve. That is true. Right. Speaking of improving, is my image blurry or is that my eyes? Uh, you, you look beautiful and perfect. It's not, it's not, not blurry? blurry? All. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. No. So my eyes then. That's, I was worried about that. Okay, in any case, um, so... So on the one hand, we are obligated to look into our situation and to try to improve ourselves and figure things out and become better people. And that actually mm -hmm. Maimonides, a great scholar from uh, Cairo in Egypt, originally born in Spain, 
uh, Maimonides in the 13th century, he said that the, there's a mitzvah commandment of the Torah, that any time there's a tragedy that strikes, we should gather together and try to improve. But there's a big difference between that and making claims about that I would understand or know why this is happening and what I, I, I it's a little bit above my I pay agree. grade. But I'm happy to I get a raise and try to yeah. do that. But you know. <laughs> well, I agree. We can never we can never say the reason, especially with COVID. No one knows nothing. That's the biggest right. message that came out of this was you know, some someone said a mask, then someone says no masks don't work, then someone says uh, you know, it, it went from one thing to the next, you know, 50 people, then it said uh, 10 people, then it, there was just constant signs of no one knows really anything about this uh, pandemic. So uh, the message clearly was and clearly is that one thing's for sure is that we know nothing and we are, you know, God is in control. We are not in control and we just have to do our part in introspection, like you're saying, and obviously not prophecy. Which is uh... well, I just I had a physics teacher mm -hmm. who drew the following diagram when we came into class, and he said, <laughs> "This see that small wedge there? <laughs> That's what we know. This larger one. That's what we don't know. This <laughs> is what we don't know. We don't know." <laughs> So uh, that's a situation that we're very clearly in. There's what we know, there's what we don't know, and there is what we don't even know we don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, a human being is obligated to do their efforts, um, and we have been endowed with incredible intelligence, many of us, uh, and um, we have uh, been given the obligation to use the the knowledge that we do have to try right. to uh, help ourselves and help humanity. So uh, I'm not uh, discarding our knowledge and saying we know nothing and therefore the you know COVID just like lie back and and just take it. No, right? Obviously the Torah God expects us to use our minds to uh, to improve ourselves in the world and uh, so and I think He does help us in that. Uh, you know, there's often uh, you know, in, in Yiddish, there's a word Einfell. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a Sephardic. I don't expect you to yes. know Yiddish. Um, <laughs> but Einfell means idea. But the etymology of that word, Einfell, it means fell in. Mm. If your mind is open enough to something, if you've been working on a problem, sometimes you'll be working on the issue, you go to sleep or you go into the shower, and bingo, oh, right that's Einfell. it fell in now but you have to have your own preparation beforehand right in other words when i go into the shower i don't come up with solutions to mathematical problems oh wow yeah i solved it no that doesn't happen right uh, but things that i have been thinking about in past put effort into then yes so there's a combination of human effort where we put our best intellectual effort into trying to understand something on the one hand, and Einfell, that I've opened my eye, my mind now, the idea can fall in and I can be inspired to understand. So that's a, that I think is where we are. Wow. We have to have an open, ready to listen and we have to be aware of what to listen for. So correct. It's beautiful. I want to ask you, if you don't mind me uh, putting you, because you, you said you explained some of Echa, you know, it says in Echa, Mipi Elion Lotitse. From the mouth of above, the the words of bad and good doesn't come out. Um, as far as I understand, how how would you explain that in terms of you know how the ninth of Av? Yes, it was something which was um, you know historically a day where so many things happened, um, but at the same time we also know that it was was in the hands of the Nazis to do what they did. It was in the hands of the uh, the Spaniards in 1492, Isabella and Ferdinand, or maybe not in their hands because Lev Malachim, Biyad Hashem, it says that the king's heart is in the hands of Hashem. But the people definitely influenced him 
to uh, causing, I mean, they didn't have to do such evil acts and they, they did it. So it was also their problem and it was their free will that caused them to do it. So how, how do you, um, and why is it in the Lamentations? Why is, the, is that Pasuk there? If you have any insight, I'd love to. Well, that's that's. I, I'm the, sorry. The, to put you on the, the, the point that you made is 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 100 correct, which means uh, it is human free will, which is at the source of things that happen. Reb Moshe Chaim Lozato, the great Italian Kabbalist of the 18th century, Reb Moshe Chaim Lozato points out that there was Jacob, our ancestor, had a dream, very famous dream, probably the world's most famous dream, uh, and. Um, in the dream, he sees a ladder connecting heaven and earth. Angels going up and down the ladder, up and down. So the commentaries point out, if you're dreaming of angels on a ladder, which direction should they be heading first? Down and then up. If the Torah is describing a dream, a prophetic dream of Jacob, and he's seeing and angels up. going up the ladder, then down. That arouses our curiosity. Mm -hmm. And there are numerous explanations given in the commentaries regarding this. I will not go into those. But I want to tell you just the one, which is from Rav Moshe Chaim Luzato. So Luzato says the following. He says, angels means messages. In fact, the Hebrew word malach does mean message. And he says, the angels are the messages that the human sends up the ladder from our free will decisions to heaven. The angels that come down are a reflection of the energy and of the angels that we sent up the ladder. He says, because God placed the world in the hands of human free will. And yes, of course, things emanate from above, but what emanates from above, he says, is a reflection of what we created below. So that the angel that comes down, whether it's an angel of destruction, I use this metaphorically, an angel of destruction or an angel of kindness, is because I sent up the ladder an angel of destruction or an angel of, an angel of kindness. So Isaiah, the prophet, uh, sorry, Yechezkel, Ezekiel, the prophet, um, he sees a vision of a chariot, divine chariot, and there's a the, there's there's a there's a vision of a human on it. That's shocking. Reb Chaim Volozhin, a great Kabbalist from 19th century Lithuania, student of the Gaon of Vilna, Reb Chaim Volozhin says what that means is that the human being is indeed on the throne. We drive the chariot, and of course. Deep down, we want it to be that way because we want a meaningful life. And a meaningful life is only possible if it's a life in which our actions have meaning. We're not just little puppets. We're not rats running around in a Skinner maze in the psychology lab, pressing one lever and getting electroconvulsive therapy, pressing another lever and getting food pellets. Uh, we are beings who actually mold reality. Our decisions are like we are godlike. We can create and we can destroy. The power, so that's what it means. The, the creation and destruction comes from us. Mm -hmm. So the messages that we send up the ladder have an impact. And our actions and our decisions have an impact. And that's a heavy responsibility on the part of the human being. Why is that mentioned in the scroll of Echa in Lamentations written by Jeremiah, who witnessed the destruction of the temple? The, uh, the reason is clear. He says, why, why is he mourning? Why is he crying? Why is he writing this scroll? So that future generations will not repeat the mistakes of past generations. So that we'll understand, guys, it's not coming from above. It's coming from us. We can change things. So the message of Eicha is that we can change, that we can affect a change in reality through our free will. So that's an important lesson. Very. Well, uh, now is your time for your talk. So I'm going to disappear from the screen. And we're very thankful for your extra 15 minutes of, <laughs> of wisdom. We're very fortunate to have you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to leave the screen and thank you for those words. It really is in our hands. And that's really the message that we've been coming out here. So thank you, Rabbi. And we're excited. Welcome, everyone. 
Today is the uh, saddest day of the Jewish year, the ninth of the month of Av, but it really started three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, we had the 17th of Tammuz that commemorated other tragedies. And in Jewish tradition, we have this three-week period known as Bain Hamatzarim, between in the straits, between the between the, the, the barriers, uh, a time of mourning. But what is not as well known is that really the three weeks is the beginning of a 10-week period. There are 10 weeks from that fast day, the 17th of Tammuz, until the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. And we know that that's considered to be one unit, that those 10 weeks. How do we know that? So there is an ancient tradition that the rabbis instituted over 2,000 years ago, or actually maybe a little less than 2,000 years ago, which was reciting a Haftorah. That means every Shabbat, every Sabbath, when we read the Torah, the five books of Moses, afterwards, we always read a small, short section, sometimes not so short, uh, but a section from the prophets that's usually on the theme of that Torah portion, usually. If there's a special occasion, then a special section of the prophets is recited for that special occasion. So very interestingly, the sages of the Mishnah decreed that during the three weeks between Shiva Saba Tammuz, 17th of Tammuz, and Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, we read three Haftorahs, three sections from the prophets that talk about punishment and rebuke and destruction, which is appropriate for these three weeks. And a lot of people are familiar and aware of those sections of the prophets. What is less famous is that for the next seven weeks, starting from this Shabbat, going all the way till the Shabbat preceding Rosh Hashanah, we have what's called Shiva Dinechemta, seven sections of the prophets that all are about comfort, optimism, and hope. So that's a very interesting, first of all, the structure of three and seven is a familiar structure to the Kabbalists out there uh, because there are what we call 10 sefirot, 10 modalities of the way God deals with the world. We talk about chesed, kindness, and gvura, power, and tiferet, glory, netzach, victory, and hod, and, and, and honor, and yesod, foundation, malchut, kingdom, etc. And there are three which are of a higher world than this world, which we don't even understand, we have no relationship with. Keter, Chochma, and Bina. So the first three weeks parallel those three which we don't really have an understanding of. They are destruction and, 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 and punishment. It's very hard for us to wrap our minds around that type of thing. And the next seven represent the seven days of building, the seven days of creation, the seven days of the week. The shivas yemei habinyan, the seven days of building. So that means after three weeks of destruction, three weeks of rebuke, three weeks of punishment, three weeks of these harsh words of the prophets. We follow that with seven weeks of building, seven weeks of comfort, seven weeks of optimism. And that's a very interesting structure. And the idea behind that is explained in a comment by Maimonides. Maimonides was the great 13th century Torah scholar, physician, philosopher, leader of the Jewish people, amazing man. And Maimonides comments on a section of the Talmud and known as Ta'anit, which is actually deals with fast days that we are in today. And in that section, the Talmud says something interesting. It says that the two happiest days of the Jewish year, one is the 15th of Av, which most people have never heard of. And the other is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, not something we usually associate with joy, happiness, but that's what the Talmud says. And Maimonides comments, what was the, what was the celebration of the 15th of the month above? What was the first celebration? There are many celebrations took place on that day, which I'm not going to discuss. But the first celebration 
of that time was something very fascinating. The Jews in the desert after the Moses, uh, Jews come out of Egypt, they come close to Israel. Moses sends spies to Israel, which is standard military intelligence, field intel. You need intel. If you, you need that. Nothing wrong with that. And the spies come back with a full military and economic report of the land of Israel. But in addition to that, the spies offer their opinion. And their opinion is that it's not possible for us to get to Israel. It's not possible for us to conquer it. It's not possible for us to settle it. We will all die in the attempt. And the Jewish people took that to heart and they despaired. They gave up hope. They said, that's it. It's over. This whole venture in which we got out of Egypt and everything else, it's over. We're all going to die. That was the point at which God said, you know what? This generation that grew up in slavery in Egypt, they cannot build the state of Israel. They cannot build the land of Israel. They are not nation builders. They are going to die in the desert. In the, we're going to be in the desert 40 years. They're going to die in the desert. The next generation, the children, people who are under 20, they will build the land. And that's what happened. For 40 years, every Tisha B'Av, this day, 9th of Av, that, by the way, the events I just spoke about occurred on this day, approximately 3,200 years ago. And the Jews, every 9th of Av, people would die. People reached the age of 60, or right? They'd die. And every ninth of Av, you can't even imagine. I mean, they went out, imagine that they, they, people dug their graves and they lay down in it at night. You can imagine it was Jews, so people would say, excuse me, that's my grave, thank you. Uh, but whatever, they lay down and in the morning, they were dead. And this happened every year on the ninth of Av. Horrific. The last year, of the, de of the time in the desert, the, decree the, the people went out, they went into their graves, they lay down. In the morning, they woke up. They were not dead. You'd think they'd be overjoyed. They were not overjoyed. You know what they felt? They said, huh, we must have made a mistake in the calculation. I guess it's tomorrow night. And they kept doing this until the 15th of the month. Now, the 15th of the Jewish month, since we have a lunar month, and the first day of the month is the new moon. That means the 15th of the month is a full moon. Now, if you are lying in the desert, looking up at night, a 15th of the month, you will see a full moon. At that point, they realized, and I don't know if you have to take this whole story literally, but it's illustrative of an idea. And so listen to the idea, even though the story may not be literal in all its sense. So on the 15th, they realized, you know what? The decree must actually be over. That's it. Those of us who are alive today, we're going to go into the land of Israel. We're going to go into the promised land. We're alive. There was amazing rejoicing because everyone then who was alive understood that they were going to live and go into the land of Israel. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. And so that was the rejoicing of the 15th of Av. Now, that's all from the Talmud. And Maimonides has an interesting comment here. Maimonides writes in his commentary on the Mishnah the following. He says, on the 15th, when they realized the decree was over, he says, He'eminu ba'atzmam u'bitchu b'nafsham. They believed in themselves and they trusted in their souls. They felt the desire of God for them. And the end of his anger. Very interesting phrase. Maimonides says they believed in themselves and they trusted in, them, in their souls. This is indicative of the problem they had beforehand. The generation that grew up in Egypt were beaten for 210 years, figuratively and literally. And we're told you are nothings, you are slaves, you are nothing. And a lot of Jews believe that about themselves. And therefore, they could not build the land of Israel. They died in the desert. The generation that grew up in freedom, the generation that grew up with a relationship with God, the generation that grew up thinking and knowing 
and believing that they were indeed special, they were able to build Israel. And so the 15th of Av is the festival of belief in the self. They believed in themselves. They trusted in their souls. And then they were able to build. And so also our sages designed the reading of the sections of the prophets for these seven weeks, ten weeks, three weeks of it, we need to have some bitterness and sadness and mourning for our exile. We need to mourn the Jews who were killed and murdered in the pogroms, in the Holocaust, who were expelled from their countries, from Spain and Portugal, and from Prague and from Vienna and from Spire. And we have to mourn the Jews who were tortured by the Inquisition and the Crusades and mourn the Jews and have feel for those who were raped by pogromists in Kishinev and in Odessa and all over Eastern Europe. And yes, we have to mourn for that. But to go into Rosh Hashanah, the new year, directly from that mourning and that down side, that feeling of sadness and bitterness and, and, and self-criticism, that's not possible. If we want to build a new and a good new year, we have to first of all build ourselves. So we have seven weeks of nechama. Nechama means a change of thought. It means a comfort and optimism. And so we have seven weeks of building ourselves Heeminu, as in the words of my, it's not really the words of my Maoris, it's a translation he wrote in Arabic, but in the Hebrew translation, it says, we believe in ourselves and we trusted in our souls and we felt God's love for us. And that is so central to recovery from these three weeks, because when a Jew does look at their history, they can come, God forbid, to a feeling of yeush, of despair. And we can come to a feeling of hopelessness. But that is not appropriate. And that's not correct. Just look at us today. We have over 6 million Jews living in a Jewish state in the land of Israel. No one could have dreamed of that 200 years ago. No one could have dreamed of that 500 years ago. Through the midst of the medieval times, through the midst of, the, of all of the things that happened to us, to have dreamed that we'd have a, a state, a reincarnation of a Jewish commonwealth, which was around for 1,200 years, destroyed by the Babylonians and then by the Romans. That's incredible. Not only have Jews come back to our homeland, but we have revived the Hebrew language, a language which was dormant, used in prayer like Latin for, for, for 2,000 years. And now it's a living, breathing language. It's a language in which Scientific papers are written in which a government is run, in which an economy is run, not very well, but it's run, right, etc. It's amazing, miraculous. So we have to have belief in ourselves. And where do we get this belief in ourselves from? So Hasidic sources say we get it from the fact that God believes in us. God is described in the book of Deuteronomy towards the very end. We'll read it, God willing, in a few weeks, actually two months. Sorry. It describes God as El Emuna Vein Avel. El Emuna means a God of Emuna, means faith. So, one of the oldest commentaries on the Torah, it's called the Sifrei, predates the Mishnah. That means it's over 2,000 years old. The Sifrei says the following What does it mean by El Emuna, God of faith? It says, Sheheemin Beolamo Ubera'o. He believed in the world and then he created it. Meaning, that God believed in our ability to achieve what we need to achieve. He trusted in, our, in us. He believed in us and he created us because he believed in us. And obviously, if we're still around, he still believes in us. So God, we believe in God, yes, but God believes in us. In fact, I would say probably God has to have a lot more faith than we do. But he believes in us. And so if Warren Buffett would tell me to invest in a company, I probably would listen if I had the money. I would listen. If God tells me that he's going to invest in something, I definitely listen. Well, the creator invested in the world. 
the creator invested in the human human race, the creator invested in the Jewish people, and the creator invested in each, every, each and every one of us. We say in the morning when we wake up, at least what we, the first words we should say, I give thanks before you, God, the king who lives and exists, that you return my soul to me with compassion. And we end, great is your faith. What do we mean by that? I think what we mean is when I wake up in the morning, open my eyes, and I say, thank you, I am alive, which is an important thing to be grateful for and to be aware of. But then I end that with, Rabba Emunasecha, great is your faith. Wow, you have faith in me. God, you've invested in me. If God has invested in me, then I should certainly invest in me. If God has faith in me, then I should believe in myself. That is the first lesson I wanted to share with you today about this time, that where am I an exile of the self? The first component is believing in myself and believing in my ability. And that comes from the fact, my evidence for that is, God believes in me. If God believes in me and God believes in the Jewish people, then I certainly should believe in myself and in the Jewish people. Now, Rav Cook, the great leader of the Jews of Israel, uh, pre-state Israel, he was the chief rabbi of what was then called Palestine. And he was a one of the great, great leaders of the religious Zionist movement and of the rev national revival of the Jewish people. And Rav Cook was a man who was described as an angel amongst men, but he had a very positive outlook on everyone. He was full of love. He was very famous for a phrase that he coined. He said that, that the temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred. We can rebuild it through baseless love. Someone asked him, well, what if you're loving the wrong person? What if you have love for someone who doesn't deserve it? Rav Cook says, if I'm going to make a mistake, I'd prefer to make a mistake on the side of love than on the side of hate. That was Rav Cook. So Rav Cook quotes an interesting verse in the prophet Yechezkel. Yechezkel, exile from Israel in Babylon. And Ezekiel, the prophet, begins his prophecies. This is Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. says the following. In the 30th year, on the 4th day, on the 4th month, on the 5th day of that month, he says this. And I was in the midst of the exile. Al Nahar Kevar by the Kevar River. That's in Babylon, what we call Iraq today. And the heavens opened and I saw the visions of God. So Yechezkel, Ezekiel begins his prophecy with a fascinating statement. Ve'ani and I was in the midst of the exile. And our simple reading of that is that, yeah, I was in exile. But, but in the Hebrew, and you've got to be a little sensitive to the Hebrew here, he says, Va'ani and I was in the midst of exile. That, that, that and I was in the midst of exile is really unnecessary. He could have written the whole sentence in a more efficient way. He could have said, and it wasn't the 30th year in the fourth of the fifth, the fourth day, the fifth, fifth day of the fourth month. I was by the river Kavar in Babylon, or I was in exile. And I was in exile. Sounds like a little strange. And this is how Rav Cook understands it. Rav Cook says, the inner essential I, whether of the individual or of the community, appears within the entity in relationship to its holiness and its task and its purity. And he says that Yechezkel, Ezekiel recognized that my true self, my I, that was in exile. Meaning not only was my body in Babylon, not in Israel, and my body was in exile, but my I, my essential self, was in exile. I was not me. And Rav Cook says we can trace this back to the first human beings, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve sinned, it's interesting. 
God says to them, it says that they hid, they were ashamed, they hid from God. Obviously, you can't hide from God. God says a word, he says, Ayeka, which means, where are you? Interestingly, that word is spelled in an unusual way. It's spelled the same way as the first word of Lamentations, Eicha. We may get to that if we have time. So he says, Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? And Ruf Cook points out, obviously, God knows where they are. It's not like he's looking around and says, I could have sworn I had two humans in the garden. Where the heck are they? No. The word in Hebrew for a question of where something is, is Efo. Where is it? If I'd say Efo, where is the central bus station? You'd say, Shon, over there. Right. Efo, where? The word Aye is not so much a question. It's more of a difficulty. Now, if I tell you it's over there, you say, no, it's not. Where is it? It should be there and it's not. What God is asking Adam and Eve is, Ayeka, where are you? You should be with me. We should have a relationship. We shouldn't be hiding from me. We should be close. Where are you? What's going on? But Rav Cook understands it very a little differently. He says, God asks him, where is your you? You gave up yourself to listen to someone else. In this case, the evil inclination symbolized by the snake. Rav Cook says, God is asking Adam, where's your you? I created you with an independent soul, with a unique identity. And now by following what the other, what, what, what he said, you're not you anymore. Where is your you? And he says, Rav Cook says, that is the root of all exile. Is, and, and as we said before, the Jews accepting the narrative of the Egyptians were nothing. We're slaves. We're hopeless. They accepted that narrative. They were still in exile, even though they were in the desert. Even though they're out of Egypt. And that's really the tragedy of exile is that is that we live not according to who we really are, but we often live according to what is expected of us by others, by those who are foreign to our ideology, foreign to ourselves, foreign to Judaism. That's the tragedy. The I is in exile. And indeed, there was a great rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, known as the Kotzker Rebbe, who once said, I will not say it in Yiddish, that will, Rabbi Malul will probably faint if that's Yiddish, but I'll tell you in English, says the following, if I am I, because I am I, and he is he, because he is he, then I am truly I, and he is truly he. But if I am I, because he is he, and he is he, because I am I, then I am not I, and he is not he. Do you get that? I should be an essential reflection of who I am essentially. In the Ten Commandments, which we're actually going to read in the Torah reading this Shabbat, it says, Lo lecha pesel, Don't make yourself an idol. Tamunat kol, pictures of things. Now that simply read is the prohibition against making graven images and idolatrous statues, etc. But the Rav Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, the Kotzka Rebbe, reads it a little differently. He says, Lo lecha, Don't make yourself, Pesel, into a statue, not call an imitation of someone else. You are supposed to be you. And even within Judaism, there are many different expressions of the self as possible. I remember hearing someone's describe Kiddush. Kiddush, Friday night and Shabbat morning, we take a cup of wine. We celebrate Shabbat. We remember the Shabbat day, fulfill that commandment by saying these beautiful words and blessings over the cup of wine. Now, the rules of Kiddush are the same for everyone. The words are more or less the same, no matter who you are, what community. You're supposed to have a cup of wine, a full cup of wine. You're supposed to hold it in your right hand, ideally, etc. You know, very little variation in the rules. But one person could be making Kiddush. I was once at a Kiddush. The guy was a singer. It took him 20 minutes to say Kiddush. It was beautiful. He sung a Kalabach tune for Kiddush. 
there was not a drop of wine left in the cup afterwards because he was swaying around, etc. I had to refill it. It was an amazing kiddush, but very different. I was at a kiddush at a Kabbalist who also took 20 minutes for kiddush because he was focusing on the different meanings of God's name in mention in the kiddush and the different aspects of how it relates to the various spherot in the world. The guy was on a different planet. And I've also had kiddush where a person's pronunciation, they're, they're a grammarian, a linguist, and they're pronouncing it beautifully. All three are saying kiddush, but there's an individuality in that, which is very, very beautiful. And Rav Cook says that our job during this time, through the belief in self and the confidence of, because if I believe in myself, that means I'm believing that God created me. He didn't make mistakes. This is who I am with all my idiosyncrasies, which is really weird because I actually have no idiosyncrasies whatsoever. Uh, but with all of our idiosyncrasies and all of our weaknesses and all of our uh, strengths and, and our character flaws and our character advantages, etc., that's who God wants. He wants me. He wants me and he calls me to do my job in this world. And so the great comfort of these seven weeks for which we lead up to Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is A, that God believes in us, he trusts in us, and we should therefore believe in ourselves, trust in ourselves, and feel God's desire for us. And secondly, we should be authentic to ourselves, authentic to the true inner voice, the soul that cries out for a connection to God, connection to others, and ultimately for a connection to itself. The mitzvahs are actually expressions of our deepest inner self of the Jewish soul. And it's interesting, as Rav Cook points out, I mentioned the prayer we say when we wake up in the morning, I give thanks before you. Now, in Hebrew, mode is the first word, which means thanks. Ani, I, is the second word. Rav Cook says, isn't it not significant? The first word we say is thank you, which, of course, is the root of the word Yehudi, Jew, one who has gratitude, who, who, who appreciates existence, etc. I give thanks, and also it means to admit to God. But the second word we say in our day is ani, I. Because my thanks is different from your thanks. And my awareness is different from yours. And my feelings is different from yours. And everyone has this incredible, unique character about them. And the I of the Jewish people, my inner self, has so often been in exile. We have been either through force of arms or through psychological or economic pressure or social pressure, there are people who have been trying to lead us away from our true self, to lead us away. And we've, we've walked away from who we really are, deep down. And so what this period of time that we are starting today, tonight, these seven weeks of building, the seven, paralleling the seven days of creation, leading to the new world of Rosh Hashanah, those seven weeks... This time is a time of belief in myself, trust in my soul, appreciation of God's creation of myself, and ultimately being true to myself and authentic to my essential inner self. And not, I want to end with a quote by the great author Isaac Dinesen in her book, Out of Africa. Pride is faith in the idea that God had when he made us. A proud man is conscious of the idea and aspires to realize it. He does not strive towards a happiness, a comfort, which may be irrelevant to God's idea of him. His success is the idea of God successfully carried through, and he is in love with his destiny. People who have no pride are not aware of any idea that God had in making them. And sometimes they make you doubt that there hasn't been such an idea, or else who can find it? It's lost. They have to accept as success what others warrant to be so, and to take their happiness and even their own selves at the quotation of the day. They tremble with reason before their fate. So we say, do not take ourselves at the quotation and the flavor of the day. Our pride is in the idea that God had in creating us, that each of us has a unique role to fulfill in this world. And I cannot be someone else and I should not be someone else, but I have to be true 
to who I really am. So the exile of the self is reflected in the exile of the community, the exile of the Jewish people. And that exile will very speedily in our days will be redeemed from that. We have started to see the beginning of the redemption. We've seen the return of the Jewish people to Israel, to Zion. We have seen the return of Jewish sovereignty, self-determination, independence. We have seen the revival of the Hebrew language, the revival of the study of Torah, the study of our Jewish roots. What we have to do is take all that and absorb it within us and use all that to bring out the Jewish self and the essential self that is within us. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Rabbi Malul, for inviting me to speak. It's been Thank a privilege you, and an honor. Always great to work with you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Rabbi, for your beautiful words. Uh, what you just said, I'll just finish off just quoting you. It's true we are mourning, but we need to work in tr finding true value in ourselves because that was the reason of the destruction in the first place. Uh, kind of summarizes the message that you're giving. Um, we need to find value in ourselves. So thank you for those words. Such a powerful message. I wrote that quote down. I hope I quoted you right. Um, uh, but that's really what we need to do. And we really appreciate your words and your wisdom. And not just in front of this screen, but behind the screen. And simple to remember, you can get all of Rabbi Becher's classes in the past. A lot of them, not all. I don't think there's a library that's big enough to hold all of your classes. But um, you can definitely get all of a good bunch of your major classes. And I felt that it helped me in the work that I'm doing in training other Jews and helping other Jews come closer. So um, the, your, your teachings are beautiful and powerful. You don't even know the power that it goes and how far it goes because I've been learning a lot of your work as well. So I thank you, Rabbi, for your teachings you. and your time and your work. Uh, thank you for being here. We should see the rebuilding of ourselves today. Uh, we should be we, we are going to merit to see the rebuilding um because we are mourning it so we will merit to see the rebuilding at least spiritually within ourselves so thank you uh for being here rabbi thank you thank so you. much Amen. bye 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 um next up up is rabbi markman and he's going to be speaking about am i in exile really am i really in exile so we are just waiting for a few minutes as rabbi markman comes back in he had to leave the studio here we are and let's call him in thank you very much rabbi markman for being here uh, let's add you on thank you thank you rabbi for being here he is the founder Hi. of uh, uh, la one of the biggest la branches in the world outside of jerusalem and um, it really is a very powerful and busy branch that we are. Um, is my mic on? Uh, is the man behind it. And not just us, yeah. but we also know about all the impact you've had on HLA. I can't hear you. Can you hear world. me? I can't hear you. You can't hear me now? Uh, can't hear me? Hello? Okay. Yep, I'm here. It was all working before. It's okay. Um, in the meantime, I'll speak about you. So, uh, um, Rabbi Markman you can is. Hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. It was. We can hear you very well. Is the founder of Aish. Um, okay. And... One second. Can you hear me? It looks like it's kind of hard for him to get on. Um, maybe I'll give him a call. What one happened? Second. I, I could hear him. I can't. You Jack, can hear I me can't now? Hear you. I don't know. Everything went. Should I come back in? Should I redo yeah, it? Come back, in. come back in. Log out and come back in. I, but I'd love to hear Jack. Hello. Okay. I'm going to go. All right. Uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, uh, well, if that was an introduction, that certainly was my most recent. Um, I'd like to thank, my name is uh, uh, Ari Markman. Um, 
I'll just give my title. I'm the executive director of HLA. I haven't shaved for three weeks because we're in the three weeks. And I want to speak to you today about the three weeks and what it means, what it means to be in exile. Do you feel like you're in exile? That's the question. And uh, I like to think the Maloos are putting on this. And the, no one's ever done this before for us like this. This is live stream. And I think it's really terrific. And I give a lot of accolades to uh, Jack and Shira for putting this on. Um, so just a quick history. This talk that I'm going to give uh, is inspired and comes off of the work of uh, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, who is just a complete giant, a complete giant in uh, he was the Rebbe of Rabbi Noach Weinberg. Rabbi Noach Weinberg started Aish HaTorah in Jerusalem. It was his fifth organization that he started, and this one took off. And his Rebbe was his brother, seven years older, Rev Yaakov. And um, my own story was when I was getting into it, like a lot of people, you know, you hear great ideas. I was in Jerusalem, and I met Aish HaTorah, and, and I, um, I, had a, I had a career in um traveling around the world as a tour manager. I went to a lot of great places and got paid money. It was really good. And I'll do that in my 20s. And I I came upon Asha Torah and I came upon Torah and I thought this is incredible. I didn't get I didn't get this in my reform background. So um, but I went to all the classes and I did all the stuff and I still couldn't get it into my heart and my head the way I really wanted to. And I was—I remember being at the, at the Western Wall, and I and I, I was kind of getting into prayer, and I said, you know, Hashem, God, you know, you got to give me a sign, you got to give me something. Uh, I had given myself four months off from my job to do self search, and I said, if I, you got to get me into this, and but I don't know what else I can do. I've been here four months; it's just not clicking. The next day, I'm coming into Asia Torah, uh, to learn. And I heard this voice. I didn't even hear the words. I heard this voice, and this voice was so clear. It was so different. It was so settling. I walked into the room, and there was Rev. Yaakov Weinberg. And I looked at him. I said, that's kingship. That's regal. That's royal. And for the next three weeks, I followed him around because he came in to visit. He, he was part of the yeshiva in uh, Baltimore, but he came to see his brother every three every year for three weeks around the three weeks that we're in now, and he would teach. And I, f I went to every class, and that's what got me in. I said, you know, what he says, it's the truth. You could, you could feel it. His logic is rational. It was incredible. So he wrote this talk, and this talk is about, you know, feeling the exile, that we're in exile. And we've been through a three-week period, and this three-week period is – it started three weeks ago on the 17th of Thomas, which, by the way, is Rev. Yaakov Weinberg's yard site, strangely enough. And um, and it and it culminates in today into Tishba of. Um, so the 17th of Thomas, it started this period, this three week period was when they had the sin of the golden calf. And that was that was 40 days after Mount Sinai which was 50 days after leaving Egypt. So you left Egypt 50 days later to Mount Sinai, 40 days later, you're already worshiping the golden calf. It was a sin of, uh, it was the mother of all sins. And even to, to this day, it, it had so much effect that we're still paying the negative dividends of that sin today. But the Jews were forgiven. The Jews were forgiven enough to, God wasn't going to destroy the Jews for the sin of the golden calf. And but and they sat in the desert for a year and they learned Torah, and then it was time to go and they sent spies ahead, and they sent spies ahead and they really shouldn't have, but the Jews wanted it. God didn't think it wasn't really necessary, and the Jews came back with a bad report about the land of Israel, and when they did, everybody it was twelve men, ten men came back and said it's too dangerous for us to go in, and everybody else believed it, and Moses is pulling his hair out going. If God told you to go in the land of Israel, you go into the land of Israel. The things with the spies, this is just, I accommodated your request, but don't take it so seriously. Too bad the Jews did, and they, they sat in their tents, and they cried that night, and that night God said, well, there's really nothing to cry about going to the land of Israel, but I'll give you something to cry about. It's going to be called Tishba'ub, because that was the ninth of Av. 
And ever since, we've been crying on this day. So we can conflagated, that's the word, uh, the 17th of Thomas and Tishba, even though they're a year apart biblically in the Torah, into the three weeks. 17th of Thomas, 13 days, 9th of Av, 9 days, you know, 21 days. Okay, my math is off by one day. So um, this period is the most important period of the year. I can't believe I said that, but Rev. Yaakov said it. This is what keeps us Jewish. This is what keeps the Jewish people together. But not everybody knows about this. It's kind of obscure. True. It is. But the core of the Jews, it, it keeps strong and that radiates out. And I want to say that <clears throat> I believe more people know about Tishba of in the Jewish world um, and the three weeks than ever before because we are on the web. And um, it's just it's just so out there. So why? Why is this more important than why does this keep us more <clears throat> Jewish than Passover, High Holidays, Sukkot, Hanukkah? Why? So let's 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 study it. Because this this helps us understand who we are and how we're supposed to live, live. We're mourning over the temple. The, the temple was destroyed almost 2000 years ago. You know, we feel the pain still. Look, you lose something the first year, it's difficult. Ten years later, the pain dissipates. A thousand years later, you wouldn't feel it. But we feel it or try to feel it like it was yesterday or rather today. We're still mourning. And if we're not mourning, then we're disconnected. That's a disconnect. And so what we're doing is feeling the suffering, whether we know it. See, you could be suffering and you don't even know it, right? Like, have you ever broken a body, bro broken an arm? I broke my foot, you know, a couple of times. Um, and I didn't know I broke it. It, it hurt a lot. I didn't realize I broke it. I was, you know, kind of suffering, but I didn't realize the magnitude that I broke. By the time I finally figured out something's really wrong with my foot, I brought it to the doctor. He goes, it's too late. Um, you, no cast for you. You'll, we'll just put a form in your shoe and you'll kind of heal that way. So you could be suffering and not even know it because you just adjust. And we've adjusted to our lives being shattered. Now, remember. When the Jews had the temple and we were fully functioning, we, okay, we had prophets. Notice it looks like they have a prophet. A prophet is, I got to make a big decision in life. Well, you can go to a prophet. They weren't, you know, there. you read about the 55 prophets in the book of Tanakh, in, in, in the Torah, the 24 books of the Torah. That's 55 of them. There are 2 million prophets. We don't have them anymore. There are prophets everywhere. They were schooled. It was a whole discipline. We don't have it right now. And they can help you with your problems. Now we have rabbis, rabbitsons, and, and wise people. But you had prophets. They had very good advice. We had a, we had a court system that was completely uh, seamless throughout the Jewish people, culminating in the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. We don't have that. We had the temple. We had a king. We had the temple. The temple was a place you walked into. It was the, it's a Lahab deal. It was, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to joke, but it was like the Disneyland of spirituality. You walked in there, you smelled the incense that smelled heavenly. The music that the Levian played was incredible. You did an animal sacrifice, heaven forbid. Yes, we did. It took you into a spiritual high. You felt God and you knew God existed and no one denied the existence of God. We don't have that. We're wondering, does God exist? Even the best of us at times. Our lives have been shattered. Let me give you an analogy. People go to the Western Wall and they say, you know, well, I made it to the hotel, the wall, the Western Wall. And this is where I dive in. And people dive in there. It's very holy. You know what the Western Wall is? The Western Wall is the outer wall that held up the temple mount that the temple was on. It's no part of the temple at all. It's the 
wall that encompasses the mount that the temple was on. I'll give you an analogy. It was like going to, you know, there's a thing called Yankee Stadium. Well, there's a new Yankee Stadium. It ain't the old Yankee Stadium. It's not the house that Ruth built. The old Yankee Stadium was demolished. You, you knew Yankee Stadium. But one of my great uh, regrets is I, I could have gone to one game at Yankee Stadium the last year. It was just such a hassle to get there. I'm not from New York, whatever. I could have made it. I never saw it. It's like going to the old, to, to the new Yankee Stadium, and there's a, they have a wall there. You're like, wow, what's that? Oh, that's the old Yankee Stadium. Really? Yeah, what is it? Well, it's not really the wall of the Yankee Stadium. The Yankee Stadium was on a hill, and this is the wall that surrounded the hill. That's the wall. Wow, that's all that's left of Yankee Stadium? Yeah. It's not Yankee Stadium. You're not inside a Yankee Stadium. You're not seeing Babe Ruth or Joe DiMaggio, Luke Gehrig, or Mickey Mantle. But that's all we got. Well, if that's all we got, then I'll use it. You know, that's that's pretty holy. Let me I'll take a picture by it. Everybody will take pictures by, you know, the old wall of Yankee Stadium. It's not even Yankee Stadium. It's just a retaining wall. And that's what we have today. We can't go up on the temple, on the Temple Mount. We don't have it. We are in exile. We can go to Jerusalem. You can go to Israel. You can go to Jerusalem. It's built up. But if you don't have a temple, you're still in exile. Let's talk about exile a little bit. The world knew the meaning of God. The world doesn't know the meaning of God anymore. As long as you had a temple, there was a feeling of God in this world. Even non-Jews could go to the temple. The temple was for everybody. Okay? And we lost the temple. We lost holiness. We lost God awareness. We lost our relationship to God. We lost our relationship to one another. We lost a relationship to ourselves. The horrors of the world could be um, permeated, on the, put on the Jewish people because, and the world. You could have Pol Pot. You could have Stalinism where they killed millions of Russians. You can have you know, Mao and, and, and his slaughter. You could have Hitler, his slaughter. You, you could have you know, the Crusades and, and the Cossacks and the, the Inquisition. They destroyed two temples. It all happened on Tishba of two temples. And once you destroy the temple, there's a disconnect with God. There's a disconnect with each other. There's a disconnect with the Jewish people. So now we have shuls and we have schools. And we have rabbis. But, you know, that's like plan B. Plan A is a lot better. And once you don't have and you and, and you saw from the. Uh, the, the marches the the marches and the riots and the demonstrations that are going on it's it's not godliness that they're protesting they're not they're what it is is a lack of God you see these people don't have gratitude see when you have God you have gratitude when you have the temple you have gratitude and you have a feeling if there's a God and he made me, then he made me for a purpose, and I have self-destiny, and let me go and do something about that. I will do something about that because there's free will. There's God has given me free will. There's purpose. There's meaning to life. There's a purpose to history. Jews are the news, right? But if you don't have God, if you don't have that feeling, if you're in exile, then what do you have? You have Disney values. You have whatever news station and live feed and Twitter account you're following, that is your world. You could be in outer space. Your values could be literally in outer space. That is exile. And you know, you can get comfortable anywhere. There's no situation that a human being can't get used to. A human being next to the cockroach is probably the most adaptable thing on this planet. We can accept the pogroms of Russia. Okay, they come now and then. In Inquisition of Spain, okay, we'll go somewhere else, or we'll convert, or we'll hide, as Moranos did. You could live five years in death camps. People did. People survived. The barber of Auschwitz cut the hair of the commandant for five years. Okay? There were people who, that was their existence. They survived. You can, anything could be normal. And the life that we lead now, we think, is normal. 
and I'll retire in Hawaii or Jackson Hole or whatever. Hey, what? That's that's not what life is about. Life is about God awareness. Accomplishing your relation, making an accomplishment is having a relationship with God. And when you're and the highest title in the Torah is Evid Hashem, servant of God, or how about this one, slave of God. We'll use the word servant. It sounds nicer. But he's your master. That's the highest title. That was Moses. That was King David. They were servants of God. That's human achievement. Not being president, not being, you know, executive director. Doesn't matter. No titles. Doesn't matter. It's your relationship with God. So yes, we do feel the we do feel the exile. And th today is that day of awareness. And we feel the world is unstable. You see, if the Jews are unstable, if the Jews don't have the temple, which we need, which we need to call less around, and gives and 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 then right, we have the Torah. Thank God we have the Torah to go around, but we need it, the physical manifestation of service would be the temple. And since we don't have that, and we don't have the land of Israel as it should be completely, as you see, the world would like, would like to take it away from us. We have to ask permission from the world. Um, can we please have the land of Israel? And can we please defend ourselves? That's exile. No. The UN. Please, UN, accept us. Huh? So if we don't, if the Jews are unstable, the world's unstable. Remember, the Jews and the news. All the news is about us and good or bad, but the news is always ends up to be to being about the Jews. And it's because the news is waking us up. We are more woken up right now in the year 2020 than I think we've been in the last 70 years since the Holocaust. And I know that because I see all the people on the feeds. I watch the internet and all the programs being launched. I see people coming out of the woodwork to look, uh, follow Jewish um, events. The Jews are waking up. The Jews know that there's a lot on the line. The Jews are, be are getting it together. This COVID-19 business was a gigantic wake-up call. And it's taken us where we've never been and we're reaching Jews where we've never reached before. By the way, talking about exile, you know what the, you know what the year 2020 means? Everybody says, Happy New Year, it's year 2020. What does that mean? Well, the Jews after the golden calf were given the job of building the tabernacle in the desert, known in Hebrew as the Mishkan. We had that in the desert for 40 years. We then took it with us along our travels. Uh, we took it into Israel as we conquered the land and it was with us until we built the first temple. And everything that went on the tabernacle was then transferred over to the temple. Animal sacrifices, other kind of sacrifices, always keeping the presence of God within the Jewish people so we would not be in exile. Then we got kicked out of the first temple. It took 70 years until we could be back in the land building the second temple. 70 years. So 70 years we went without a temple after the first temple. That's when Purim happened, by the way. Then we went back into the, into the land of Israel with Ezra. We built the second temple and we had that. But then we got kicked out. We lost the temple in the year 70, near 70 of the common era. So we've been without a temple for 70 years between the first and the second. And we've been without the temple from the year 70 of the common era until today. So if you add them together, it's 2020. So every time we say Happy New Year, it just helps us count how many years it's been that the Jews haven't had a temple, how many years the Jews have been in exile. When you write a check, if you still do that, or whenever you type in the date, um, that year, 2020, reminds us how long we've been in exile. You see how deep this goes? That with, without Tishba of, Without the three weeks, without we could also fast in Yud Zion, the seventeenth of Thomas, and we and we spend these three weeks getting ready for today, Tishba of. Without this, we can't be Jews. We don't know what it means to be Jews because we don't know what situation we're really in. I'm talking straight. This is you know tough love. 
Um, but this is all from Rev Yaakov. I'm only saying what Rev Yaakov said. This isn't, I wish I was original. Um, and this is, he says, Rev Yaakov says what our whole existence rests on. It's the awareness that this season that we're in, that we really can't live without a temple. We really can't be Jews fully without a temple. We're doing the best we can. We put on the fillin. We, you know, eat matzah. We build a sukkah. I don't even know what we're going to do for high holidays this year. That's going to be strange. But we're we're trying. We we have things. We have points. But we don't have, we don't have Jerusalem. We don't have the temple. We don't have the experience. We really are not feeling God. Why do you want the Messiah? You want the Messiah because he's going to solve all your problems? No, you want the Messiah because that is going to help you. He's going to bring in that era when we can rebuild the temple. And you're going to feel God. If I could take you to a park where you would feel God, I'll stick it in uh, St. Louis, in the middle of the country. I'll... I'll um, have more people come in there than um, Grand Canyon, Disneyland, uh, Universal Studios, and uh, you know Times Square combined. The whole world's going to come there to feel God. Well, that's what Jerusalem was, was like. Everybody came to Jerusalem to feel God. So why did they destroy it? Okay, there's been other people who talk about that. That's not my subject. Why? <laughs> but the Jews became disconnected from God, and eventually it led to the temple being destroyed. So we're trying to get that connection back to God and connection to each other. And this is what we got to have all the Jews realizing. And we exist because we know we're in exile, right? It's no, it's no coincidence that three years after the Holocaust, we got the land of Israel. We paid a price. We paid the ultimate price of being in exile, finally, we were able to maybe begin to lessen the exile and come back. But we're getting lost here in the United States. We're getting lost here in LA. We're getting lost in the exile again. No, our vector has to point towards Jerusalem. That's where our vector is, not to some intermountain gated community I could run to and hide from the world from. No, that's not what Jews do. That's not what we do. We have to get out of exile. And we have to recognize the full significance of this period that we're going in, that we're in, and realize how deep it is. And the more we get into it and realize it and think about it and get it into our bones that where we are and what we don't have, the more vitality we're going to be give, we'll be able to give to the Jewish people. And that is the purpose of today. And since I can't ask anybody if you have any questions, I just will say that it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And Jack, I hope I could hear you, but my time is up. And we're, we're, next year there will be a Tishba of, but hopefully we will not be fasting and we'll be in Jerusalem back to the temple and united as, as the Jewish people again. Thank you so much, Rabbi Markman. Shabbat Shalom uh, for your amazing words. The uh, founder and the, the, the CEO of HLA right now. And we're very, very thankful that he was here speaking. And we're now going to call up David Sachs, uh, who is very well known in our community and very much appreciated in our community. Always has so much wisdom to share. Our students really love his words every time when he speaks. So we're really thankful that he's here with us. Uh, thank you, David, for being here. I'm just going to add you. And uh, you are live, David. So thank you very much for being here with us. I okay. really appreciate you coming and giving us some inspiration. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. Uh, I have a, a, a question. I, it's, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, which uh, touches at the heart of... Tish above and, and just about making change in ourselves and, and changing the world. Uh, by the way, if, if I were to ask you um, what your favorite bumper sticker is, I, 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 I'd actually really like to know, is, is the truth. Um, but um, I can't ask you, unfortunately. But I'll, I'll tell you my favorite bumper sticker. Um, I, there's so much wisdom in this. Uh, that's uh, 
Think globally, act locally. Uh, I'll say that again. Think globally, act locally. And really, all the words that I'm about to share with you really focus in on that. Um, and, and, and let's just dive into it. And let me get to that question that I wanted to point out to begin with. Um, you know, when, when God says in the, beginning, in the beginning of the Torah, let there be light, a lot of people think that that, that that was the creation of the sun. And it's, it's a big misconception. Actually, it, it has nothing to do with the sun. There was this awesome, awesome, awesome light at the beginning of creation. And it says that God saw how fantastic this light was. What a, what a delight it would be for everyone just to bathe in it and experience it. Um, but God saw that our, that there were going to be wicked people. So, so it would be unjust, essentially, to, to allow them to, to take part in this um, until the world itself just becomes completely perfected. So God hid away that light. And so it's called the Or Haganus, this initial light, which means the, the hidden light. And we're told by our rabbis that this light burned for 36 hours. And again, it was the most awesome, awesome, fantastic light. So what's the question? What's the problem? Well, the interesting thing is, is that the word Eicha, this book of Lamentations that we're reading today, this book which chronicles destruction and is basically this iconic word which summons all the suffering of history, Eicha. Eicha is the gematria, the numerical equivalent of 36. So if you think about that, that's, that's a little bit strange, isn't it? I mean, here I just told you about this awesome light that burned at the beginning of creation that God had to hide away because it was too good for the world still. But God's going to bring it back at the end of days with the perfection of the world. And this is the same number as Echa, which stands for destruction. So we're going to resolve this question because the answer to this is actually going to touch on one of the secrets to happiness, believe it or not, believe it or not. And, and the answer is like this. You see, there's, there's so much, we're living in a world uh, like the, the different sort of pundits refer to our, 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 our present time as, as the time of big data, right? Which means that there's this information explosion going on. You, you all know it for yourselves. I don't have to explain it. Um, anyone who starts learning Torah, and I know I experienced this in my own life, there's so much information. Like, how do you organize it all? How do you prioritize it all? So, so I've been learning for years and years and years and years and years and years, and I've come to this realization that there's one piece of information that, that can be used as an organizational kind of point that Everything else can go underneath it, and that it's life-changing. And that piece of information is that God is good. And what I've been fascinated by and sort of like alarmed by, because I think it's a little bit tragic, is that there are many, many people out there, very good-hearted, like very well-intended, and they believe in God. And they even believe that God created the world. They even believe that God gave us the Torah. But they don't believe that God is good. Or they don't know that God is good. They don't even know that that's essentially an essential Jewish principle, that God is good. And as such, a very alarming, very disturbing thing comes from that which means that there are a lot of people out there who believe in an all-powerful God who is essentially a dictator. You see, if you don't believe in the goodness of God, if you don't know that that's one of the prerequisites of a Jewish belief in God, that, that, that God is good, then you could believe all sorts of crazy, incorrect things about God. 
Now, let me tell you how that connects to this idea of the initial light, this awesome, fantastic light, which burned for 36 hours. And the idea that Eicha, this hallmark of destruction, is also the number 36. What's the correlation? And what does it have to do with the goodness of God? Well, the answer is that everything that comes down in our lives, everything that comes down in the world is good. But this world comes down, this good comes down in two forms. There's the good that you and I call good. This is the readily, readily understandable good. This is the, hey, I just had the best time. I just had the best meal. I just made the best friend. I just got the best job. That's, that's what we tend to call good, right? But believe it or not, there's a higher good that if we don't have vessels to receive it, manifests itself as destruction in this world. I'll say that again because this, is, this will solve a lot of mysteries, a lot of mysteries of life. There's the only good that comes down. There's the good that we readily appreciate and understand. And there's this, there's this higher good, which is so good that if we don't have vessels to contain it, vessels to hold it, it manifests itself as destruction in this world. That's the light that's coming down right now. Did you ever like wonder how could it be that the inner aspect of Tisha B'Av is that Mashiach is born on this day and yet all this disaster happens on this day? How can those two things happen at the same time? Well, I've just solved that problem because the essence of this day is this enormous messianic good. But we've demonstrated throughout history and we don't have vessels for it. And so it just comes down as destruction. So the question is then, well, how do we make vessels for it? How do we make vessels for this tremendous light? So let me tell you something. It's kind of an esoteric question, but, but it's kind of a cool question too. The rabbis asked this question, you ready? The Torah was created before God even created the world. It existed before the, even the world was created. And the Torah is actually bigger than the entire world. So here's the question, you ready? How can God fit something that's bigger than the world into the world? I mean, if you want a visual, how can you take an elephant and fit it into a Dixie cup? It's impossible, right? Well, the rabbis give different answers. But I want to give what I think is a very intriguing answer and will kind of lead us to some practical steps of how we can make changes in our own life. You see, there's a big clue how God fits something bigger than the entire world into the world, namely the Torah, right? If you look, it says before the Torah was given that all of the Jewish people encamped at Mount Sinai like one person with one heart. You look at the Rashi there. That's what it says. We were like one person with one heart. In other words, there was this phenomenal, epic unity among the Jewish people. And when there was such a unity, our hearts enlarged to hold this light that was even bigger than the world itself. That's how we were able to make a vessel for something that was even bigger than the world. By joining all of our hearts together. Now imagine. Imagine someone comes to your house and they've got like a $500 bottle of wine. And they say, hey, listen, you know something? 
I can't imagine someone who I'd rather drink it with than you. Here it is. Here it is. What? Grab a cup. Let's drink some wine. Come on. And you're like, wow, I can't put $500. You want to drink it with me? <laughs> yeah. All right. You grab a cup. Person opens the wine, pours and pours and pours and pours and pours. You know, there's something strange is going on, right? Keep, keep some pouring. And then you look. And all of the wine is spilling to the floor because there's a big hole on the bottom of the cup. It's all going to waste. You see, we've got these vessels, but we've got these holes in our vessels. Our vessels either aren't large enough to hold this tremendous light and so it manifests itself as destruction in this world or our vessels are damaged. Now the sages tell us in a very straightforward way they solve this mystery. They tell us very clearly what is wrong with our vessels. And it's a theme you've been hearing about all day but maybe you didn't think about it in exactly the way we're talking about it right now. They say we're hating each other for no reason. You see, when you hate another person for no reason, it destroys your vessels. God wants to bring this light. He's only good. He's only bringing good. But this highest good can't come down. Let me give you a, a, a picture of this so that you can understand it maybe even more clearly. You know, I'm, I'm just telling you something about the way the, the sages structured the year, okay? The rhythm of the year, if you will, or the blueprint of the year. Leading up to today, the last three Shabbases, we've read these three Haftorahs from the, from the prophets warning us about the very, very hard times that are going to come if we don't fix, if we don't fix our mitos, if we don't get our acts together, so to speak. After these three weeks of like serious warning from the prophets, comes seven weeks of consolation. That's very interesting. Three followed by seven. That's a, that adds up to ten. Three negative followed by seven positive. Okay. What am I getting at here? So many of you may be familiar with the ten sphere of these are the divine energies that God combined to create the physical universe. And if you were to take an X-ray, a spiritual X-ray of the universe, you'd see these 10 energies. And believe it or not, just like the Haftarahs, they're divided up into the upper three and the lower seven. And these upper three spheros, are the highest, highest energies, only good, beyond good, divine, divine, divine. And these three weeks leading up to the destruction correlate with these three highest energies. Now do you see what I'm talking about? That the light that's coming down right now is coming from the highest place? Now do you see how it all culminates in today, which is, on the one hand, the day Mashiach, is born, and on the other hand, the day of the greatest destruction. Why? Because our vessels are broken, because we're hating each other for no reason. So let me give you a couple of what I think practical suggestions. Work that we can do on ourselves in order to create better vessels to hold this great land. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my life over the years, and um, it's kind of this tragic crossing of wires, I think it happens on a pretty, pretty wide scale. So let, let, let me just share with you. Someone gets into a fight with someone else, and from their family, from their good friends, they demand loyalty. 
I hate this person. And if you want to be my friend, you have to hate them too. It's tragic because the other people, they have nothing against that person. And so, so a very weird situation is created and people react different ways to it. Some people jump into it enthusiastically. What? They did that to you? I, I hate that person, right? But did they do anything to you? No, they didn't do anything to me. But they're, they're perfectly good to join this, this hate party. Other people feel conflicted, but they don't want to lose their good friend. And they don't want to seem disloyal to their good friend. And they want to feel like, hey, I'm a loyal guy. Well, if I'm a loyal guy, how do I be loyal in this instance? I must hate this other person, this third party for no reason. So again, very, very tragic. But let me put it on the other foot right now, okay? How about the person who's demanding hatred of the other people? W which party do you fall into? Because I think everyone's experienced this. If you're that first party that I talked about to begin with, sort of like the, the, the person caught in the crossfire, Maybe you can say, hey, that person never did anything to me. But I think ground zero, so to speak, is the person who's demanding that loyalty from their friends and family to hate that other party. Maybe you can stop. Maybe you can stop. Maybe you can stop demanding that from other people. Because between you and me, if, if, if you're one of these people that I'm talking to right now, it's a drag. It's a drag. And you say, but that other person really did hurt me and I need my friends? Absolutely. Have your friends. Have your friends. But don't demand that of them. And then you say to me, but then I feel alone and then I feel stupid, right? Well. Maybe that will cause you to try to reach some sort of reconciliation. And you say to me, but I can never forgive them. Well, I don't know the story. And I appreciate the pain. But maybe there can be pain without hate. I heard, I heard Rabbi Green say one time words that I, I love, I love. And he said, you know, you have to love every Jew, but some you can love from afar. And I think that's just such brilliant advice, you know? Okay. Let's, let's try something else. Another, another, we're trying to get into the, like the, the muck right now, all the emotionality and, Believe me, I know this isn't simple stuff, but I think this is the stuff we really have to slog through if we're going to make a change in this world. Because like I started off with that bumper sticker, think globally, act locally. It all starts with us. It all starts with us. All these changes get made when we make them ourselves. That's how the world changes in a real way. So. This next category, I'll just give you an example, kind of a crazy example, but it popped into my head the other day, so I'll share it with you. Imagine you're a great baseball player. Ah, I'm the greatest baseball player. I'm amazing. And then you see some people playing football, and you laugh at them. <laughs> Look at them. They don't know how to play baseball. Like, they don't even know what ball to use. They're using, like, this big oval-shaped ball. Now, it's, I know it's a ridiculous example. What's ridiculous about it? What's ridiculous is that they're playing football and this person just is so inside their own head, can only think baseball. So when they see other people playing football, they think they're playing baseball incorrectly. Okay, so the person's a fool. 
right? The person's a giant fool. So what does that have to do with us? A lot, actually. Because all of us have our own tikkun to make. All of us have our own soul-fixing to make. And what you're doing is not what the other person is doing. Every single person is playing their own game, so to speak. And what happens all the time is that we're judging other people right and left from our perspective. We're looking at this person playing basketball and that person playing volleyball, and we don't understand that they're on a completely different mission with their own program, working their own program, and all we can see it is through our own eyes. And so we judge them, and we start hating each other. And sometimes we're jealous of them because they seem to be doing so much better than us. But if we can only understand that there really is a competition going on in this world, but it's not between each other, that's what everyone gets confused by. Everyone thinks that the competition that's going on is between me and you. It's not. It's between me and my own potential. It's between you and your own potential. So when it comes to all the rest of our interrelationships, let's just be supportive. Let's just love each other, right? There's so much, there's so much, there's so much going on. And it's such a big topic. But the world is going to get to that place. That's, that's, that's the good news. The world is going to get to that place. You know, I, I, often, I often think, you see, what's, we're all on this journey together, you know? And um, you see it right with the first word of the Torah. The Torah begins with the word breishis, commonly translated as in the beginning, maybe with beginnings or out of beginnings, out of the fabric of beginnings God created the world. These are all better translations. But nonetheless, I heard from Rabbi Tath something awesome, which is that the very first word is telling you just, just everything about your life, everything about this journey. Because the word beginning implies middle and end. In other words, you see, everyone has the same question, which is, if there's a God and he's good, like we're saying he is, why is the world so messed up? This is everybody's question, whether they can articulate it or not. And the answer is, because the world isn't finished yet. We're just at the beginning. Imagine you walk into the kitchen, right? And uh, someone's making brownies. And there's like a pile of mix and there's a raw egg on top. And you dip your fingers into the raw egg and you, and you taste the mix and the, and the raw egg together. And you say, these brownies are terrible. And the person says, they're not finished yet. So many people, they're, they're, they're born into this world. They look around and they say, this world is terrible. And God is like, it's not finished yet. And that's why I made you to be partners with me to finish the world. That's what it means in the beginning. This is just the beginning. But before the beginning, God didn't create this world without envisioning the end before he even began. And the example that I always like to think about is, imagine an architect. When an architect envisions a structure, he doesn't think, okay, here's some wood and here's a hammer and here's some nails. An architect envisions the finished product and then sets about getting there. And that's how God did it. Before God created the world, he envisioned a perfect world, a world without hatred, a world without anger, 
a world without starvation. And then he created us, you and me. And that's what we're doing right now. We're dreaming God's dreams. We're praying God's prayers. And we're building this awesome, divine, perfect world together. And the way that we're going to get there, and we are going to get there because, because that's God's idea that we're going to get there. So it's going to happen. The way we're going to get there is just how we deal with each other, just making peace with each other. Now I know in the few minutes left, I'm just going to give you my personal answer for the question that everyone's been asking these last four or five months, which is what's going on with this whole coronavirus? What's going on with all this isolation, this quarantine? I'm staying indoors, you know? What's, what's it all about? And I know people will have different ideas about this, but I just, I just want to share with you my idea. And we'll just tie together everything that we've been saying up until now. The thing that we have to get right, or I think where God really wants us to focus, is in our closest relationships. With our own family, with our own closest friends, with the few people that we're dealing with again and again right now on the closest basis. We've got to get these relationships right. Because this is the foundation of our lives. And if all of us together get these foundational relationships correct together, that is going to change the world. And so let's not leave Tisha above empty-handed. Let's rededicate ourselves. I began by talking about this crazy correlation between the 36 hours that this great awesome light burned at the beginning of the creation of the world and Eicha, which is the number 36, which stands for destruction. We talk about making vessels and we're going to make vessels. We're going to rebuild our relationships and we're going to make a vessel that's going to hold this great light. And you want to hear on Hanukkah, do you know if you, we light one candle the first night, two the second night, three the third night? By the eighth night, do you know how many candles we light? 36. And do you know what Hanukkah is all about? Rebuilding the base of Mikdash. So when we rebuild these relationships ourselves, we're going to get that base of Mikdash. It's going to be the third base of Mikdash, which is going to coalesce with the perfection of the world. Thank you so much for allowing me to share these words and uh, good times ahead, everyone. Thank you so much for your beautiful speech and talk. There was a quote that I just wrote down from what you were saying. It was so real. If there's a competition in this world, it's not between us and others, it's between us and our potential. And that is so true to our heart. We really appreciate your words. There were so many insights in this one talk. Uh, David, you really touched us. And hopefully we could take this to heart. I'm talking to myself and learn to be honest and true within myself. Be loving with deep within myself. Be loving for others deep in my own closed doors, not only in public. And that's really the message that you are portraying. So we're so thankful that you're here and you're with us. Thank you for, for your words. We should see. Our days should be renewed as they were once with so much light where we were, were that vessel that we're longing to be so we can accept and bring in that light into ourselves. So thank you for your amazing words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a uh, vid we have at 4.30 coming in is our very own uh 
good friend of mine, uh, 4.30, Jason Tavakoli. So he's going to be coming on at 4.30. Right now it's 4 o'clock. And for this next half hour, we have a series of inspirational videos that we will be showing you um, to keep you inspired. A lot of these were taken from Aish, some from friends of mine. Um, but some of the inspiring videos that can keep you, again, inspired uh, during this time because it's a day of hope and inspiration. It's not only a day of remembering the past, but it's also a day of reigniting ourselves and saying, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? And then inspiring ourselves, a deep sense of need for inspiration and connection and spirituality and meaning and purpose in my life. And this is the moment and the day for it. So we are going to have a series of short clips uh, showing for the next half an hour. Please sit back and relax and enjoy. How much worrying do you do? If you're like me, you worry about a lot of things. Why do we do this? We all know that worry is not productive. Healthy concern can get us moving, motivate us to act. But worry, it can really take us right down. Many of the things that we worry about, we have no control over. Our kids' decisions, other people, the COVID virus, what Iran will do next. Instead of brooding over things or making yourself a nervous wreck, try turning your worry into a prayer. As soon as you start going down that worry road, pivot. Direct your worry to the one who can do anything, solve anything, and certainly doesn't want you to be a nervous wreck. If you are worried about how you're going to recover financially from the last few months, turn it into a prayer. God, please help us recover our losses. Please show us the way out of this. Please help us be positive and resilient. If you're worried about your mother who's in, been isolated in an assisted living and hasn't had visitors in months, turn it into a prayer. Please, God, take care of my mom. Please help her to be surrounded by caretakers who are kind to her and giving her a little extra TLC. Please, may she not become depressed by the lack of family visits. Are you worried about what's happening in our country? Who's not? Of course, we should all be activists for what we believe in, but turning it into a prayer is also a positive way to affect the change we want to see. God, please help our country unite in a good way. Please help us to have the wisdom and the compassion to er eradicate bigotry, racism, inequality, anti-Semitism peacefully. Please help us learn how to love and respect one another and create a good future for our children. What are you worrying about right now? How can you turn it into a prayer? And while you're worrying, remember to ask God to help you not to worry so much. Hi everybody, my name is Rabbi Livingston and I wanted to give a shout out to the CJE here in Baltimore. My wife and I uh, just moved to Baltimore about two years ago and I work with my friend Gabriel Haran, Rabbi Gabriel Haran, at an organization called RAGE Maryland. RAGE stands for the Russian American Jewish Experience and we work with young Russian Jews um, throughout the Baltimore and general Maryland area. Um, and we're very excited to be here and to partner with CJE on these um, video Devar Torahs and video Jewish uh, stuff going on and it's great to be part of it and looking forward to meeting uh, each one of you thank you so much hope you enjoy the video shalom shalom everybody i'm rabbi livingston you are that was a fly shalom shalom everybody i'm rabbi livingston you are awesome and this is jewish in tuish We're currently going through a period of time which is known as the three weeks which starts on the 17th of the month of tammuz and goes until the 9th of the month of av it's a period of national Jewish mourning that commemorates the, or remembers, the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temples. The most intense part of the mourning period and really is the culmination of the three weeks is the ninth of the month of Av, which is the actual day that the temples were destroyed. It is a very bad day. It's not just bad because the temples were destroyed, although that would probably be depressing enough. The ninth of the month of Av is basically the day when every bad thing that happens to the Jewish people, God forbid, happens on that day. Like every bad thing. 
Here's a small sampling of wonderful things that have happened on the 9th of the month of Av. The first temple was destroyed 587 BCE. The second temple was destroyed 70 AD. The killing of over half a million Jews at the city of Betar in 135 CE. The Jews are expelled from England 1290. The Jews are expelled from France 1306. The Jews are expelled from Spain 1492. World War I begins 1914. And the Holocaust begins in 1941, all on the 9th of the month of Av. It is a very bad day. It is horrible. It is, it is the no good, very bad, horrible. How does that go? Alexander and the terrible, bad, horrible. One second. Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I have ADD. It's a problem. I go on ADD tours all the time. However, there's something very interesting that the Talmud says about the ninth of Av. It says that on the ninth of the month of Av, the Messiah will be born. Mashiach himself will be born on the ninth of the month of Av. Now, of all the days of the year to be born, um, it seems a little bit strange that the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, would be born on the ninth of the month of Av, which is the day that all these horrible, painful tragedies happen. So what is that all about? The basic idea is that there are times of great darkness. That's true on a national level, and that's true on a personal level. But there's something very interesting about darkness. Darkness provides a great opportunity for light to be seen. Light makes its biggest impact on the darkest of places. Oftentimes in life, a dark time becomes the turning point for a brighter future. In fact, sometimes in life, it's only because of the darkness that we're able to see the light. Sometimes the light can't come through except through the darkness itself. When we see the darkness in the present, we have to also be focused on the future of the light that's going to come into the darkness. It may be dark now, but it won't always be. May this ninth of Av be one in which the darkness gives way to great light, and may we soon merit to see the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, soon in our days, amen. Thanks for watching, everybody. Peace. Hey guys, it's Rabbi Jack here with Parables of the Talmud and this time to share one of the greatest tools needed to maintaining a healthy mind and loving the people around us and that is giving benefit of the doubt. So I was coming home and I noticed a shirt that was hanging on the window. I was annoyed. Why do we need to display a shirt to the entire public? There's nowhere else to hang it. So I asked my daughters who put the shirt on the window. My oldest tells me, Daddy, I put it there because Mummy was sleeping and there was nowhere else within my reach to hang it. Slam! Here I am thinking I need to teach my kids about social conduct, only to learn myself that it was done with the sweetest intentions. We are taught, dan lekol adam which means judge everybody favorably. And the question everyone asks is, would it not be better to say don't judge at all? I think it's trying to teach us how to give benefit of the doubt. And that is to actively judge the things that people do as good. And by doing so, we train our minds to have a positive attitude towards the people around us. And you know what? It's true. Most people are out there to do good. Look, this doesn't mean I'm going to sacrifice my own safety trusting every person I meet with everything I own. I'm certainly not going to give benefit of the doubt to those that are obviously evil. But we need to know that an integral part of living a healthy lifestyle is learning to love the people around us. And it starts by judging them favorably. You know, with COVID-19, we are living in a time of absolute confusion. Some are wearing masks, some are not. Some are shopping with kids, some are traveling, some are concerned, some are not. Whatever it is, let's use the time to practice giving benefit of the doubt so that we can strengthen our love for people muscle by actively judging them positively. Thank you for listening. If you're watching this right now, you might be thinking, Rabbi, you really need to shave. And you're right, I do. But I'm not, and here's why. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Inspiring Hope. This is your weekly boost of uplifting Jewish inspiration. I'm Rabbi Tzvi Sittner, and on behalf of H.com and The Village Shul, I want to thank you all for listening. I also want to thank this week's sponsors. Today's sponsored by Gary Morris and Vivian Metz, in honor of the yard side of Vivian's father, George Metz, all of a shalom. May his neshama have an aliyah. So, yes, I do need to shave. But this time of year is a time where we don't shave because we're mourning the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, the temple. 
But people do ask me, they say, Rabbi, why are you still mourning a temple that was destroyed 2,000 years ago? Like, it's time to move on already. And I tell them that we're taught that in every generation where the temple's not rebuilt, it's as if it was just destroyed in that generation because we haven't yet fixed the problem. You know, we know that the Almighty let the second temple be destroyed because there was baseless hatred. But why would the Almighty do that just because we didn't get along? I mean, imagine bulldozing your own house just because your kids are fighting. It doesn't make sense. I never really understood this until something happened that gave me some clarity. There was a couple that I was close with who was building their dream home. And as anyone who is building a house can tell you, things can get pretty stressful. And as their home was being built, the stress and the tension and the fighting just kept on increasing. And when their dream home was finally built, they were unfortunately filing for divorce. The home was ready, but there was no more large unified family and they didn't need the house anymore. Perhaps this is the idea of the Beis HaMikdash, our house being destroyed. The Almighty is saying, if you're not one big family, then you don't need the big house anymore. But maybe, just maybe, if we can put our differences aside and unite, then we can see it being rebuilt. You know, at the beginning of COVID-19, everybody kept saying this line, we're all in this together. But the truth is, we're not. There's been so much more divisiveness and fighting within families and communities. You know, regarding COVID, people are arguing, should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? You're being too lax. You're being too anxious. And it even extends to all kinds of areas. People are polarized about politics and racial issues. Yes, we may all be in this together, but we're definitely not all together in this. The fighting, the anger, the animosity, it's palpable. So yeah, it's been 2,000 years and we still haven't fixed the problem of baseless hatred. But the good news is that we can. If we realize that we don't need to agree with each other to love each other. If we can internalize the idea that I can 100% disagree with you, but I can still love and care about you. So how do we do this? By realizing that we are family. You may disagree with the opinion or choices of your spouse, your siblings, or even your children, but you could still love them because they're your family. We don't have to be distant just because we're different. You know, there was a Hasidic man who once told me that all of his kids were strong Jewish Hasidic boys, except for one. There was one who completely cast off his Judaism and moved out of the house. And I asked him, I said, so how'd you respond? And he said to me, every Shabbos, we set a place for him at the table. And every Shabbos we call and we invite him to come for Shabbos. And sometimes he does. Because even though his religious life is so different than ours, he's still our son. That's family. This year, let's rebuild our family so that we can see the temple being rebuilt as well. I want to thank you all for listening. And if you want to send me a message or sponsor the next episode, just email me at hope at h.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.
There's a legend told of Napoleon Bonaparte who was traveling through a small town when he saw men and women weeping on the floor in a candlelit room. Upon asking them why they were sitting on the floor and mourning, he was told that these were Jews who were grieving for their destroyed temples in Jerusalem. How long ago did this happen? asked Napoleon. 1800 years ago, he was told. A nation that could mourn the loss of its temple for so long, said the emperor, will surely return one day to their land and see their temple rebuilt. Tishabav is the day Jews mourn the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, as well as many other tragedies throughout Jewish history. The Talmud points out that Passover and Tishabav always fall out on the same day of the week. Somehow, these two days are connected. How? Passover is about redemption and freedom, leaving Egypt to become the Jewish people. Tishabav is about destruction, mourning, and exile. What's the connection? At some time in our lives, we have all experienced pain and hardship. And sometimes it is through those challenges that we strive to reach greater heights and we gain a new sense of clarity and emotional strength that we didn't have before. These challenges are like seeds in a flower pot. If the soil is healthy and if we work hard through the pain and uncertainties of growth, then they will flower into our promised redemption. Challenges and redemption are interlinked. They are two sides of the same coin. This is the meaning of the Talmud's comparison of Passover to Tisha B'av. The Almighty doesn't give us challenges for no reason. Each experience is designed to extract from us, individually and as a nation, our latent potential and to bring it into fruition. Mourning for the destruction of the Temple is meant to inspire us to fix the pain of our past and rebuild a brighter future. In Judaism, a mourner sits Shiva for a loved one, spending a week thinking about that person, telling stories so others will know who they were. By focusing on the positive qualities that that loved one embodied, the mourner becomes inspired to work on inculcating those traits themselves. And by emulating those strengths, they cause that person to live on in this world through their own actions. The ultimate purpose of mourning the loss of the temple on Tisha B'av is to focus on what we are missing and to inspire us to help bring it back to this world. We want to be able to once again feel the palpable presence of the Almighty and experience the incredible inspiration when we as a nation unite together in Jerusalem. This is what Napoleon was saying. A nation that has spent time every year, over thousands of years, focusing on the loss of its temple must appreciate what was lost and will be motivated to do whatever they can to rebuild it. This Tisha B'av, let's focus on transforming our painful experiences from the past into new feelings of strength and courage and a brighter vision for the future. By remembering the pain and tragedies of our past that were a result of the temple's destruction, we will find the passion and resolve to do our part in eliminating suffering from our fractured world and help rebuild our temple. After battling cancer for five years, 16-year-old Ellie passed away on the eve of Tisha B'av. For the following Shabbat, called Shabbos Nachamu, the Shabbat of comfort, Ellie's father Shimon wanted to use his son's sitter, thinking he'd find some additional comfort. On Friday, he spent hours looking all over the house, but the sitter was nowhere to be found. That night, Shimon had a dream that his son showed up in synagogue on Saturday morning. He woke up from the dream heartbroken, knowing that this dream could never come true. When Shimon arrived in shul that morning, all he could think about was seeing Eli in his dream and that he didn't have his son's sitter to comfort him. The time arrived for Torah reading. A young man was called up to the Torah, and Shimon could have sworn that the young man's name was Eliezer Simcha, his son's name. After the prayer service, Shimon approached the young man and asked, Did I hear correctly? Is your name Eliezer Simcha? Yes, the young man replied. I go by Alan, but that's my Hebrew name. Look, the young man showed Shimon his sitter that had the name Eliezer Simcha embroidered on the front cover. Shimon broke down crying and said, That was my son's name. He passed away a week ago, and I couldn't find his sitter to use the Shabbat. The young man handed Shimon the sitter and asked, Would you like to keep this? At that moment, Shimon realized that his son's spirit continued to live on in the world 
After accepting the sitter, Shimon hugged the young man and thanked him for bringing him comfort during this painful time. We are approaching the day of Tisha B'Av, a day we remember the destruction of our holy temple, as well as the tragedies the Jewish people have experienced throughout history. It is a day of sadness as we mourn what was lost and pray for its return. Every synagogue is considered a mikdash ma'at, a miniature temple. Every time we walk into the sacred space, we are to remember that although the temple is gone, part of its spirit lives on through our synagogues. It was fitting that it was in a synagogue that Shimon was reminded that his son's spirit continues to live on in this world. The soul never dies, and neither does the Shekhinah, God's divine presence that could be felt in this world. And through the experience of being in a synagogue, we can get a taste of the holiness and greatness that once was, and yearn for the Beis HaMikdash, Jerusalem's holy temple, to return in our days. There is a lot that needs to be repaired in the world. This Tish above, let us keep the memories of the past alive, resolve to bring back the holiness that we've lost, and together take part in the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Tish above. Tisha B'Av, the day we mourn the destruction of the temple, a day marked with sorrow and sadness. Why is that? Why are we sad about something that happened so long ago, an event that we really can't fix, and a building that we never really knew and don't really miss? Maybe this period of time is not about sadness. Maybe it's about something else. Imagine a guy named Dave who has a father named John. Dave has a lot of respect for his dad. He calls him on weekends, he sees him on holidays, and they get together on occasion. Dave loves his father, but they're not really close. One day Dave gets a phone call that his father was in a terrible accident and he's in the hospital. Dave rushes there and when he gets to the doctor say, we're so sorry, we did everything we could and your father passed away. Dave's heartbroken. He begins the period of mourning and he starts to sit shiva. On the first day, somebody comes in and says, oh my gosh, your father helped me with this and did this and he was amazing. And Dave says, I don't even think I know my father. The next day, your father loved you so much. He always spoke about you. He was so proud of you. And Dave said, really? With each day, with each story, Dave feels closer and closer to his father and misses him more and more. On the last day, the doctors come in to pay their respects. They look at the mantle and say, I'm sorry, why does it say John Levine on the mantle? And Dave says, that was my father's name. And the doctors say, John? The man who passed away was Josh Levine. John Levine's still in the hospital. He's recovering. Now pause for a second. What would Dave do? You think he would say, whew, so happy. Do me a favor. When you get there, just tell him I'll call him later. You think he'd be like, okay, listen, I got a busy week. Um, maybe I'll visit him in a month. If there was a brick wall at the door, Dave would go right through it to see his dad. Why? Last week he forgot the call, and now he's going through brick walls? What changed? Focus. The goal of mourning is focus. Mourning shifts our attention to the deceased. We stop our daily lives, and we put all our attention on them. And as you start to focus on them, you start to appreciate them. You realize how important they are, and how much you want them in your life. You see, since mourning usually takes place after somebody dies, the more you focus on somebody, the sadder you get because they're not here anymore. But mourning doesn't equal sadness. Not if the object of your focus is still alive. We're not sad over the destruction of the temple. The temple wasn't a building. It represented a time in which God's presence was more felt in the world. We mourn because God is telling us Focus on me. He's saying, remember that as comfortable as you think you are, this is not the ideal. If you focus on me, you'll start to appreciate what life could be like with me in it. Me, your heavenly father, could be a greater part of your life. Imagine a world with greater clarity. Imagine greater meaning and purpose. Imagine a world without the challenges of disunity and violence and fighting and fear. Imagine a world without uncertainty, without the ills of so much of what we've been conditioned to endure. By mourning a world without God's clear presence, we stop our daily lives and focus on Him. And by doing so, 
we get closer and closer to Him. And the more we focus on Him, so to speak, the more He focuses on us. Tisha B'Av is not supposed to be about sadness. It's supposed to be about yearning. It's the time in which we focus on how our lives could be so much greater with God's presence in it. And by building up that yearning, by building up that longing, we emerge even more committed to go through any walls that separate us from Him. Everyone is familiar with the train transports that carried the Jewish people to destruction in the Second World War. To coordinate the transport of millions of Jews on railways and into death camps with timing so precise that the victims walked out of the boxcars and into the waiting gas chambers required a computer. In the 1940s, however, such a computer did not exist. But there was another invention that could do the same job the IBM punch card sorting system. IBM, primarily through its German subsidiary Deutsche Hollerith Maschinengesellschaft, or Dehomag, produced for Hitler some thousands of these embryonic computers. Card sorting facilities were established throughout Europe and in every major concentration camp. Jews were moved from place to place, gassed or systematically worked to death, and their remains, their hair, their gold fillings, their spectacles and their pets were catalogued. All with icy automation. The mechanized slaughter of millions of human beings, an unthinkable task, had become orderly, even banal. The unspeakable had become the unremarkable. After witnessing the trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1963, Hannah Arendt coined a new concept, the banality of evil. Arendt labored to make sense of how people who seemed so overwhelmingly ordinary, banal, had been capable of such monstrous deeds. To understand this, however, she need not have looked further than the Torah that was her neglected inheritance. In the book of Eicha, Lamentations, the prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, catalogues with terrible poignancy the destruction of Jerusalem and its people. Eicha is constructed on the pattern of the Aleph Bet, meaning in the majority of the chapters, the first stanza begins with Aleph, the second with Bet, and so on. Rabbi Yochanan said, why were the Jews at the time of the temple's destruction stricken with the Aleph Bet? because they transgressed the Torah that was given through the Aleph Bet. What did Rabbi Yochanan mean when he said that they were stricken, they were hit by the Aleph Bet? Did the letters themselves get up and assault them? Also, why did he stress that the Torah was given through the Aleph Bet? Surely every book in the world is given through an Aleph Bet. Let us try and understand. Megillat Eicha the Book of Lamentations abounds with events so grotesque that they defy belief. Rabbi Yochanan's question, why were they stricken with the Aleph Bet, means, what did they do to deserve that the monstrous and the unspeakable should become part of the natural order of things as ordered as the alphabet? The parallel to the Holocaust is striking. Something completely outside all the boundaries of the natural, something monstrous beyond comprehension, became part and parcel of the natural order of things. No different from organizing a hotel or a factory. If we take those letters and build words that express hatred, racism, intolerance, immorality, if we build a world of selfishness, a world of greed and atheism, then those very letters the order of the world itself could rise against us again. There's no privilege without responsibility. We, the Jewish people, have the privilege of being God's chosen people. Our responsibility is that we must be a light to the nations, that our actions, our thoughts, our words should be illuminated by the keeping and the learning of our Holy Torah.
Uh, we are very, very fortunate. We're back on again uh, to have Jason Tavakoli with us. We've had him come to speak to our group and they really were inspired by him and his words. Uh, Jason is a fighter for Jews for Judaism and uh, that he has fought many different um, missionaries and has, has worked on learning the texts of our Torah, of the Bible, in order to fight many people that try and take Jews away from their Judaism and try and take them away to Christianity. And he's learned all the language, all the words, has uh, done some amazing, amazing work. He lives here in L.A., and we are very fortunate to have him here with us uh, right now. We're going to call in Jason. Thank you, Jason, for being here. Thank We're you very appreciative that. of you. Thank you so much. So, uh, okay, I'll give you the floor. Give me the floor. Give me the floor. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Book of Psalms, chapter 137, verse 5. I want to thank Rabbi Malou and his wife and all of H. Lit for throwing such a beautiful event. And uh, I hope everyone is having an easy fast. I hope everyone is staying safe during this crazy time. Today is a day of mourning. Today is a day of sadness. Today is the day we learn from our mistakes. But most importantly, today should be a reminder. Let me remind you that in the very last chapter in the second book of Kings, in chapter 25, it talks about the destruction of the temple. In verses 8 and 9, Specifically, it says that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, marched to Jerusalem. He burned our buildings, burned our houses, burned the king's palace, and burned the temple. And once he was all done with, the remainder of us was, was sent to exile. Let me remind you that today we recite... Eicha, the book of Lamentations, where we not only accept, but not only admit, but accept the punishments that Hashem put upon us, and we look forward to the redemption. Let me remind you that the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, of blessed memory, in chapter 6, verse 22, foretold that a great nation will come and will have no pity of us. And he reminded us and told us countless times and times again that, hey, if you improve yourself, if you make yourself better, if you follow in the ways of Hashem, if you follow the Torah, that this decree can be reversed. Sadly, our ancestors did not heed to the message. And at the end of his book, in chapter 52, it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Let me remind you that the prophet Yechezkel lived during the Babylonian exile. He was in the captivity. And he had to deal with the fact that the nation of Israel was coming and saying to him, Hey, you know, our, our ancestors made this mistake. Now we're in exile. Now, you know, we don't have our temple. We're not in our land anymore. We've been taken over. Why do we need to keep the commandments? Why do we need to keep the mitzvot? Why follow the Torah? It's over. We're done. There is no reason to. And Yechezkel addresses this in chapter 18, verse 20, where he says, The sins of the father shall not be put onto the son, and the sins of the son shall not be put onto the father. And Hashem goes on to say, Do I desire the death of the wicked? What would I rather want? Would I not want that he improves your way, your ways? You become better, that the wicked man turns away from his wickedness and practices acts of righteousness so that he may live? Now you might be thinking, why am I bringing this up?
we all have the opportunity to learn from our mistakes. The message of Ezekiel is simple. All he's trying to say is, hey, if your father didn't keep Shabbat, you can keep Shabbat. If your mother didn't keep kosher, you can keep kosher. If your father never wrapped to fill in, well, guess what? You can wrap to fill in. If you never had a Jewish education, if you never opened up a Tanakh, well, guess what? You can do it. You have the power to do so. Ezekiel's message is very clear. Just because we don't have our land anymore, just because we don't have our temple, doesn't mean that we can't improve ourselves. Doesn't mean that we cannot make ourselves better. Doesn't mean that we cannot follow the commandments, follow the Torah. You know, I want to um, remind you that I mentioned earlier that it's, it's not just a day of reminder. It's also a day that we learn from our mistakes. Well, what happens when we learn from our mistakes? What does Hashem promise us? What has came true? What will Hashem do for us? What will, what will happen if we learn from our mistakes? First, with what has happened. You see, in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 23, verses 7 and 8, Hashem talks about that no longer will he be known as the God who took us out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery, but he'll be known as the God who took us from the land of the north, from all the lands that we were exiled to, and put us back into our own land. Isaiah, in chapter 11, verse 12, talks about how Hashem is going to take us from the four corners of the earth and put us back into our own land. Ezekiel in chapter 37 verse 21 talks about how Hashem is going to take us from all the lands and put us back into our own soil. Well, look at us now. These books were written over 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years later, do we not have our land back? 14 million Jews, 6, 7 million are back in Israel. Are we not going back one by one? What will happen when we learn from our mistakes? Do you know what Hashem promises? Hashem says that there will be a temple standing in Israel. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 26. That we will be, bring offerings again. All we have to do is just learn from our mistakes to enter this new age. That an age will, where we can bring offerings to Hashem. As Hashem says in Isaiah uh, in, sorry, in Ezekiel, in, in Zechariah, in chapter 14, verse 21, in Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 7. Jeremiah also addresses this in chapter 33, verse 18. And you know what else Hashem promises? If we learn from our mistakes, we can enter a new age, an age where Israel will dwell securely, an age where nations will be at peace, where there will be no war. As it says, <laughs> nation will not live sword upon nation. No will they no war no more. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 6. Now you want to know what my favorite prophecies are. If we learn from our mistakes, we'll enter an age where Hashem says in Isaiah in chapter 60, verse 3, that nations will walk by your light, that kings will, 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 by the, will shine by the brilliance of you, will, will be by the brilliance of your shine, that the kings will come after you. In the next chapter, in chapter 61, verse 6, Hashem tells us that you know, if we learn from our mistakes, we'll enter an age where you'll be known as priests of Hashem. Ministers of God will be said of each and every one of you. The, the nations will come and give, give you gifts. If we learn from our mistakes, we'll enter an age where Micah describes in chapter 7 that, that, that 
the nations of the world, they're going to take their hands, they're going to put it over their mouth, and they're going to be in awe. They're going to be, they're going to go, they're going to be in shock. Why are they going to be in shock? They're going to be in shock because we're, we're going to be, they're going to realize that it was the whole time it was the Jews, it was Israel that knew it, it was Israel that knew. They made a mistake. Israel had it the right way. Jeremiah also addresses it in chapter 16, verse 19. Look, we can enter an age where the Gentiles will surely come and say, it was our ancestors that inherited lives, futility that had no purpose. We created our own gods. How could we do such a thing? The whole time it was the nation of Israel that knew. If we learn from our mistakes, we will enter an age that Zechariah talks about in chapter 8, verse 4, where he says that our kids, our boys and girls, old people, everyone will be sitting in the streets of Jerusalem again, playing, hanging out. When we learn our, from our mistakes, we enter an age that Zechariah says in chapter 8, verse 22, that the nations will come to Jerusalem. That's your capital. They will come to our city to seek out Hashem. And the next verse tells us that the Gentiles will come and Grab the corners of the, your garment. That ten Gentiles that speak ten different languages will come and grab the corners of your garment and say, show us your ways because now we know Hashem is with you. All we have to do is learn from our mistakes so we can enter this new age. I want to talk about a promise that Hashem has given us in the Torah, in Deuteronomy in chapter 4, verse 31, where... Hashem says, I will never abandon you, nor will I ever forget the covenant that I swore to your forefathers. I'm happy to say that he's kept this promise. We are still here. And you just have to think about what has happened in the past. The Egyptians, we were enslaved, tortured. Where is Egypt now? The Assyrians, 185,000 soldiers with King Sancheret marching to Jerusalem. Read Isaiah chapter 36, 37, 38, 39. What, where are the Assyrians now? Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, destroyed our first temple. Please answer me. Where are they now? The Greeks. Where are they? The Romans destroyed our second temple. Where are they now? Who's the talk of the world? Is it the Egyptians? Is it the Assyrians? Is it the Babylonians? The Greeks? The Romans? No, the whole world talks about the nation of Israel. And the Nazis, let's not forget, tried to annihilate us. Where is Nazi Germany now? Hashem has kept his promise in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. I will not abandon you and I will not forget the covenant that I made with your forefathers. Not to mention all of the disasters that happened during this time. Our first temple destroyed, our second temple destroyed, the Crusades in 1096, being expelled from England, being expelled from France being expelled from Spain, the Nazis' final solution.
we've survived time and time and time again we are still here the jews are not only the emblem but the symbol of eternity i mean if the nation of israel had a stock i would put all my money in that stock because it's never going to go anywhere not only is it not going to go anywhere it's just going to keep prospering keep going up bezrat hashem i live to 120 years after that i won't be here but one thing i can guarantee you beyond certainty that the nation of israel will be here forever i want to talk about a story in the talmud in tractate gitin 55b of kamza and bar kamza the story goes that a rich individual threw a big party and he asked his servant to invite his friend kamza so his servant goes to give the invitation and mistakenly gives it to a man named Bar Kamza who was his enemy Bar Kamza ends up coming to the party of the rich individual keep in mind their enemies and as soon as he walks in the rich individual the host of the party comes to Bar Kamza and says leave i don't want you here and bar kamza answers him and says i'll pay for my food let me stay please the host of the party said no you're my enemy i don't want you here then bar kamza says i'll pay for half the guests the host of the party still said no then bar kamza says i will pay for your entire party all your guests please let me stay and the host of the party said no again now you have to imagine that this is happening in front of everyone bar kamza is getting very embarrassed and the host of the party picks up bar kamza and throws him out of his 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 party and what bo- what bothered bar kamza the most is that every individual there just stood by and did not help so bar kamza became very revengeful he decided that he wanted to go to the emperor of rome and he did so and he went and said hey the jews are planning to rebel against you the emperor of rome couldn't believe it so he decided to give bar kamza a peace offering to sacrifice in the beit hamikdash in the temple so bar kamza takes this peace offering and as he takes this peace offering he's walking into the temple he decides to put a blemish in it and you all know the laws we cannot sacrifice an animal with a blemish in it so when he takes this sacrifice he goes to the rabbanim at the temple the rabbanim already know what's going on they were at this party and they realize that they're in a very big predicament the predicament is if we don't sacrifice the emperor's offering it will be a sign of disrespect and we'll possibly go to war but if we do sacrifice it then we're breaking a commandment so what should we do so rabbi zakaria decided 
that we should not sacrifice the animal. We should not break the commandment. And lo and behold, news got to the emperor. The emperor took it as a sign of disrespect. And days later, Jerusalem in ashes, the temple destroyed. Because of baseless hatred. Because we could not learn from our mistakes. Today, as I said, should be a reminder. A reminder that we need to improve ourselves. A reminder that we can be better. A reminder that if we do learn from our mistakes, then Hashem will fulfill the prophecies in the Tanakh. If we do learn from our mistakes, as Hashem says in chapter 11, verse 9 of the book of Isaiah, that the knowledge of Hashem will then be known like the waters cover the sea. All we need to do is take this day as a reminder to take care of each other. You know, Jeremiah speaks of a time in chapter 31 where no longer will we have to teach each other the Torah anymore. We're not going to be asking questions. It'll be so clear in this age that we'll all know it. If we learn from our mistakes, we can bring this age in together. I want to uh, end off by saying that, you know, one of my favorite lines in the Tanakh in, it's in the book of Zechariah in chapter 14, verse 9. Where Hashem says, The Hayah Donai La Melech Al Kol Haret Bayom Hahu Yah Donai Echad Ushmo Echad. He talks about a day that Hashem, our God, He will be king over all the land. On that day, Hashem will be one and His name will be one. If you take anything from today, from what I said, is that you should constantly remind yourselves what can happen if we just improve who we are day by day. I hope we all can bring in the redemption. I hope we all can experience the age together. And uh, thank you so much for listening, Rabbi Malul. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your words. Uh, your passion and your inspiration are so inspiring. That's what we've been saying all the day. Please, may Hashem allow us to come back and renew our energy as it was, that good energy that we long for. We don't even know fully what that means, but it means a connection to meaning and depth and a connection to Hashem and understanding and wisdom. And that's what we're hoping for. And your energy has been so strong. We felt it. Thank you for your words, um, uh, thank Jason. You, so much. you only have thank blessings so much, and success. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Amen. So um, next up we have coming Rabbi Hanan uh, Gordon, who is actually the Gadol Hador, uh, the holiest of all. Uh, he is, um, I know he's he's going to say it's just a joke, but it is just a joke. We're not allowed to joke on Tisha B'Av. But he's a very close friend of ours, and he spoke to our group um, just a few weeks ago, 
two weeks ago, and they were so inspired by both his energy, his happiness, and the message that he was sending, uh, the, the love that he has to teach and the willingness that he has to teach is really something that's inspiring. So uh, we're very thankful that he's here and we're just going to call in uh, Rabbi Hanan. Thank you for being here, otherwise known as Anthony uh, Gordon. Thank you for being here. It's my honor and my pleasure. And I think, uh, Rabbi Malul, firstly, you've done an unbelievable job. Uh, as someone who's been around the H. Los Angeles community for uh, over 25 years, I've never seen a program like this. I think you're absolutely terrific. I don't. I really don't understand what the, the things that your wife says about you. I think you're, you're terrific. It's an amazing <laughs> program. It's an amazing program. We're kidding aside. It's an amazing program you put together. And really, one person to put together, it must be what? Uh, eight, nine speakers. So, call like a board. So the, the topic, <laughs> I, I enjoy it. It's for the Jewish people, and I enjoy it. So thank you. Sure, sure, okay, yeah, I'm gonna come. leave the screen to you, Rabbi. Thank you so much for being here. Of course. So the the topic uh, that we're going to discuss today seems rather strange. How do we make Tisha B'av a, a celebration? So here we are, five p.m. in Los Angeles. We're going on what twenty, probably about twenty. 21 hours of not eating. I've spoken at a number of events. Probably going to need my dentist to bring my tongue back in line off my palate. But truth be said, I think that Tisha B'Av is an, a, a, a theme that I'm going to try and touch on today is misunderstood. And I think if we, if we come at this with a slightly a different angle, I think, A, this Tisha B'Av can hit the spot, and my hope and prayer is that it will in fact be a tipping point for the rest of your lives. Now, how can I? How can we be so audacious uh, to even say on uh, ostensibly the saddest day on uh, in the Hebrew calendar uh, that it's going to be a celebration? So it's it's not completely out there. You should know that the. The Jewish book of the Jewish book of laws and codes, known as the Shulchan Aruch, actually uses the verbiage that Tisha B'Av will be a moed, which means it'll be a, fest, a festival, it'll be a yontav, it'll be in fact uh, one of the happiest days of uh, the Jewish calendar. So let's let's ascend and go on a journey as to how we can participate in Tisha B'Av becoming the happiest day of the Jewish calendar. And the only way we can really do that is to understand how this all began. And so I've been privy to some of the other speakers they talk about the concept of baseless hatred. One of, one of the underlying reasons that we lost the second uh, temple. So as Rabbi Milul pointed out, <clears throat> I've been involved in teaching and outreach, speaking at seminars for over 25 years. What I have found is the following. Generally, people are good. If a person says something, a baseless hatred says something in a pejorative way or a hurtful way, as a general rule, the axiomatic notion of hurt people, hurt people, I have found to be true. Now, why are people hurting? So in my life journey, I found that often people hurt because they're harboring erroneous notions or, or facts that once they are dispelled, clear up a lot of the way they see the world. So my friends, we're going to go on a journey. I'd like to take my more than 25 years involved in teaching, lecturing to by now many thousands, tens of thousands of people. And I'd like to hone in on, in my experience, the major things that hurt people and perforce cause them to hurt other people. Because if we can understand that, and then we can reverse that. And each and every one of us it can build, can bring another brick to ensure that we build the third, the third temple. So let's call it myth number one. 
The first myth that I've heard uh, very often is that a person who fails at something is a failure. There is nothing further from the truth. Uh, perhaps, my friends, you have heard of a young child who grew up in Europe who could not speak until the age of four, who could not write until the age of seven, who was told in, in elementary school that he'll never get further than a basic understanding, who was expelled at least once from elementary school because his teacher said he is slightly retarded. My friends, you may know this person today as Albert Einstein. Or perhaps, my friends, you may know another failure, a person who dreamt of being a great cartoonist, but this person was so poor, was so financially indigent, that in order to get a roof over his, his head, he had to seek shelter with the priest, and the, there, was a, there was a shack at the back of the church, and as we know from, from the life story of this person today, one evening, in the shack of this church, he noted a, a small mouse coming out from the hole at the bottom of the shack, and he began to sketch uh, that mouse. And my friends, you know that mouse today is Mickey Mouse, and you know that a cartoonist as Walt Disney. Or perhaps, my friends, you might know another failure. A person who grew up in the South, who was the product of both physical and emotional abuse, who dreamt of being a host hostess on a television the person auditioned the first time and they were laughed uh, off the stage in uh, the follow-up audition they were told and i'm uh, paraphrasing get out of your head that you will ever have the profile or the ability uh, to be on uh, television uh, my friends you may know this person uh, today as oprah winfrey perhaps another failure a fa uh, failed person that perhaps you people may know, and I was blessed to know this person very, very well. This person began a place of study because he wanted to take the instructions for living, and he wanted to share this with all of our disenfranchised brothers and sisters all over the world, and he began a teaching institution called the yeshiva on one occasion failed. He tried again and failed. On the fifth occasion, People were literally laughing and said, it's over. The concept is insane. And my friends, we all know that, that person today as Rabbi Noah Weinberg. It's quite clear that having failed at something does not make a person a failure. And uh, perforce, uh, that should not be a cause of you being hurt and therefore hurting other people. Myth number two that I've come to experience in my travels is the notion that, Rabbi, because I'm in pain, that is proof positive that the Almighty hates my guts. So we need to dispel that because that's very much part of what Tisha B'Av is about, and it's a very erroneous way, and most people sadly think this. They think this because they think that pain is something that is bad. Let's illustrate by a graphic illustration that nothing can be further from the truth. Little Moishi, a five-year-old child, is playing with his soccer ball on the front lawn. And as <clears throat> would have it, the, the ball rolls into the street. A car comes around the corner and literally two feet away from our hero, the Moshi, ah! the driver slams on brakes. He opens up <clears throat> the window. He starts screaming at this poor little kid. Don't you realize you are irres irresponsible? Kill it. And he gives him a piece of his mind. And as any normal uh, five-year-old uh, child uh, would do, uh, little Moshi once again playing with the ball and lo and behold, the ball uh, rolls out into the street. Once again, uh, two feet away from our hero, driver slams on brakes, rolls up the window, and blasts this poor kid to kingdom come. And the kid goes back uh, the third time. Once again, the, the ball rolls down in the street. 
This time, my friends, uh, the driver stops the car, pulls up the handbrake, and starts chasing our poor hero, Moishi. And he's chasing him through backyards, over hedges, and he's chasing him finally to the back of a house where he comes to a cul-de-sac. The little kid tries to jump over the wall. The driver uh, grabs uh, the poor little kid. It takes this little kid, puts him over his knee, and gives him a punch. Who was the third driver? The third driver, my friends, was his father. The first two drivers didn't care enough. There is only pain if a person cares. We understand from the concept of the beginning of days from Adam and Eve, the notion of the snake getting everything that it needs, all its food, <clears throat> every part of its sustenance by slithering on its belly. It never has to look heaven bound. It's all there for the taking. That is the highest form of indifference. That is God saying, I don't care about you. So my friends, pain is the antithesis of hatred. It's proof positive of love. We've got to understand that there are many examples in nature around us that God helps us understand that pain is not bad, but rather pain is the price that you're going to pay for greatness. No person that is great, no person that you would look up to as a role model or as a mentor has got there without tremendous pain and without vicissitudes. In nature, we see this many times, the purest form of oil from an olive <clears throat> cannot be extracted without squeezing the olive. Without squeezing us, without the Almighty testing us, the potential would atrophy. We would never actualize our potential. We know that uh, from naturally watching a bodybuilder. If you wanted to be the previous governor of California, you would have to understand that if there's no pain, uh, there is no gain. So myth number two, my friends, which causes people pain, in my experience, is the notion that because my, there are vicissitudes and pain in my life, uh, that is proof that God does not love me. It's uh, the exact opposite. Let's go for, let's look at myth uh, number three. I see this often when I speak on campus. I see this often when I speak in offices. The notion that we are in this world to be perfect. Our friends, the Almighty created fallible human beings. A part of our journey is the journey of correction. God did not create automatons, robots that are perfect. Let me share with you how we can understand this from something that's been around my life as spending my formative years in South Africa. Most South Africans know a little bit about gold and diamonds. So if I were to ask you, if a person was holding in his right hand a flawless diamond, and in his left hand, he was holding a diamond with a slight blemish, which diamond would you think has a higher value? The pure diamond that has no flaw, or the diamond that has a slight blemish, a slight flaw? So anyone who knows anything about diamonds will, will tell you immediately that the so-called flawless diamond is synthetic. It doesn't exist. There's no such a thing as a diamond which is perfect, no blemishes, no flaws, because they are mighty created in such a way that you cannot extricate that type of mineral from the ground without there being some residue. There is no such, a, there is no way that the Almighty puts us in this world, in a world which is surrounded by imperfection and expects us to get through this world without scars and without having some wounds along the way. So the notion that we, that we have to be perfect or the end goal is that we've never made mistakes flies in the face of everything that we learn about in the Torah. But there's, an, <clears throat> there's another example I'd like to share with you which for me <clears throat> was a life changer when I started learning the subject many years ago. And that is in the Holy of Holies, which is the iron 
inside the temple which we have lost and which we commemorate today on Tishvav. What was housed in the Holy of Holies, the most sacrosanct place on earth? My friends, what was housed was the broken tablets. Shards of the broken tablets our rabbis teach us because it wants to teach us a very profound lesson. Not only were the shards of the broken tablets when Moses received the first tablets housed in the most holy place, but when the Torah gives the eulogy of Moses, the greatest person to sojourn this planet, the Torah chooses the episode of smashing the tablets as the highlight. What's the lesson and how is it relevant to the concept of perfection? The lesson, my friends, is that, to paraphrase the words of Ernst Hemingway, the world breaks everyone, and afterwards, some of us are stronger in the broken places. There is nobody that you will meet in this world uh, that hasn't had uh, been broken in some way, disappointed, had, had a curveball sent. That is the story of life. It's not whether you live on easy street. It's not whether you were born with a silver spoon. It's given the script that you were given. And every single one of us is uniquely given a script. How did, how did, how did you live your life given that script? What kind of attitude did you have? Did you see the stones in the road as stumbling blocks or were they stepping stones? The Almighty is teaching us a very important lesson. It's that everyone goes through this journey called life and everyone feels the pain and everyone feels the hurt. And that's part of why we hear one of the classic books that we study by one of the greatest Jewish minds, the Ram Chal, is that one of the reasons that we hear is to overcome vicissitudes, is to by overcoming these vicissitudes, we actualize our potential. Uh, the final test of the first Jew, Abraham, after the binding of Isaac, a heavenly voice came out and said, Abraham, Abraham. The commentators asked, why twice? In simplistic terms, we learn that the Abraham down here, the raw potential, had become actualized. He had actualized his potential by overcoming the vicissitudes by flexing muscles that would otherwise lie dormant. And so myth number three is the idea of being a perfect, the idea of going through life in easy street is not why we're in this world. If it was, my friends, then every Friday night when we bless children uh, <clears throat> before we have the Friday night Shabbat dinner, if I were to bless my daughters, I would bless them. Why? You should be like Jessica, Jennifer, and Lisa, who went to Yale, Harvard, and Princeton, who went on to become the greatest doctors who have a white picket fence in a Labrador in Greenwich, Connecticut. But that's not what we say. The patriarchs and the matriarchs of our religion understood the concept of pain, understood the concept of challenges, and we are we inherited the spiritual DNA of our patriarchs and matriarchs. The journey is how do we take the, the cards that we were dealt and <clears throat> do we take the lemonade, the lemons that make it into lemonade, or do we sit in the corner and play victim? So let's pause for a second. We started saying the topic that was given to me is how do you make Tisha B'Av into a celebration? We said that it's it's not completely from left field because the code of Jewish law specifically says that at the end of days, that Tisha B'Av will be a Yom Tov, will be a happy occasion. And the reason that we lost the temple we went on to say, the second temple, was a concept called a baseless hatred. We then went on to say that hurtful words usually emanate from a person who he, he or she himself or herself is hurt. The cliche of hurt people hurt people. 
I then suggested that often uh, people are hurt uh, because they harbor erroneous notions of what their life is supposed to be, of most people having drunk the Kool-Aid for long enough uh, that's bought into a Hollywood story of happily ever after. And because that's not why we're here, they become hurt, some become cynical, and therefore it's not too much of a stretch to understand why hurtful words can leave their mouth. So when we drill down and we dispel some of these myths that people harbor that are erroneous, hopefully we can understand <clears throat> that it wouldn't be hurt, it would be her control. It should feel incredibly scintillating uh, to know that the Almighty loves us so much that he's deeply involved in our lives. In fact, the Talmud says, that if any one of you goes through 30 days of your life with no curveball and no pain and no strain, it's not a good sign. It's as if the Almighty is stepping back. So think of the next time that there's a recalculate. Know that the eye in the sky knows the very final destination as do you, but he's helping you recalculate. And he's helping you ensure that you become who you can become. So once we've dispelled the myths, we can take the next step in understanding how Tisha B'Av can become a day of a celebration. The only reason, my friends, that it's a sad day is because the Almighty loves us more than we can fathom, more than as hard as it, as it is to, to even understand this concept, more than you will love your own children if you're not already a parent, it's a pure, benevolent, altruistic, giving love. That The fact that we cannot have a close, intimate relationship with our Father in heaven, that is, at the end of the day, the reason why up, in, up until now, Tisha B'Av is a painful day. It's not because the tr there's a bunch of tragedies. The tragedies are a byproduct of the fact that we lost the temple. And it's not the edifice. It's the fact that the temple was a placeholder where the Almighty could dwell and be close to us. It's important to understand how much the Almighty is rooting for you and how much he loves you. There's a beautiful st story told about the young Thomas Edison arguably one of the most famous inventors of the 20th century, the electric light bulb, amongst many, many other uh, forms of inventions. The story is told that when he was nine and a half years old, he was a rambunctious kid, and his teacher wrote a note and said, Tommy, I need you to take this note, go back home and let your mother read this note, and you are not entitled to come back to the school ever again. Poor Tommy gets back uh, to his home. Mrs. Edison was <clears throat> cleaning the kitchen, as legacy has it. She took the note. She looked at her young son, Tommy, and she said, Thomas, this is what this note says. You are so brilliant. You are so unique. You are so far ahead of your contemporaries and your colleagues in your classroom that this school, you cannot keep up with you. And to avoid the boredom that you would feel, your teacher who adores you uh, has sent you home so you can be homeschooled and so that you don't have to go through the boredom because you're going to whiz past everyone else in the class. Fast forward to the story, my friends. Mrs. Edison passes away. One evening, as the Edisons were moving to another home, as a legacy would have it, and Thomas Edison, who by now was a household name, <clears throat> one of the world's greatest inventors, <clears throat> saw a box in the attic, opened that box, and he found that note. He ripped open the envelope. And for the first time, he read the note. My friends, it said something like the following. 
This child is a complete idiot. This child has no clue. This child is expelled. He should never see the inside of a classroom again. The fact that Mrs. Edison made her son know how much she believed in him, the fact that he was exuded, that he was inculcated with huge confidence, he wanted to realize the beautiful potential that his mother supposedly created in this optical illusion. The same is true about the Almighty. Because every single day, my friends, a Jew wakes up in the morning. The prayer that we say is called Mordeh Ani Lefanecha. But if we focus on the last two words, which are Rabba and Munasecha, loosely translated, I have faith in you. The creator of the world, my friends, of the universe, of the galaxies, believes in you, is rooting for you. And if that was not the case, you would not be here right now. He believes in you, and there's not a single Jew that was put on this planet to win the bronze medal. Every Jew is a prince or princess, is, is destined for greatness, and you have the greatest force in the Milky Way. The Almighty himself is rooting for you. So let's think about what we said up until now. We started by saying that one day in the in near future, God willing, Tisha B'Av will be the happiest day of the Jewish calendar. In fact, in the, the code of Jewish law, the word Moed is inserted, which means a festive, a festive day. We then went on to say that one of the reasons that we are sitting on low chairs, that we are not wearing leather, and we are walking around with bad breath, is because the, the temple was destroyed. Both temples, in fact, and the second temple, uh, one of the major reasons is a concept called sinas chenam, which is baseless hatred. We drill down, we discuss the concept of a hurt people hurting people. We then went on to say that in most cases, the people are good. And it seems that in most cases, people only hurt people because they themselves are hurt. And I have found in my experience, and there's a plethora of research which corroborates this, that it's usually because people have erroneous notions about the way their life is supposed to roll out. And because they are, they are in pain, they act out and hurt other people. And therefore, what we did is we took the common myths that many people believe and we dispelled them. We took myth number one and we said, uh, that <clears throat> that failing failing in one activity or other, even failing in a relationship, it doesn't make you a failure. We went on to say myth number two is uh, because there's pain in our lives, uh, people draw the erroneous formula uh, that that means God doesn't love me. We said that's exactly the opposite. Because if he, he did not love me, he would be indifferent. The fact that he cares, he's involved in my life. And when I take my child to get an injection to be inoculated for chickenpox, and I'm holding her, and there's some guy with a mask on with a white coat about to bear down with a huge needle, at that point in the mind's eye maturity of a four-year-old, my father must hate me. But it's exactly the opposite. I love my daughter so much that I want to make sure that she does not have any sinister disease. So it's quite uh, the opposite. We then went on to dispel another common myth, and that is that we're in this world to be perfect. We spoke about diamonds that are flawless, and we spoke about the holiest place on planet Earth was the temple, and specifically the Holy of Holies. And in that place was shards of the broken temple, bro broken tablets, uh, proof positive that God is not looking for pretty. <clears throat> God understands that in this journey called life, all of us are broken at some point. All of us feel the pain. That's not the acid test. The acid test is whether we get up and keep running. So now we need to focus on the last point. The only reason why this is a sad day 
is because the Almighty loves us. And the placeholder that was created, that the Almighty himself created, the temple is no longer with us. And therefore, the relationship that the Almighty wants to have with us, and we clearly want to have with our Father in heaven, is somewhat scrambled. So I realized uh, uh, that there's a tremendous gift that the Almighty gave us in a few things during this coronavirus. I have been in a teaching context and in a business context on hundreds and hundreds of Zoom calls. As wonderful as the Zoom technology is, and as much as it has enabled us to continue, a Zoom call, my friend, is not the same as being in the room with someone. About 15 years ago, when I was trained as a voluntary EMT to become a part of the Hatsala organization, one of the first lessons we learned was the vital signs when somebody comes to a, a first responder situation. What's one of the first things that we do? You'll take a you'll take the wrist of the injured person and you'll hold the person's wrist ostensibly to check for their pulse. But there's a deeper reason. The deeper reason is human touch. Uh, the fact that someone is scared, the fact that someone has just been a victim of a car accident or some altercation, feels that somebody is there who cares, takes the stress, anxiety, and blood pressure precipitously uh, lower. The fact that there is a human touch, the presence of someone who cares. We, having lost the repository, the placeholder of where the Almighty can dwell, that relationship is somewhat estranged. It's a Zoom conversation, whereas it was so clear the divine providence and the interaction between us and the Almighty Himself. That scrambled conversation is frustrating and it's and it causes pain and sadness. It would only it only causes a pain and sadness is because he loves us and every Jewish soul is wired within our DNA to know to, to know how much we love him and without without the Almighty uh, in none of the things that we have in our life uh, would be happening. So if we understand now <clears throat> what we've lost, if we understand the fact that one of the reasons that we lost the temple is a baseless hatred because hurt people hurt people because they're harboring certain things that probably are not accurate. And then we can take the final step. The final step being that every single one of us is praying that the third temple will be rebuilt. It's not that we're gonna, it's not because we want to have a beautiful edifice in Jerusalem where we can take selfies and send to our friends. It's because uh, the Almighty created a, <clears throat> a spiritual place where we can feel the Almighty's presence in the most intimate way. Every single one of us has had a moment, be it a birth of a birth of one's child, uh, be it a sunset, be it listening to a beautiful piece of music. Be it realizing on date number four that you're looking into the eyes of your significant other. We've all had that experience where we can feel, so to speak, the Almighty's touch and kiss in the room. There's nothing more scintillating. There's nothing more beautiful than to know that there's somebody who loves us more than life itself is with us and is guiding us. We live, my friends, in a time where there's never been, there has never been so much technology in the world. The proliferation of technology has caused something which is a sad byproduct, and that is something which the coronavirus has also unfortunately been a side product of, a byproduct of, and that's loneliness. It's counterintuitive that as a result of social media, as a result of the fact that we are distancing ourselves from the natural connection between human beings, people feel alone. The very first ad 
of the very first iPod was a faceless person dancing alone. I will tell you this, my friends, <clears throat> I've spoken on many campuses, at many seminars, at many workshops, if I go back in time and think of what's the common denominator by many people coming to the podium afterwards, at the end of the day, it's Rabbi, I'm lonely. That's how we feel on Tisha B'Av. We feel lonely because the Almighty who adores us is at best a scrambled Zoom call away. At the time of the temple, the clarity or the visceral sense that our Father in heaven was with us and guarding us is something that we want back. We all want to feel that, that somebody who loves us is with us. So we live, in a place, we live in a world where instead of building our internal world, instead of building our character so that we can overcome the tests that the Almighty has customized for us, we live in a world where one sense of self is a direct result of how many likes and how many people are following us and one's self-worth sadly has become synonymous with one's net worth it's not it's not therefore uh, too hard to understand why people are lonely why people feel that they whatever victory they have is hollow so one of the things that i i i think one of the blessings that the almighty has given me is I spear a group in a company uh, that represents a number of famous, prominent professional athletes. These are people that every single one of you know by name in the NBA or the NFL. The interesting thing is, for many of these many of these athletes, I'm the only person, the Orthodox Jew that they've ever met. And they see a genuinely happy person. And I exterior accolades that you're supposed to have or whatever labels and i'm often asked there's something that you have that i want i know it's not some kind of a psychedelic drug so here's the way i'll answer it and here is how it's relevant to our discussion <clears throat> and to the final point that i'd like to share with you uh, before the standing ovation and that is we are coming to the end of a fast day my friends the Almighty created the body that if you don't eat, you will start to feel lightheaded, you'll start to atrophy, you'll be uncomfortable, you'll feel an off balance. That's the body component of the human psyche. But there's another part of the human psyche, and that's the soul. If you don't feed that soul, that void will cry out. The Desire for a transcendental experience is something that's part and parcel of the human experience. And when I tell these athletes that if I went onto a professional basketball court within about 60 seconds flat, I would either be completely knocked out or I'll be a standing joke. But if I put you, my friend, and I say this to people obviously who know us by now, who know me by now, in a situation where people are talking about the purpose of life, where people are talking about overcoming vulnerabilities, where people are talking about God, you will be as uncomfortable and as out of place as I am on a professional uh, basketball court. It's because your entire focus is the body, the muscles, the three, sh the three, this shot, that shot. Nobody will ever be happy, will have peace of mind, will have a sense of wholesomeness without feeding the other part of the human psyche, and that's the soul. Intrinsically and viscerally, they all realize that. I'll share with you, since I have a special connection to Asia Torah of Los Angeles for many, many years, a interesting two anecdotes of my life, which I think is germane to our discussion. About 10 years ago, I represented, in the context of a private banker, a business manager, Manny Pacquiao. So Manny Pacquiao, one of the best known athletes on the planet. At the time, he was the holder of eight, of eight world titles. Unbelievable athletes. 
So I happen to be privy to something which I believe is a gift from God, <clears throat> which underscores everything we've said up until now. I can only say this because he's told me this and is, I believe, public knowledge. Uh, soon before, uh, very soon before he was about to walk out uh, to fight Bradley, he received a brown manila envelope. He was gloved up. Clearly, he couldn't open the manila envelope. But I happened to be close enough uh, to take a peek and uh, got a sense of what was in that envelope. What it was, was a divorce papers from his wife, Jinky Pacquiao. Jinky said in a sentence, you can either continue to live this nihilistic, hedonistic existence of woman, uh, fancy cars, or it's me and the kids. Manny Pacquiao, almost on a dime, turned his life around. This is the person who grew up in the primitive outbacks of the Philippines, is probably the best known athlete on planet Earth outside of the United States. Uh, but his wife was telling him something which is very profound. Either you're going to be the horse or there's a jockey that we can't see, and that's called the soul. The most intimate relationships that we have between the significant others, between the family and between us and God, that's the only way you're going to be centered, that's the only way you're going to have any sense of peace, and that's the only way you're going to have true happiness. I attended on many occasions here in Los Angeles, where many had more than one home, prayer sessions that many instituted in, in recalibrating his life. It's the understanding that without the relationship with the Almighty, that void is clear, that void will be hurtful, and that void needs to be filled. When we lost the temple, it wasn't the edifice. It was an intimate relationship that every single, every single one of us crave. And that's why we, are, we sat this morning on low chairs, why we, we said things in a very low voice and we didn't greet each other in terms of salutations to remind ourselves <clears throat> that the best the most intimate relationship that we possibly can have with the almighty himself right now is at best a zoom call and we want it back we want that feeling back we want the intimacy back so i'd like to pull us all together by thinking and by giving and sharing some practical ideas that are the opposite of the baseless hatred, that as the sun sets here in Los Angeles, and before we run out after the evening service and grab a cinnamon bun and a diet Coke and, pick, and say, phew, another year is uh, behind us, I'd like to leave you some important messages so that Tisha B'Av 2020 will be the turning point to, uh, for the rest of your life. What are some bricks that each and every one of us can bring together to rebuild the temple to ensure that we'll once again have the intimate relationship that we all crave. Number one, I mentioned loneliness. I mentioned the fact uh, that in the last six weeks, it never before in the history of the United States of America has the amount of antidepressant prescription uh, uh, drugs uh, been prescribed by pharmacists. Never before in the history of the United States has there been such a spiking of teenage suicides. And never before in the history of uh, the United States has there been an increase in divorces. Americans aren't happy, my friends. Americans aren't happy because they are desperately alone. The connection between one person and another is a pedagogical lesson for all of us in the, the connection that we want to have in the ultimate relationship with, and that is God Almighty himself. Let's think of the bricks. Clearly people are lonely. The brick number one is smile. There's two famous schools in the Talmud, the Yeshiva of Hillel 
and the yeshiva of Shammai. Shammai taught his students to receive everyone with a cheerful face. Brick number one, my friends, is the next time you're in, ele in, in elevator, the next time, smile at the person in the park, smile at the person when you purchase a beverage at 7-Eleven, people are lonely. The way the Almighty created us is a natura, natural mirror-like reciprocity. A person smiles at you, there's a sense of, I want to smile back. Make the first move. Brick number one, the opposite of baseless hatred is love for no reason because they're another human being and they deserve it to be loved. Brick number one, greet people with a cheerful countenance. Be the first person to smile and be the first person to break the silence, be in an elevator, in a doctor's waiting room. People are at the lowest point in modern history. Brick number two is let's judge everyone favorably. Everyone's going through a hard time. 42.3 million Americans are on one form of, of relying on either government or state funds because they have lost their job or their main source of revenue. I, I alluded to the fact that relationships are strained. People are not able to interact with other people. People need to be cut some slack. We don't know what's going on in other people's lives, but I can tell you this. Most people are going through a hard time. So before we point a finger and before any negative words leave our lips, which was, again, the reasons why we lost the, the second temple in the first place, let's err on the side of saying, I don't know what's going on in anyone else's life until I've walked in his shoes. Uh, so uh, brick number one is let's be the first person to smile. Let's, let's greet people with a cheerful countenance. Brick number two is let's realize that everyone, everyone has got, is going through a tough time. Uh, let's not <clears throat> be the person that gives them a lecture about <clears throat> how things could be better. Let's judge them favorably. favorably. Uh, the third is let's change the way we look at things. We all know if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. There's an old adage of two prisoners in the prison cell looking out, two prisoners looking out, one saw the stars, the other saw the mud. It's what the way we see things is going to definitely impact the way we feel and perforce the way we behave. And it's a domino theory. Let's try and find the lemonade in every situation. The Almighty is not an old wise man on the end of a cloud with a whip trying, trying to get you. He adores you. The pain is not because he hates you. The pain is because sometimes we have to recalculate. The pain is because if he didn't squeeze you, your muscles would atrophy and he wants you to be Abraham, Abraham. He wants you to be the greatest person that you can ever be. So before you come home with complaints and before you look at the challenges and say, why me? Let's try and recalibrate. <clears throat> Let's try and say, take the word why out of our lexicon. Why or why me can only trigger something which is negative and can only trigger something which is going to be a circuitous end to not a non-productive end. Let's reframe things. Let's assume that everything that happens is coming from a, a God that loves us more than we can fathom. Let's assume uh, that when we have the little bump in the road, it's only a recalculation. And when we do that, <clears throat> we will feel better about what's happening in our lives. We'll feel better about ourselves. And uh, the corollary of that is we will worry less about ourselves, but more focused on other people. The part of the third brick of changing the way we look at things is 
I look at my children, many of whom fall within the cohort of the millennial generation, and I think it's terrific, amazing technology, amazing opportunities, but there's a subtext. It's the I generation. It's iPad, it's iTablet, it's I, it's all about the narcissist, it's all about me. No one by definition. They can be happy if they focus only on themselves. Love is a byproduct of giving. I spoke about Rabbi Weinberg very briefly uh, when we spoke about failure. A man who uh, failed a number of times in uh, launching the first beginner's yeshiva. What I heard Rabbi Weinberg say to me on several occasions <clears throat> is if there was somebody when we, when we were studying in Jerusalem that was down, homesick, depressed, the exercise that Rabbi Weinberg suggested was to go to the dormitory, go to his room, and bring the youngster into the place, the study hall, and get them to ambulate, get them to do some exercise, get them to start moving around. We just have to move things around in the study hall because we're having a special lecture tonight. You've got to move those chairs to the left, move the, 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 the lectern to the right. And after about five or ten minutes of this motion, suddenly he realized, one second, I'm supposed to be depressed. By getting out of ourselves, by the notion of motion, if you add the word E to motion, you get emotion. It's very difficult to have kinetic energy to be ambulating and to be focused on oneself. It's also very difficult to think how I can make somebody else happier, how I can help another person, and at the same time be drawn to myself. So let's summarize three of the bricks uh, that potentially are the fictitious bricks uh, that we could bring to the building of uh, the third temple. We said we live in a generation that's very lonely. The normal interaction between people has been taken away, not only by the proliferation of technology, but has been compounded by a pandemic that the worst of which we've seen in 170 years. We mentioned the fact that there's people that are surviving now on prescription drugs that is a higher statistic than in the last, than since prescription drugs began, that there's people that have reached such a form of darkness that it's less painful to take one's own life, heaven forbid, than continue. If people are feeling like this, and many people have lost their jobs, and many marriages and relationships are strained, be the person, be the person to smile. Be the person to say, how are you? Be the person to say, that's an amazing tie. I had one like this. Be genuine, but, in, but be a person who gets engaged. Be the person who receives people with a cheerful uh, face. That will already break down barriers that will already burst the bubble that unfortunately has become part of the ethos of this pandemic. We said, don't this when people are low, never hit someone when he or she is down. This is not the time to give someone a lecture. This is a time to judge people favorably. Everyone's going through a hard time. No one knows what's going on in another person's life unless you've walked in their shoes. Let's not judge. Let's err on the side of judging people favorably. That people that perhaps if I was in their situation, I wouldn't even handle it half as well as they are. I think that already will change the way we, we, we look at other people. The final brick that we said was to reframe things, was to see the stumbling stones as stepping stones, was to know that a altruistic, benevolent, all-loving, good God, by definition, cannot do bad, which is one of the reasons, my friends, on the Jewish New Year, on Rosh Hashanah, we don't say have a good year. We say have a sweet year because everything that God does is good. Painful? Absolutely. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, of course. But we've got a God that's rooting for us, that cares for us, that loves us and knows what's good for us better than we know for than ourselves. Similar to when I take my three or four year old little girl to be inoculated from chickenpox and hold the poor kid so the doctor 
that can put a needle in her. It's because I love the child. We are mere, we are mere mortals. We are stuck in a paradigm called time. By definition, we can't understand things that are outside time and <clears throat> that are the immortal. Let me say in closing, <clears throat> Two complaints that I often hear, and I think this will bring things together so we can be energized and enthused uh, when the curtain drops in about six minutes, when my allotted time ends, uh, that we can make this Tisha B'Av a turning point and a stepping stone and a tipping point for the rest of our lives. Here's what I hear. Here is notion number one, which once and for all I'd like to dispel. Rabbi, and I hear this often, everyone else's life is peachy. They've got, they've got a normal household. They've got money they want. They've got a good job. My friends, I'm here to tell you that's absolutely not the case. Because there's absolutely nobody that is healthy, normal, that's not a hermit, that's not living in a cave, uh, that's going through this journey called life where everything, quote unquote, is coming their way. So remember that when everything is coming your way, chances are you're in the wrong lane. Uh, the second and final point uh, which we can uh, close with is the complaints I hear is, Rabbi, you're someone who wants to, he has great ideas, you want to change the world. That's all well and good for, for someone like yourself, but I, I'm only one person. And so I'm here to tell you, my friends, that my, perhaps you are only one, that you're perhaps you're only one person in the world, but I can guarantee you that you're the world to at least one person. Let's take some of the thoughts that we've shared today. Let's take some of the bricks that we've created today. Let's take those things together. If the 1.2 million people that are watching the streamline as we speak. If each and every one of us it takes this to heart, we will be part of the solution. We will be part of the generation that rebuilds the temple, that will rebuild the feeling of closeness and intimacy to the Almighty that loves us. May it happen soon in our days, and God willing, may we celebrate Tisha B'Av 2021 together in Jerusalem, dancing on the roof of Asia Torah. Have a safe and wonderful evening. Have a wonderful rest of the day. God bless, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Rabbi, for your wonderful words. Uh, so to the point, and so, so beautiful and so inspiring, giving us hope, which is exactly what we stood for, and that's what we said that this day really is. And you really nailed it. How do we make Tisha B'Av a celebration? And you taught us exactly how we can. Uh, that was a, a wonderful talk. We have some amazing messages here of people saying, um, uh, thank you, uh, wear a smile, someone <laughs> hashtagged, which could be a new thing, you know? That's great. Uh, someone else said, so good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Very you. inspiring. Thank you. So you've got some beautiful words here coming from the public. And it's true, you know, our face is in the public all the time. And when we smile, uh, it's it's a public property. It's it's not beautiful. only ours, it's there for the public. I think it was Hafez Chaim who said that. Right. But it really is. And, you know, it's another thing that we've been speaking about throughout the day, which I've noticed many speakers touched on in different angles, was how this is a day of... Uh, growing in our love within ourselves. Because if we want to project love to others, the love needs to come first from within. You can't love people if you have hate inside of you. And if those doors are closed and there's hate, I don't care how amazing you are in public, but if you've got hate inside, it's not enough. You've got to find the love from within when no one's watching. And love well, from within, you know, from a Jewish perspective, is in terms of the way we speak, the language that we have, the music yep. that we listen to, the things that we watch, it's, it's all behind the scenes. You might say, okay, who cares? I'm, I'm cursing, who cares? No, no, no. That shows a deeper anger from within. I'm watching this video, who cares? No, yep. that shows that what am I doing with my time? What am I doing? Ayeka, 
Echa, where am I? And um, that's really a beautiful well, message that you're sharing with us. So. Be before uh, my, my good friend, Rabbi Waiwai, Wai, uh, takes over the podium, let me in 60 seconds say the following. Firstly, uh, Rabbi Mel, I want to, on behalf of the speakers, give you a huge shout out. It's an incredible Appreciate program it. you put together. I want you to know it, it's, it doesn't go unnoticed. You have touched the hearts and souls of, of many people by putting this together. And I'll say the following exercise for the 1.2 million people still watching, and that's the following. I always <laughs> tell people that there's no such thing as multitask. It's a complete myth. Cognitively, you cannot bifurcate. So by the, by the, same by the token, way, before you even say that, Rabbi, I'm just going to interrupt you. You said 1.2 million people watching. You're right. Because that, for every single person, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, so I said for every single person that's watching and they're inspired, it's not just them. It's all the people that they're going to speak to in the future. It's their children, the grandchildren, yeah. the great-grandchildren. It is 1.2 million. Abraham didn't say, oh, I'm one, one person. Okay, forget it. No, he was millions of people ahead of him. We don't realize the impact of our actions in this world. So anyway, I was just throwing that in. It uh, really no, is beautiful. I'll, I'll say in closing, tell, there's no chance... Uh, that the 1.2 million people can go in front of a mirror and smile and say, I am angry and sad. It's just not the way that the Almighty created the emotions and the physiology. And so my final parting words before the curtain comes down is, if you're not happy and you know it, you still clap your hands. <laughs> that's beautiful it will influence the outside will influence the inside exactly thank you so much that was beautiful thank you we really appreciate Jack. it anytime should... a great honor enjoy. pleasure enjoy thank amen. you until next amen 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 only be back only together things. with and only good things only simple amen. thank you very much thank beautiful you. job thank you thank you we are very excited also to host rabbi y Ru Rubenstein. Now, I remember Rabbi Rai Rubenstein. He was a neighbor of a good friend of mine. I hope he's listening somehow. Dan Lieberman, Rabbi Dan Lieberman, who's now in Australia. But he was a neighbor of a good friend of mine. I used to go to Dan a lot. And I used to always see that there was this house that had lots of students coming in and out. And I was wondering, who is this house? I want to be a house like this. And um, really, the truth is, we've uh, also developed a house like that thank God, which has many, many people coming through, obviously not now during COVID, but in general, we have, uh, uh, me and my wife and my family have built this model of hosting as many people as we can and bringing in as many Jews as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to call up Rabbi YY. I was in his school with his son wow. and uh, we're very, very, very thankful that he's here with us. Rabbi, thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure. As I said to you before, no can you hear to any man and the fact that he's giving a share when the fast has officially just ended about 10 seconds ago and he could be eating. So there you go. <laughs> right, that's where I'm going to start. Yeah? Okay, yes. I'll... Other embarrassing facts about me. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Rabbi Mullah. It's uh, an honor, particularly as my wife comes from Los Angeles, and I know it very well, at least I used to know it very well in the days when they had things called aeroplanes and uh, trips that people could take, which no longer actually exist. That might uh, talk one simple thing to do to rebuild the temple. Hmm. Okay, so I have to tell you, I was in Israel at the Hanukkah time, and I, got, I went there for a very special purpose. I went to see a brand new granddaughter whom I'd not met, and she was nearly one. So that was, it was a long time getting to meet this gorgeous little lady. Her name is Lola Rose, and she was named after her wife's grandmother. I got to meet her wife's grandmother on three occasions before she passed away. She was born in a place called Auschwitz. In actual fact, I don't mean Auschwitz, the concentration camp that came next. She was born in the town of Auschwitz, of Auschwitz which of course the, the death camp clustered around. And uh, it was very moving. Our family moved to Glasgow and, or moved to Scot or, excuse me, to Scotland uh, at the end of the 19th century. So there's no direct uh, victim of the Holocaust in our family. However, when I now find that I have a granddaughter, 
and she's named after um, her gra great grandmother who was in Auschwitz. Suddenly, the whole things came very, very forcefully to me, particularly in this Tisha B'Av, and particularly in Tisha B'Av when we've now got special prayers at the end which actually address the victims of the Holocaust. And I want to tell you something else that happened in that trip. See, my, my oldest daughter-in-law is the deputy head of the infertility clinic at Charitetic Hospital in Jerusalem. And um, she gave us a tour of the hospital. So I wa wanted to show you, uh, I don't know if we could share the screen, I'm not so expert, but uh, I've got a picture here on my phone. I hope you can see this, I'm gonna hold it up. Probably not, oh there, good, that's not so bad. Can you see that? Maybe, yeah, do it that way, Ruben Steele. Can you see that? Ugh. That was in the lab. Any idea what that is? I'll show you again. Oh, hold it up. Have a guess. What do you think that is? People see the steam coming from it, and they're a bit confused. It looks like a big pot. and looks like Lego pieces at the top. They say, the Kabbalistic mystical rabbis say, that the souls of the children who were killed in the Holocaust yearn to come back, yearn to be back on this earth. And that it there in my daughter-in-law's lab, what you're looking at is 30,000 potential Jews. These are fertilized eggs. They're in a big uh, pot. It's uh, obviously frozen. They're frozen and they're just waiting, I suppose. I wonder if there's little souls looking down, waiting and hoping that this can be taken, implanted in in a womb, grow into a body that their soul can can come and join. It was a very moving combination of events, seeing all these potential lives and seeing one that was realized from somebody who was in Auschwitz. And it brings the whole hatred and why we're here thing very much to life. I mean, after all, we know it's just classic stuff through the Talmud and through Jewish history, repeated it over and over again. The Jewish people simply lost it. We lost our belief in ourselves. We hated each other. Um, I can't remember which famous American philosopher said, no nation is conquered from without until it first conquers itself from within. Something along those lines. And we did that. We did it, we no longer believed in ourselves. Sadly, it's not too dissimilar to what's happening in the United States just now. And people hated each other, just like they hate each other today in the United States. Towards a more glorious union, that would have been the ideal Jewish motto. Um, and like it's falling to bits here, it's, it fell to bits there, so much so, that when the Roman army marched in Jerusalem, uh, Vespasian, the, the Roman general, uh, he was told by his spies, don't attack, you don't need to attack. The Jews are busy killing each other. There was a civil war going on. Jews hated each other to such a degree, they were quite willing to kill each other. And so that all comes back to me. It all brings the story of our 2000 years bloody exile back to me. And of course I come from Europe and I live in New York, but I've visited many times Old York, the city which this one is named after, where there is a place called Clifford's Tower, where a duke who was owed money or owed money to the Jews thought a better way than repaying them is simply massacring them. And so in a, in a tower, the Jews fled. They, they hoped that they would be protected by the sheriff who didn't bother, of course. And they cut their own throats rather than have themselves mutilated, raped, and all the usual stuff that went with medieval anti-Semitism. And so uh, this touches me. And I hope it touches you as well. I hope when you hear another Jew talking disparagingly about uh, somebody else Jewish, that it disturbs you and distresses you. But I'm afraid that's, it's what got us here. It's what keeps us here. Because the Talmud, and I'm sure you'll hear lots of people telling you this, the Talmud famously says, if you live in a generation that doesn't do your bit to rebuild the temple, then you're guilty of the same behavior that caused the temple and the expulsion from Europe which led to one massacre after another massacre after another massacre from the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition and the pogroms and, and eventually, of course, culminating in the Holocaust. So the title is One Simple Thing to Rebuild the Temple. So I'm gonna tell you about that. Let's, let's talk a little, for a little bit about um, 
exiles and the mechanism of exiles, how it works in Judaism. You see, there have been several times the Jewish people have lost their land, been exiled. It always is the same mechanism and all, all, always the same trigger. The mechanism goes like this, just like we said before, that there is something fundamentally wrong with the Jewish people that it needs a very, very dramatic message for them to pay any attention to. And sometimes when there's no other choice, then it has to be exile. But here is the mechanism. The mechanism is that whatever is wrong with the Jewish people, we are exiled into a nation which itself manifests the exact same character flaw as their chief characteristic. The idea is that we learn from it and we stop doing it. And if we stop doing it, then the reason for the exile ends and we can go back. So let's try that mechanism out. Let's try that, that blueprint out. The first exile um, that the, talk, the, tom, the, the Torah talks about is the story of Abraham. Abraham, Avram, Avino, our forefather, when he's exiled with his wife Sarah to Egypt. Now, what was wrong with the great Abraham, the founder of the Jewish people, that required him to be exiled? Now, I don't know if you know this, but the main character trait of Abraham was chesed, kindness, philanthropy. He was the embodiment of kindness. And he was exiled to go to Egypt. Now, how on earth does that make sense, that you're exiled to Egypt? The answer is a surprising one. If you were to look or dip into the Parsha, the part of the Torah of the Yikra, in the Parsha which talks about Kadashim being holy, a horrible word, it says the following thing. There are sexual relationships which are permitted to Jews and sexual relationships which are not permitted to Jews. Um, the ones that are permitted to Jews are anybody that you can marry. That's okay. The ones you can't marry are those who are your close relatives, and that's not okay. So you can't marry your brother, you can't marry your sister, you can't marry your children, they can't marry their parent. Um, so therefore, any marriage like that, which was incestuous, that's banned. So I can't marry my sister. So here's an interesting question. Can I marry my half-sister? Suppose my father, let's say my mother predeceased my father, and he marries somebody else, and they have a girl. She's my half-sister. So can I marry her or not? I can marry somebody who there's not an incestuous relationship. I can't marry somebody who there is. Half of her is not my sister. My father married some other woman. So can I marry her? Well, logically, there's 50% reason for saying yes and 50% reason for saying no, because half of her is my genetic match, my genetic sister. So can I marry her or no? Any ideas? Well, logically, as I said before, there's much reason for saying yes and for saying no. But the POSIC, the verse, says, Anybody who marries a sister, half sister, and has a sexual relationship with her, chesed who? Chesed who? Chesed is the Hebrew word for kindness. It's a kindness. What? Ki incest is a kindness? Is, you've gone crazy? <laughs> However, and incidentally, by the way, all the translations will shy away from translating it that way. They translate it, it's an abomination. Also, says, that's not the translation. Here's one Hebrew word you should know, chesed. Three letters, a ches, a se, and a de, chesed. And that means kindness. So why are we calling incest a kindness? And why did Avram, who's Mr. Chesed, Mr. Kindness, have to be exiled to Egypt? And the answer is because Avram, Mr. Kindness, had to be shown what happens when kindness goes wrong. You see, there is one word that somebody who is in their nature, he or she, very kind, one word that such a person finds very difficult ever to utter. And that word is? No. Can you help me with this? Yeah. Can you babysit? Yeah. Can you can you help me push the car? It won't start? Yeah. Can you lend me some money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because a Baal Chesed is the same Hebrew. Somebody who is intrinsically a kind person finds it very difficult to say no. So Avram had to be shown what happens in a society where people have forgotten how to say no. And as you probably know, without any reference to Judaism whatsoever, it was very, very common in ancient Egyptian society for pharaohs to marry their sisters. So you have to be shown what goes wrong. The second exile, well, that second exile was actually the Egyptian, the Egyptian one when we went to Egypt. 
um, because of a fight between y Yosef and his brothers. So I'm going to go into the second, uh, the third one then. The third one was when we're thrown into Babylonia. The Talmud says the problem with the Jewish people at that time was they engaged in idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder, Jews killing other Jews. But the Talmud concludes that the murder and the idolatry was only in order to justify and liberate them to do whatever they wanted sexually. So that if you want somebody else's wife, then you just kill the guy to take her. Ah, you feel a little bit guilty, it offends your morals. Well, change the source of your morals, get away from Judaism and embrace some nice idolatrous religion that says that's perfectly okay. So the main problem was sex. So Jewish people were exiled to Babylon. Babylon, incidentally, even look up an English dictionary, a Babylon is a, is a euphemism for a sexually corrupt society. The idea was that the Jewish people were surrounded by them and they were um, therefore exposed to that. And like every physical pleasure, too much of anything, too much chocolate, and that sickens you of chocolate. Too much sex sickens you of sex. The Jewish people became sickened by it because the host nation manifested the same flaw, stopped doing it, as a consequence could go, go back home. This exile was caused because Jews hated each other, as we said before. Jews hated each other to the point of killing each other. And ultimately nothing has changed. So therefore we're exiled into a host nation or host nations in which hatred, senseless hatred is common. And it should be that we learn the lesson and we stop doing it. When the Tsarist police came up with the protocols of the elders of Zion, claiming there's a world conspiracy of Jewish capitalists and communists to take over the world, um, that recruited many new anti-Semites. But why did the old anti-Semites hate the Jews? They didn't have the book yet. Well, the answer is it's just a gut hatred. And because we felt that gut hatred for other Jews, then we were exiled into, into, into nations and, and times where we would experience that all too commonly and sadly today throughout the world, and particularly in America, when Jew hatred is exploding again in many, many fronts. The idea is therefore an invitation to stop doing it. Now, the one I didn't refer to was the first, the cause of the first exile when we were in Egypt, which was a fight between Joseph and his brothers. Joseph and his brothers, they hated each other, or rather the brothers hated Joseph, he gets sold as a slave to Egypt, you must know the Bible story. And that causes the Jewish people eventually to move to Egypt and 210 years of exile, he bloody exile. See, we're supposed to learn the lesson. So there's a famous rabbi called Rabbi Shlomo Volba, passed away, but he's a very, very brilliant thinker. And he says that indeed the Jewish nature, the nature, the intrinsic nature of the Jewish people is family. It's an intriguing verse in the end of, of the last Parsha, the last bit of Genesis, which talks about the Jewish people going down to Egypt. And it says, uh, here's the Hebrew, and I'll translate it. But when they went down to Egypt, there were only Shivim Nofesh. 70 Shivim Nofesh, soul. The plural in Hebrew is Nefoshosh. So it should say 70 souls, but it says 70 soul. Why does it say 70 soul? So let me give you a good, a good insight here, which will do you no harm at all as a Jew to know. When you're looking at the, the Chumash, when you're looking at the Torah, you've got to ask yourself the following question. Who wrote the book? Well, the person who wrote it down was Moses. Who dictated it, who wrote the book, was God. And here's the piece of advice. You should know that God's good at Hebrew. There's only one word that does not occur in the vocabulary of the Almighty, and that word is oops. God never says oops. He doesn't make mistakes. But this looks like a typo. 70 soul? Shouldn't it be 70 souls? No, it wasn't a typo. It's intentionally 70 soul because the Jewish people intrinsically are one family. And I think we feel that very often. There's, an even, there's even a joke that if two Jews meet each other for the first time and after five minutes talking, they find that, they're not, that, they, that they are not related, it simply means that they haven't been talking long enough. But uh, it's true. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to feel family. So Rabbi Shlomo Volba says an incredibly interesting thing that he says that the Hebrew word for, for cruelty is achzor, achzor. 
And that word breaks down into a k zor, ach zor. I'll see you as being a zor. Zor is the Hebrew word for stranger or alien. Stranger or alien. If you ever go to visit the land of Israel, when you ran, land at Tel Aviv airport, you go down a, a long uh, walkway and then you go into the immigration hall. And there's a big sign that says Yisraelim, Israelis, and then Zarim, Zar, people who are strangers, aliens. So the word for cruelty is Achzor. Do you know why? One of the concentration camps was called Treblinka. Now, Auschwitz was a death camp, as we all know, but they still manufactured stuff in Auschwitz, um, like armaments for the German army. So when the British heard about that, they bombed the armaments factory, but left the gas chambers alone, even though they knew what was, was happening in the gas chambers. And um, but Treblinka was just a death camp. But the person in charge, the commandant of Treblinka, one of the most evil human beings in history, was somebody called Franz Stangl. After the war, he was captured by, America, by American soldiers. When he was interrogated, they asked him the following question. As, it's the, as it was the case that the Jews were meant and, and were going to be killed in any case, why were they subjected to tremendous back-breaking work? They were starved, reduced to looking like human skeletons, permission to use the toilet facilities, the latrines, was, which were incidentally woefully inadequate, was routinely denied. They ended up being covered in their own urine and their own excrement. They smelt appalling, disgusting. They looked like human scarecrows. The question the interrogator asked Stangl, why, as they were going to be killed anyway, were they subjected to this? And this is what he said. In order to condition those who had to carry out the policies, to make them able to do what they had to do. Let me say that again. In order to condition those who had to carry out the policies to make it possible for them to do what they had to do. Even Nazis, in order to kill another human being, had to stop seeing them as a human being, rather as a human skeleton, a human scarecrow, something different, something untermensch was the German word, subhuman. Then you can kill somebody. But the basic nature of the Jewish people is not to see other people as being different, to be, to be seen as being the same. I used to teach in a school. I was a young man. I had studied education at university, Glasgow University, Glasgow in Scotland. I don't know if I mentioned that I'm Scottish. And, um, and I believed in all the latest theories. And I was teaching in a religious girls school called Basiakov. And uh, it was a, a fairly successful year. At the end of the year, what happens, and I'm sure it's the same in your school, uh, what happens is you go to the end of year examination, which I prepared for the various subjects, and the girls got their exam, and then I gave them their marks. And then after that, you have to fill in the report cards, which is sent home to their parents. The mark, and then the teacher's comment. Writing teacher's comments is an art form. You see, if you write exactly the truth, it's not a good idea. And so what has evolved is the art form of the hint. So you don't write the truth, you hint at the truth. So for example, if, it, if the girl has behaved badly, you write, could have behaved better. If the child, male or female, hasn't done much work that year, could have tried harder, did no work the entire year. You get the idea. I did not believe in this. I studied child psychology, and I believed in uh, a Swiss um, psychologist, child psychologist, an educator called Piaget, and he said, no, tell them the truth. And so I wrote in, if the girl had behaved badly, behaves badly. Didn't do any work, doesn't do any work. The other older and wiser teachers tried to warn me, but I was young, extraordinarily arrogant, and very stupid. And so I sent off the report cards. What happens next? is a week later, it's meet the teacher's evening. Parents meet the teacher's evening. I had a little desk and all the teachers were all sitting in a row with desks. My name card, Rabbi Y.Y. Rubenstein. I have to tell you, I was feeling rather pleased with myself. The fact that almost every set of parents was lining up to speak just to me, ignoring, I felt sorry for the other teachers. And then the first, 
parents sat opposite me and then the father leant across the desk until his nose was separated from my nose by about a millimeter. And he said, so why are you persecuting my daughter so much? Why do you hate her? He looked as though he was going to punch me. He was going to punch me. He was not the only one. And that whole night, there were many fathers that were going to punch me. And when I, I remember coming home and saying to my late wife, are these people stupid? Are they crazy? They want me to lie about their children? This was, of course, before my own children started coming home with report cards. If any teacher insinuated even slightly that there was something less than perfection that could be used to describe my offspring, it was quite clear to me it was only because there was something wrong with the mental health of the teacher. He was a lunatic, or she was a lunatic, or they were an anti-Semite, or an anti-Semitic lunatic. But there's nothing wrong with my children. You see, you can't possibly criticize somebody about their children. They don't want to hear. They don't want to say something nasty about their kids and they want to hear anything nasty about kids because they love their kids. They see them as themselves. That's our problem. We don't see each other the way we should. 70 soul, one people, one soul, just the same family. Because you don't want somebody to come and tell you something nasty about your brother or your sister either. If only we simply felt that, that would be good. So here's the one thing we're running out of time. The one simple thing you could do to rebuild the temple. I mean, if you're taking this seriously. I mean, if I'm taking this seriously, although I've done it. I have done this. So I can bring it to you as having been uh, test drived. Here it goes. If all those souls looking down at that picture I showed you, hoping that they could maybe come back to Earth. But we've lost so much. We've lost so much in Auschwitz. We are threatened today in a very real way both here in the United States and certainly in the, in the land of Israel. If you want to play your part, then this is what I'd like you to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to offer you a 90% guarantee it's going to work. You see, if there is a fracture in a family, then there's nothing worse. This is how you put it right. I want you to imagine or think of somebody you used to be very close to. Um, you were a very good friend. And for whatever reason, the friendship ended. And it might be that before that hurt, that pain, that fracture, you were very close. And maybe, if you're being objective, it was an enjoyable relationship. And now it's ended. This is how to get it back again. Now, as I say, I've tried this. So I can give you a 90% guarantee. Suppose it was a friend, it could be a cousin, it could be a brother or a sister, and God forbid it could be a mother or a father. This is what I'd like you to do at the end of this learning session here tonight. Um, pick up the phone to the person you haven't spoken to for five years or six years or longer and say, hello, it's me. Please don't hang up the phone. I want to tell you the that I've been thinking very hard about what happened to our relationship. And I want you to know that I've come to the conclusion it was 100% my fault. Now, I know that you don't think it was 100% your fault. If you did, you should have said, I'm sorry before now. And very rarely in any relationship is it 100% somebody's fault. It's usually, whatever the fractions are, there's, there's usually mistakes on both sides. But that's what you're going to say, even though I know you don't believe it, even though it might not be true. You're going to say, I've been thinking about it. And it's a hundred percent my fault, and I'd like to come and apologize in person. So here's my ninety percent guarantee. I can ninety percent promise you that when you go and you knock on that front door of the friend or the cousin, the brother, the sister, the mother or the father, they're going to say to you, "It wasn't a hundred percent your fault. It was my fault too." And you might recover a precious relationship with a brother or a sister, an old friend, a mother or a father. That would be nice. I didn't say it was an easy thing to do, but it's a simple thing to do. Now, 90% promise it works. I said this, I say this very often. I promise you, I often get between 10 phone calls, particularly if it's an older audience, of people who get in touch or email to say, I want to thank you. I did what you said, 
I'm now talking to my brother for the first time in 14 years, and many like that. Now, once I said this in Manchester in England, that's where Rabbi Melu comes from, so he'll get the accent. I'd said this in Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. And the next night, somebody phoned me up and said, is this Rabbi? Why, why? He said in a Manchester accent. I said, yes. He said, I listened to what you said in synagogue yesterday. I said, oh, yes. And I thought, I'll try that. I said, that's nice. And I phoned my brother and I said, I've been thinking about what went wrong between us. And it's 100% my fault. He said, you're damn right. And he hangs, slammed down the phone. So I can't promise 100% it's going to work. But that doesn't matter. He tried. And the day when we think about rivers of blood, I'm sorry for the cliche, but it is rivers of blood. So through the two millennia since we got ourselves kicked out for hating, for hating each other so intensely to experience intense Jewish hatred, this is an opportunity to show that you, just like me, I hope, want to play a little bit in putting it right. So that's up. At the end of the session, at the end of Ishlet's wonderful webinar, then pick up that phone and try. And I can 90% promise you that you will actually recover a friendship. But I can 100% promise you that in heaven, they notice what you did, that you played your part to rebuilding what the Jewish people truly are, one family, sheep and lovish. Rabbi. Thank you so much for your words. So to the point, and we're so thankful. Thank you very, very much. A real really pleasure. appreciate it. Real pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again. I hope it's everything you do. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We should see the rebuilding Vezat Hashem very soon. And we have now with us uh, Rabbi Yisraeli, who is a, a big, very well known and Many, many people call him and connect to him. So we are very thankful for him here. And without any more waiting, we're going to call up Rabbi Israeli to come on and give us uh, some words of inspiration and hope. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And thanks to um, Ashley and Rabbi Malul. It's an honor and privilege to be here speaking with you. Um, and you know, Tish Av is a very strange Yom Tov. And I call it the Yom Tov because it is called so in the Psukim of Echad that we read last night and this morning. On one hand, you have Tisha B'Av being the worst day of the year and the worst month of the year, Chodesh Av. And Tisha B'Av is the commemoration of so many bloodsheds and so many destructions and so on, inquisitions. But on the other hand, Yirmiyah Navi calls Tisha B'Av a moed, a festival. Indeed, the Shulcha Aruch, the code of Jewish law in Siman Tafkuf Nun Bet, that's 552, brings that we don't say Tachanun. We don't say Vidui, the parts that normally on a regular day even we say, we omit because it is treated like Shabbat, it's treated like Yom Tov, that we don't say Tachanun. So that's one um, question, a, a stira, a contradiction within the very essence of Tisha B'Av. Is it a sad day or is it a happy day? Is it a moed? Kara alai moed de pasuksis. It's called a festival. On the other hand, we find also in the Kladot of the Torah. When we have in, par in the parasha, in the section of Kitavo, 98 different kalalot, different curses, that negative things mentioned in the Torah, that the culmination of all of them, the Pasuk says, you know why all of this negativity has happened to you? And there in, in Devarim, in chapter 27, Verse 40, 28, verse 47, the Pasuk says, Tachad et Hashem All of this happens because you did not serve God, your creator, with happiness and with joy. So we're supposed to be joyful and happy. But on the other hand, 
‫ואינו מי שנכנס אב, ‫ממעטים בשמחה. ‫When אב comes, when the month of אב sets in, ‫we reduce our joy and our happiness, ‫and it becomes stricter and stricter ‫until today that we have no happiness at all, ‫and we are, you know, our mouth smells, ‫and we are thirsty and hungry ‫and sitting on the floor for it half of the day. ‫אז זה דבר קשה להבין ‫מה באמת הכי טוב של תשעה באב. ‫איך אנחנו יכולים להבין? ‫כל הדברים האלה, ‫הדברים האלה שיש לנו, ‫הם פשוטים. ‫אלה הם האלמנטים שקורים, ‫אנחנו מתחילים, אנחנו מתחילים, ‫אנחנו אומרים, ‫אנחנו אומרים, ‫ואנחנו אומרים, ‫תשעה באב, ‫חלק מזה הוא חלק, ‫חלק מזה הוא חלק. ‫ואז באמת, ‫ההלכה היא, ‫אחרי ההלכה המדעית, ‫אתה יכול לשבת על הקשרים. Why? Because Chazal, Chachamim, our sages teach us the Mashiach is born, our Messiah, Mashiach, is born on Tish Abav, to which the Maharal writes and Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen write the same thing. It doesn't mean physically Mashiach, Messiah, is born on Tish Abav on this day, but rather the energy of Geula, of redemption, is born out of Tish Abav. So they, there's an energy of positivity. There is something positive about Tish Abav that no other sad day of the year shares with Tish Abav. And obviously, we have to realize that if Chachamim, if our sages put Tish Abav on the calendar to be observed by Jewish people as a day of fast, that means that we cannot, at least in exile, li live without the element of Tish Abav. Because if they would be just commemoration of something sad that happened, there's no shortage of, unfortunately, inquisitions, murders, massacres in the history of Jewish nation. They would barely have any day empty on the calendar of the Jews if it would be commemorating and marking each one of those. So Tisha B'Av, when it was set in the calendar for Jews to, to commemorate every year, it means we cannot live without Tisha B'Av. in our exile. And the question is why? Why can't we live without Tisha B'Av? I want to share with you a story that actually happened with Mr. Rothschild, Anshel Rothschild, one of the greatest billionaires of his time. He hired a certain young, um, talented individual. He was poor, he didn't have much, but he saw in him potential. He was very smart, very sharp. So he hired him. And be it that he was very talented, he climbed the ladder of growth very quickly. Within a few years, he became the right-hand man of Rothschild. And he knew all of the accounts, he knew all of the connections, all the banks, all the main players. And little by little, he became, he started becoming a little bit more comfortable. Not competing with Rothschild, obviously, but he was, you know, dealing as if it's his office, it's his empire of business. And this was, you know, Did not, did not get through properly to Rothschild, was not received nicely. And Rothschild one day comes to him and says, you know, it's been a pleasure doing business with you for past 10 years. You're an amazing guy, but you know, the way things are going, I don't see a future with us together, you're fired. So obviously it was very sad in the beginning, but he gathers himself together and um, he says, look, I have all the connections. I'm best friends and buddies with all of these people that they, 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 they run the business of Rothschild. In no time, I could get a fantastic business for myself and I'll be my, my own master. So he goes to sleep, he gets up in the morning, he goes to the first bank, the, 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 the biggest connection, flat out, they tell him no. Second one, third one. Before sure he know, notices that Rothschild being the businessman and the smart man that he was, Before he fired him, he had sent already telegraphed to all of these connections and all the banks and businesses not to hire this fellow. So now he was really broken. He comes home, he's pale, he's angry, he's depressed. His wife takes a look at him and says, what's with you? And he tells him, he says, you know, so she had a better sense of social life than the husband. And she says, look, We've been with Mr. Rothschild for 10 years. He hasn't ever done anything that's less than perfect to us. He took you in. Remember how you were 10 years ago. You were a nothing. 
he was so nice and so gracious and every opportunity that he gets, he gives you, pays you extra, he brought it. He took you in as a stepson. He has been so kind and so loving to you. He loved you as a stepson. So he says, why? You mean he didn't call to say that they should black? He said, no, I, I'm telling you he called because he doesn't want you to get any jobs with anyone else. He wants you back. He wants you to be working with him. He doesn't want you to get a job elsewhere. But he doesn't want you as you are today. He remembers you as the simple, loving, caring, hardworking, happy person that you were 10 years ago. He wants that person back. He wants you to learn a lesson to, to become a little humble and to realize that he wants the business, the relationship with you. He doesn't want you to go away. He wants you to you know, persevere and, and, and go back to him and say, you know what? I learned the lesson, let me come back. And that's the story of Tisha B'Av for us. You know, Tisha B'Av is not about a destruction of a building. There is a mashal, there is a, a parable that the Dubna Magid, Rabbi Yaakov Dubna, he was the um, a friend and contemporary of the Vilna Gaon. He gives a mashal, I would like to change the mashal, the, the parable a little bit. And I searched to see if this has happened ever. And to my surprise, I found several cases of this very mashal, this very story in different variations happen to people. Imagine Ruben, we call him Ruben Katz. So Ruben Katz is a CEO of a company, extremely successful, a multimillionaire. He has a big company, big building, and he has a father. He loves his father. He has somewhat of a relationship with him, not so close. He calls him up on, on, on weekends. He goes to him on, um, you know, national holidays and on Yamim Tovim and so on. Sometimes he forgets to call him. But he loves his father. One day he gets to his office. He gets a phone call from the emergency room. Mr. Katz, yes. Is Shimon Katz your father? Yes. He says, unfortunately, we have to tell you that he was in a very difficult heart and, and heart car crash. And he's in a difficult situation, critical situation. Come by, come by quick. So he drops everything. He doesn't. He doesn't even... Notice how he gets from top floor to bottom, gets into his car, he rushes to the hospital. He gets to the hospital, he goes to the emergency room. He says, where is Mr. Katz? He says, Mr. Katz, it's room five. Goes to room five, he says, the room is empty. The, 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 the nurses and doctors are there. He says, where is my father? He says, Mr. Katz, unfortunately, we did everything that was possible. But we couldn't save him. He died. We're very sorry for your loss. So the whole world comes crashing down now. He remembers the, the memories pour into his mind of childhood and the love that, that his father had for him. And all the moments that he could have been there for the father and he wasn't, he could have done this better and that better. But now he has to sit Shiva. He has to start the process of mourning. So he sits. And the first day people come to him and say, oh, your father was such an amazing fellow. He saved my life. He saved my business. When I was all the way down, he, he lent me money for free. And he did. I says, wow. I and the next guy comes and says, your father loved you every time he would speak to me about it. He's my best friend. I'm so proud of you. And every person that comes and goes through, he feels more and more the lack of the father. And he's kicking himself why he was not there for his father as much as he could have been. Until... A few days into the mourning process, one of the Jewish doctors that was in the, in the hospital comes to be Menachem Abel to comfort him. He comes in, he sees the mantle, there he sees the name. It says, Shimon Katz. He says, why is it Shimon Katz? He says, well, that's, Shimon was my father. He says, Shimon Katz is not dead. Robert Katz is dead. Shimon Katz is still in the hospital, is recuperating. It has been a mistake. Now freeze the moment right now. What would he say? Would he say, wow, gee, Baruch Hashem, thank God. You know what, doctor, if you don't mind, when you get back to the hospital, tell him I'm going to come very soon. When I have five days 
of, 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 uh, of work that I have not done and behind. And I'm going to come catch up with him in five days, in a few days. Or would he rip through everything and go to the hospital, regardless of what it takes, and never leave the side, the side of his father again? I bet all of us are saying the second. And this, again, has happened many times that I found that parents thought their kids were dead. Kids thought their parents were dead. And the reunion and the relationship afterwards is absolutely not the same. It's a life-changing experience. And that is exactly the essence of Tish Av. Tish Av is not a day of mourning, of eulogizing the building that was destroyed 1951 or 52, over almost 2,000 years ago. That's not the point of Tish Av. Tish Av is a day of yearning, of, of trying to understand that the father was playing, it's, it's a make-believe that he was dead for us to realize that we miss him. We miss the relationship. And that is the point of happiness that we have in Tish Av. When we say, when Chachamim tell us, sages tell us that the Mashiach is going to be born on Tish Av, this is what it means. That the energy of our redemption is buried within the elements of the morning of today, of Tish Av. That if we understand that we still have that relationship, that the father is waiting for us so desperately on the hospital bed for us to go to him and to revive that relationship, that our boss is waiting for us, that we should, we should come down from our haughtiness and our focus on our, ourselves and rebuild that relationship. That would become the platform of our Geula. Now, you see, relationship is based on love. I always speak about a concept that I call a Shulchan Aruch Jew. Shulchan Aruch is a book of law. And a Shulchan Aruch Jew is a person that keeps every letter of the law to the last, to the last T. Every little detail. And I always say, I wish everyone would be Shulchan Aruch Jews, but the Shulchan Aruch Jew does not last more than a few generations. Because you see, a Shulchan Aruch Jew is a taxpayer. You have a relationship of a husband and wife or a friends to each other, and then you have a relationship of me with IRS. If you're a good American citizen, you pay your taxes, you don't cut any corners, and you pay it to the last dime. But I do not know anyone that would pay an extra penny more than he has to pay taxes to the, to the government, to the IRS. Why? Because it's not a relationship. It's an obligation. I benefit from the, the goods of this country and I pay taxes. And I'm a good citizen. I pay every last dime. But the relationships are based on love. And love is measured by how much you're willing to go beyond the letter of the law. How much you're willing to sacrifice from what you want for the sake of relationship. And that is what our relationship with Hashem is also. You see, the Gemara says, we all have heard probably dozens of times today and other Tish Abe'avs, why was Beit HaMikdash destroyed? Yes, the Gemara in Tracted Yuman, page 9, says because of Sinat Chinam, because of baseless hatred, because we couldn't get along. And the first temple was destroyed because of the three cardinal sins, incest and idol worship and murder and all of that bloodshed and so on. But I want to share with you a different Gemara. The Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat, I believe it's in page 89, in Tracted Shabbat. The Gemara says, Lo charva Yerushalayim. You know why Beit HaMikdash, why the, the Jerusalem was destroyed? Because they kept every last letter of the law of the Torah. And you say to yourself, what? Because they kept the Torah, Yerushalayim was destroyed. And you read it carefully again. And that's exactly what he's saying. Yerushalayim was destroyed because people were not willing to go the extra mile for each other. Because that love 
was sucked out of the relationships. They became like, like robots. What does it say exactly? And I'm going to do exactly what it says. Not that iota more. I won't do an iota more. And that's why Hashem said, if you're going to be exacting like this, I have to be exacting with you. And guess what David Amelech says in Tehillim? Says, Hashem, please don't come to judge me. Because if you want to use your pure judgment, no human being. And when we say no human being, you're referring to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, all of the list of the names of the tzaddikim and great sages and all of the forefathers that we've had. None of them could come out completely pure, says King David. So we don't want God to, to judge us exacting. And therefore, we have to go the extra mile. We have to go beyond the ladder of the law. Let me share with you a story that happened. The, you know, their hospital, children's hospital here, and they have a section with all the children that Rahman has done, God forbid, they all have leukemia. My wife's niece is there now. And she should have a up in amongst all of the Chole Amo Israel. And one day they had a surprise visit and everyone started looking at this visitor. Why? Because the visitor was in a wedding gown. A kala, a bride on the day of her wedding. And they ask her, they say, do you have a relative here? She says, no. She says, so why, what are you doing here? She says, look, my rabbi told me that on the, way, they, the day that I get married, Hashem forgives all of my sins. And thereby, my tefillah, my prayer has a power that no other day has. And I figured it's a waste to go take pictures. I'm going to come here for people who need refuah for people who need to recover. And I'm going to bless all of them one by one. And they had the entire section of hospital. The, the kids came out, they, they, they rolled up and they got a blessing from this bride one after the other. She spent hours in that hospital laughing and crying together with these children. Now, did she have to do that? Is there anywhere in the Torah that says you have to do that? No, absolutely not. But that's going beyond the letter of the law. That's caring for your fellow Jew. That's thinking to yourself, what would I feel if I was in their shoes? And that makes a, a real brotherhood. When you go, you're willing to go beyond the letter of the law. I'll share with you a story, another story that happened recently also in Switzerland. There's this fellow, that he's, he's an amazing Jew, in, he lives in Israel, and he does a lot of acts of kindness, a lot of chassadim, he's involved with all kinds of different things. And he traveled to Switzerland because he was helping a family that their daughter was having the surgery, a very complicated surgery. And he went with them as support. So when he checks into his hotel, he sees a family, a Jewish family, also from Israel, that their luggages are all packed. They're ready to check out and leave the hotel. He goes over to them, says, Shalom Aleichem. He greets them. He gives them a hug. He says, very from in Eretz Yisrael. He chats with them for five minutes. And he says, if it, I wish you a, a safe trip back home. Have a great day. He goes to his room. He retires for the night. He's exhausted. He's tired from the trip and running around with the hospital and everything. But he needed something, you know, almost close to midnight. He goes down to the lobby to get something. And he sees the family five hours later, still they're standing there with their luggages. And they're not gone. And he says, well, something is strange here. He walks over to the man and says, what's going on? Five hours ago you were here, you're still not gone. Is everything okay? And the father tells him, he says, actually, I'll tell you what's going on. Our flight is early hours of the morning and it's very expensive to, to stay for the night in this hotel. So we figured we're going to check out a little sooner and we're going to stay in the lobby until our taxi has to come and, uh, you know, will save a day of payment in the hotel. He says, there's no way I'm going to let you stay here in the, in the lobby. You're coming to my room. 
They say no, he, he insists, he, he schleps them back to his room up there. He calls the room service and gets food and everything. And he spends the night until the wee hours of morning schmoozing with them, talking to them, trying to get food for them and, 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 and talk and, and make them feel at home and comfortable until they, their, their taxi comes and they go, fine. He was so busy taking care of them, he forgot even to ask who they are, what their names are. Six months later, he gets a wedding invitation. And it says on it, it's addressed to the Mechutan, to the father of one of the sides. Strange, he opens the envelope. He looks at the name, there's a number. He calls the number, he says, who are you? He says, I am the, fam the father of the family that you saw six months ago in Switzerland. And let me tell you why we were in Switzerland. My daughter had ran away from home because she was sick and tired of Judaism. And she had seen this, this fellow non-Jewish pe person, gotten to know them online and she wanted to marry him. And she went there and we're not a rich family. We gathered every last penny that we had and we traveled to Switzerland to speak with her and to take her back home. We spent six days there, nothing doing really. I mean, she saw that we were broken. She saw that we were sad. So she decided that she's coming back to Israel to appease us and then gather everything that she has and go back to marry this guy until you came around. And first he came so warm, so nice, and you greeted us, and then you went up, you back, you came back in the middle of the night, and you insisted to take us in. Who brings in a stranger family to his room when they're tired, they're, they're exhausted from the trip from the hospital, but you spent, not only you brought us in, you stayed up with us to feed us, to, to speak to us, to, feel us to, to make us feel at home and comfortable. And when we were on the plane on the way back, my daughter said, finally, said, you know, we saw so many Jews. But if an Erlecha Jew, if, if a righteous Jew looks like this, I have a lot to reconsider. And this was the beginning of, of her process of coming back. And then she met this wonderful, she dropped that the non-Jew, she met this wonderful boy, and they're getting married. And if anybody is the Mechutan here, it's you. You're the closest thing to the family. I want you to be their dance with us. Now, did this man have to do that? No. Does it say anywhere in the Torah that you have to do it? No. But the love dictates to go beyond the letter of law. That's relationship. Relationship is measured by how much you are going beyond the letter of law. And boy, we want relationship back with Hashem. Today, Tisha B'Av is a day of, of relationship. It's a day of yearning, as we mentioned before. We want to say, Abba, Tati, Daddy, we miss you. Bring us back home. We know you're still there. You haven't given, given up on us. That builds and ensures the Jewish continuity. Without Tisha B'Av, we have no future in Galut. If we give up on that relationship, if we stop yearning, we have lost it all. I want to end with, with a mesmerizing story I heard from Rav Biederman. In the early 1900s, there was a very difficult situation in Eretz Israel, in Israel for, for people, the Parnassah, the livelihood was very, very tight, very difficult. And there was this rabbi that had a cheder, a little Torah class for, for, for kids, little kids, eight, nine years old. And he gathered little by little, saved up little flour until on Rosh Chodesh, Shabbat, they didn't have real that much food, but Rosh Chodesh he, was a big deal for him. And his wife made a beautiful honey cake to be divided between the students for this kids, his students. And he comes there, he says, Rosh Chodesh, you have to be happy. And he cuts a small little tiny piece and he gives to each one of the students and their, their eyes pop up and they're so happy, so excited. And there was this little kid that he smelt the cake. He saw the cake, says, this is too good for me. I'm going to keep this for my daddy, for my father, for my Abba. I love my Abba so much. I'm going to keep it for my Abba. And he takes some piece of cloth. He wraps it in. 
and he saves it for his father. Then comes the time for the first break. The, the, you know, the class goes out and he's hungry. His stomach is grumbling and he opens the cake. He takes one small bite and then he quickly closes and he puts it back for his Abba, saves it for his father. Comes the second recess. He's still hungry. His, his smell of the cake is going through his head. He takes it out. He says, one small bite. On the other side, he quickly puts it back. Comes lunchtime. He's starving. He has nothing to eat. He hasn't eaten a proper meal for days. He takes it out. He has another small piece and says, that's it. I'm not taking any more. He wraps it. He puts it in his pocket. The school finishes. He runs home. He says, Abba, Abba. I have a matana for you. I have a gift. Abba says, matana? Bring it. Let me see. And when the Abba opens this, he looks at the bitten parts of the cake. He sees the struggle of the sun. He sees the hard work that the, the sun has controlled himself. He doesn't see weakness. He sees the strength. To withhold, we, we miss a lot. We try. We live in 2020. We try our best. And we mess up a lot of times. But our Abba, when he opens our life and looks at us, he sees the trying. He sees the struggle. He sees that we want that relationship back. And if we really want it back, even if we have bitten up, pieces of history in our lives. Hashem only sees the love. He only sees the struggle and the strength that we put in. And Be'ezrat Hashem, through that, when we realize that we have a relationship with Him, when we realize that Tisha B'Av is a day of yearning for that relationship, for wanting Him back out of the hospital bed, and we say, we will never again leave your sight. We'll always be there for you. Then Hashem is going to bring back that Yom Tov that the Tisha B'Av is called a Moed. It's going to bring back that Moed. And we're going to once again merit to see the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your beautiful words. Thank you. So heartfelt. Thanks. This is what, it's, this is what it's all about. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We are now going to call on uh, Roy Rain as our Acharon, Acharon Chaviv. The last is the favorite. And we are so thankful for Roy for being here and being such a big uh, support of Aish. So we are thankful um, for you, for you being here. And Rabbi Yisraeli, I just want to say your words are so true because we need to at least try. That's what matters. People think, oh, I can't do everything, so forget it. But really, it's about trying. And when Hashem sees that we try, that's that's when we go into our new year. We go into Rosh Hashanah after. And we we show that we want a new year. Enough. We need we long. It's not just the building. We're longing for meaning and purpose. And and enough. Ayeka, Echa, where am I? I don't want that same empty world, which is so meaningless. I want meaning in my life to be fighting, to have a bechia, but not a bechia chinam. I want to have a, a cry. I want to have a cry for a good reason, not for no reason, not a baseless cry, but a cry and power it for tefillah, for prayer. And we're so thankful for you for being a big part of this community, for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rabbi. So we're now going to call in Roy Rain. Thank you, Roy Rain, for being here and uh joining us today as well Roy, Thank you, Rabbi. you're on the, the floor is yours oh man i got to follow up after rabbi israeli what an honor <laughs> so i wanted to share with you guys <laughs> a small tidbit i'm sure you've heard a lot here's my uh, assistant lovely assistant ella <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you guys have heard a lot about baseless hatred i don't want to talk about the gemara kamsa bar kamsa but let's just try to dig deep. What is baseless hatred? Why do we have, I mean, if anybody is living under a rock, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about, but we all judge people unfavorably. You know, we all jump to conclusions with others. And 
for the next 25 minutes, Billy Editor, let's try to understand why we do that and how do we change that? Because at the end of the day, if we change that about ourselves, we're gonna feel much better. We're gonna be more powerful. We're gonna have that tranquility, you know, that zen that we need to succeed in everything in life. So we'll start with a quick question. Um, why, what is basis hatred? And to really understand what that is, we have to look at one of my favorite personalities in the Torah. His name is Joseph. If anybody's heard of Joseph, if you haven't heard of him, just Google his story. Unbelievable personality. So it starts like this. Joseph was one of Jacob's children. He's one of the 12 tribes. And he is sold into slavery, basically, right, by his own brothers. And he goes through a lot. But I want to focus, after he gets sold into slavery, he gets falsely accused then of rape, which he didn't do. Uh, Me Too movement, first, first guy there. But he was actually innocent. And then he goes into jail. Not any jail. You know, this isn't like a jail in California, God forbid. This is Egypt, you know, thousands of years ago. I want to give you one verse from the Torah. Joseph is in jail. Joseph comes from royalty, right? The, this is the family, the lineage of the 12 tribes. You know, this is where the Jewish people come from. His dad was a very respected personality. He finds himself in jail. And he sees two people a little down. And he says the following, Why are you sad today? Now, if that doesn't take you back a little bit, what, what does he mean? What does he mean, what, why, why are you sad today? Hello, we're in jail. <laughs> like, who wouldn't be sad? We see such an amazing insight from that little one-liner. We see one thing is the word today. Why are you sad today? That insinuates that every other day, everybody was happy. And we learn an amazing thing about Joseph's personality. See, Joseph was that guy. You know, you ever been to a room, there's a guy who is just full of energy, full of positivity, and everybody is just like on cloud nine because of him, right? If you look at some of these entrepreneurs, you will notice that sense about them. You know, you'll notice that mega personality. Now, Joseph had that to the 10th degree. Anywhere Joseph went, he succeeded. You know, everywhere he went, he brought people up not people down. And it's a, it's it's such a different personality than perhaps we're used to. You know, Rabbi Israeli, who just spoke, he says there's two types of people in the world. There's people who bring themselves up by bringing themselves up, bringing their, holding themselves to higher standards, right? Pushing themselves. And there's others who bring themselves up by bringing everybody else down. It was really easy to bring yourself up by, oh, that guy's a nobody, and that guy's this, and that guy's this, and you know that just means I'm the best by doing nothing. Joseph was the first type. Joseph was the one who brought everybody else up with him, and you know he looked, he noticed others around him. Right, he's in jail, and he notices these two people having a bad day. How often do we go out our days, our lives, our jobs, our, you know, picking up the coffee, picking up groceries, going through everything and not noticing those around you. So I'll tell you two, two quick stories, three quick stories. Yeah. One story is, you know, every, every time you go into the office, I'm sure everybody does it. Hey, how you doing? And the typical response is sure, you know, good. If they're a little religious, thank God, whatever. One time I actually had somebody pour their heart out. And as a joke, I told them, you know, by the way, they're, they're, they weren't American, they're a foreigner. And I guess, hey, how are you doing from where they're coming from is an actual real question. I was like, you know, here in America, nobody actually re expects a reply. <laughs> it's just more of a common decency. Hey, how are you doing? Um, but we, we ended up talking and hopefully they felt better. I'll tell you a second story. I was at Krispy Kreme this Sunday with my kids. And there was a, I'm not going to get political, you know, this is not a political forum, but there was a, a large white individual in front of me in line. And the cashier was an African-American gentleman. The guy waited in line in front of me, got to his turn, 
and I had three, I had my kids and somebody else's kids with me. So lo and behold, I had no idea what's going on. <laughs> I was, my hands were full to say the least. All I heard was the white guy cursing and the other guy saying, oh, so you're a racist. And turns out he said some racial slur and didn't even buy any donuts. He literally just came there to curse the guy or to say something. I don't know what it was. And the guy's name was Willie behind the counter. And I spent maybe the next 90 seconds just talking to Willie. And, and, and I told him something that I tell myself. I told him, you know, Willie, the problem is not with you. You know, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like, that should never happen to anybody. But you're not the problem. He, that guy has a problem. Mm. Yeah, that guy has a problem. He has a major problem. You're fine. You know, the fact that, you know, I heard something, and this is the impetus for what I told him. If David speaks badly about Jonathan, David's the guy who has a problem. I, okay, fine. Jonathan is the one who was spoken about, but David is the one going about, you know, speaking negatively. If we harbor ill will, if we harbor negativity towards someone, that person is living his life just fine. We're the ones harboring that negativity, you know? And that was the beauty of Joseph. And it, he saw those around him. He saw who needs a little picking up. And everybody around us, if we notice, there's always somebody who can use a little boost of energy, a little positivity. You know, it took me 90 seconds to speak to this person behind the counter who my heart really went out to him. Right? That, that it is such a non-Jewish belief to put others down. You know, in Judaism, we bring others up. We bring the world up. I was talking, this was not part of the three story, so this will be the four story. But I was talking to a, uh, a friend of my child's. Their mother is a Korean convert. And I asked her, you know, Korea is very big on the Talmud. I asked her, how, is, how are Jews viewed in Korea? And why do they start, I don't know if you know, but in the actual curriculum in public schools, they study Talmud in Korea, in South Korea. North Korea, they might kill you for it. But South Korea, they actually study Talmud. And she told me that, you know, we, we're very studious, we the Korean people. We're all about education. We're all about, you know, getting the best grades, pushing our children to, to make the most of their lives. And we couldn't figure out that how the Jews have given more to the world disproportionately than any other nation. And we decided it's because you guys study the Talmud. So almost every Korean house has two volumes of Talmud. That's what she said. And the school system, you could Google that, the school system is teaching the Talmud. And when she said that, I was so proud to be a Jew. You know, I was so like, wow, that's who we are, right? We give back to the world. We give back to society. We bring up society. We do all of these positive things. For society, that's what we do, right? We don't just look at ourselves. We look at those around us. That was Joseph. Joseph was that guy who looked around him. What is happening around him? Who needs a little picking up? And that's the secret to Tisha B'Av. You know, Tisha B'Av should teach us not to be so confined to ourselves, not to look just into ourselves. What is my life about? But what, is, what does that guy need? What does that person need? How can I help this person? There was a, a poor lady in front of a grocery store. I think it was in New Jersey. Rabbi Wallerstein tells this story. And every morning, every Friday morning at least, she would come to the grocery store, put a chair in front of it, and wait for people to come out and give her a buck or two. And that's how she would make her, her living. You know, she's an older Jewish woman. And she lived off that tzedakah. One morning... He sees a young Beis Yaakov girl come up to this woman, give her a coffee, and give her a Danish. And Rabbi Wallerstein goes up to the girl and he says, what made you give her a Danish and a coffee? You know, everybody else is giving her a dollar. She says something fascinating. He says, we can learn so much from this young girl. He says, you know, every morning I come, every Friday morning, when I come to shop, I always see this lady there. If I come at 9 a.m., if I come at 11, if I come at 12, she's always there. And I asked her one time, you must be starving because anytime I come here, you're just sitting on that chair. Have you eaten anything today? 
And I think it was like 12 o'clock or one o'clock by that time. And she said, no, she said, look, she can't get up from her chair because if she goes and gets food, she will miss 10, 15 customers. That's po possibly 10 to $15 of, of charity she's missing. And she can't afford to do that. So ever since then, this girl on her own, because she looked outside herself, she noticed somebody in need of something. She goes and she gets her the Danish and the coffee. And Robert Wallstein was so amazed. And we should all look at that and say, wow, you know, all she did was take it a step further. You know, all she did was look at what, what does this person really need? You know, and it's, it's the same in, uh, not to digress, but in relationships, right? A lot of times your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or, you know, fill in the blank will say one thing, but really they mean something totally different. You know, they, they actually mean X and they're saying Y and you got to go into the, uh, you know, relationship dictionary and figure out what that is. Or you can just see through them. What, what do they, what do they want? You know, if a child misbehaves 99% of the time, or I think Rabbi Malul and Rabbits and Malul will tell us they just want attention. You know, I was at Trader Joe's right now doing some shopping and, uh, and my 18 month old was throwing a fit because he wanted to throw the five dozen eggs that we got onto the floor. He thought it would look really cool. Um, you know, luckily I was, I was going to keep us. So I guess I could have let him do that, but <laughs> didn't think it'd be the greatest uh, use of eggs in Trader Joe's faculty. So I didn't let him do that. He threw a fit and all he wanted after, you know, three, four minutes of crying was for me to hold him. So again, had I not been on the phone, I would have probably realized that earlier, <laughs> but we need to just be attuned to other people's feelings, be attuned to what they want, you know, be attuned to what they really need, you know, and that's, again, that's the beauty. And, and the second lesson we see from Joseph, I don't know which is more important. It's, I'm speaking to myself more than anybody else because I can't even see anybody in this uh, backstage thing. So <laughs> it feels like you're talking to yourself. It's great. So the second thing was his positivity outlook. You know, I read, I highly recommend it. If you're into reading, there's a book called Positivity Bias. It's about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And it shows us how he always saw things in the positive. He always saw things in a positive light, you know? And, and that, was, that was Joseph. You know, Rav Noach Zatzal, Rav Noach Weinberg, the founder of Aish. Whenever he'd come back from America, the Rejari was telling me this. If he didn't raise enough money to support the yeshiva, he would say, you know, we need to study more. We as an age, the yeshiva, we need to step up our efforts and then God will give us more. And it, it's, this is such a, a different outlook. You know, if I came back and didn't do well, I'd be like so down on myself. But the people we need to learn from, we need to aspire to, they see things in a different light. You know, King Solomon says that Sadiq falls seven times and gets back up. It's not about the falling. It's about getting back up because everybody falls. I was listening to a uh, NPR on how I built this on Steve Madden. Interesting personality. He's Jewish, by the way. Not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing given his history, but <laughs> he is Jewish. His mom's Jewish. His dad is Catholic. And he went through, if you ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, he was part of that uh, Ponzi scheme. And they launched that, that company where the Wolf of Wall Street worked. They actually launched Steve Madden public. And it was all a scam and they scammed people out of money. And he ended up going to jail for, I think, 31 months. And when he came out, the interview, Guy, Guy Ross asked him a fascinating question. He said, when he came out of jail, you know, how did it feel? How was the life? And he said, you know, he went to get pizza after. And he will never forget the taste of that pizza. Sounds really good right about now. How much do we have? Another hour or so left. He said he would never forget that pizza tasted phenomenal, like God sent. And everything after he got out of jail was like, ah, you know, like he was in heaven because the food there sucked. He lived in, in, a, in, a, in barracks, basically. You know, so a nice bed was just so, he was just, everything was amazing. And we complain about things that we should never complain about. You know, if, if we think about, if we write down, Rev. Noah Weinberg's that's always big on lists. If we try to write down what we complain about in life, 
I think we're all going to be really fascinated as to what those things are. Because it's, it's never the big things, you know, it's always, you know, a person complains about their, their flat tire or this, or, you know, they, they have this headache at work or they have this, I was just getting, I just got off the phone with somebody who, you know, lost a little bit of business, but thank God they just gained so much more business on the other end of things. And they, they're seeing the negative. Rabbi Torsky, Dr. Abraham uh, Torsky, he's the head of a hospital in Cleveland. He's a rabbi and a doctor. He's, he talks about a study. They put a white piece of paper up with a little black dot. And I think it was nine out of 10 people would, when, they, when, when they're asked, what do you see? See, we see a black dot, right? We're trained to see the negative. We're trained not to look at the positive, but rather to look for the problems in life and focus on them. And Joseph was the opposite. You know, that's what, what I love about Joseph. We could all look up to him in that. He always saw the positive. He had so much to complain about. He had so much beef he could have had with God. Yet his connection to God remained steadfast. You know, and that that was the reason. It says God was with him in everything. You know, and it's, it's hard to see God when you were thrown in prison for no reason, when you were sold to a foreign country for no reason. But Joseph had that ability, that gift, what we call nowadays a muna and bitachon, to see God is with me. God wants me in this situation. I don't know why, but God wants me in that situation. And because he had that faith, loosely translated as faith, because he had that, he was able to go through his challenges, which I don't think any of us have, thank God. But he was able to go through all of those challenges and rise to become the viceroy of Egypt. And everything he attributed to God, he never took credit. He was a true tzaddik. He brought everybody up and he always gave credit to where credit deserves. And we'll get to point number two, but that is one of the reasons they say Kabbalistically, there's one person who was immune to Ainara, to the evil eye, so to speak. Okay, we won't get into the, de the details of what that is. That could be a separate topic. Rabbi Jack, I'm sure, would be happy to give a class on that. But Joseph and Joseph's descendants are immune to any, you know, the, the best way to describe it is, is others negatively impacting your life, right? Joseph was immune to that. Why? Because he connected every blessing he had back to God. You know, even when he goes in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh asks him, oh my gosh, I heard you can interpret dreams. Joseph can take all the credit in the world. Right? He goes, oh, yeah, of course. You know, I'm, I'm the dream interpreter. Instead, he says, Biladai, Elohim ya paro. It's not me. God will answer Pharaoh. God is the one who's going to answer him. I got, I'm nothing. Right? I'm just a messenger. And it's, it, again, it's an amazing trait we can take. And like we said, the second thing that, that Joseph had was that ability to see the positive and not the negative. Right. And the first Tisha B'Av, you know, where did this holiday, by the way, this is a holiday. So even though we're fasting, even though we're, we're not wearing leather shoes, we're, you know, we're, we're not doing a lot of fun stuff and it's a sad day, but it is a quasi Yom Tov. Because when Mashiach comes, this will turn into a, a, a full fledged holiday. And let me change positions, ADB kicking in. And the reason is, the reason we even have to shout out, the first to shout out ever in history was when the spies came back from Israel. Moses sent 12 spies to go visit the land of Israel and to give a report. And it's a long story why they went. You know, one opinion is that, I think Rashi brings it, is that the people were kind of iffy. You know, what is this land of Israel that we're going to go to? And Moses, to alleviate their concern, it's, you know, if you're going to buy a used car, Say, what is this car? How, how does it drive? This and that. If the car salesman says, go ahead, test drive it, I feel confident. I don't need to. And that was kind of Moses' thing. So he, he didn't expect them to actually not believe him and, and want to send spies, but they sent 12 spies. 10 of the 12 spies came back and gave a terrible report of the land of Israel. I mean, totally bashed the country. Terrible. It eats in its inhabitants, etc. Fine. God heard this. And now imagine, you know, God has just orchestrated the biggest mass exodus in history. An entire nation leaving Egypt, right? Kabbalistically, no, no nation has ever left Egypt because they had so much black magic 
to prevent a nation from leaving. If anybody's seen Game of Thrones, right? The wall, the wall has all that black magic that, you know, the, who are the dead people who can't come in because of that black magic. And all of a sudden, finally, the, the dragons were able to kill it, et cetera. But that, that's where they got that from, right? Egypt had that black magic, keeping the Jews in, keeping all the slaves in. And Hashem broke through everything. The Jews got out. The Jews had water in the desert. The Jews had miracles left and right in the desert, food, everything you could think of. And God is in their presence. There's a clause of glory. God is there. You don't have to look farther. They saw God. They were at Sinai. They literally heard the word of God. They heard God speaking. And yet they're complaining and they don't trust that God is bringing them into a land flowing of milk and honey. So God said, you know what? Because you complain today for no reason, I will give you a reason to complain for eternity on this day. And that's when that day, by the way, was Tisha B'Av, was the ninth of Av. That's when this day became what it is. That's when it came into existence. And it's sad, but, you know, we complain to God. How often do we give God a hard time because, God, why didn't you give me this deal? Or, God, why you know, why'd you give me this headache to deal with? And we overlook all the positive things God gave us. You know, who are we? There was a famous rabbi. I'm, I'm blinking on his name, possibly because I'm dehydrated. But there's a famous rabbi who, who, who had all these diseases at the end of his life. And his students came to him and they said, Rabbi, you know, how do you still have a Muna? How do you still, how, how do you still kick it? You know, we, I, we would be a little upset with God. And the rabbi said, you know, that, that is such a flawed outlook. Because what did I do to deserve 80, 90 years of life? That's a gift God gave. And that's a gift God can take at any time. It's God's gift. Right? What did we do to deserve life? And we really have to have that positive outlook. You know, it, it, it's, it's more for us than for anybody else, right? If we can take those two things that Joseph had, the ability to see the pain of others, the ability and the desire to bring others up with him, right? If we can take that, that first trait of Joseph, that love of people, that love of, of doing good, and that second trait of Joseph of always seeing the positive, you know, always seeing the good, right? Positivity bias. You know, there was a, uh, there's a story in, in that book, Positivity Bias. There's a group of Chabadniks, Chabad Rebbitsons. They had a conference, I think it was in Atlanta, and they were stuck in the airport. It was Friday morning. Their flights were canceled, weather delays. They're stuck in the airport. They call the Rebbe. They get a secretary, and they tell him we're stuck. And the Rebbe, one of his famous clients, said, a Jew is never stuck. A Jew is never stuck. Where are you? We're in the airport. We're, we're walking around. What do you have with you? We got, I don't know, we got, uh, we got our stuff. He said, do you have Shabbos candles? You know, do you have a little challahs? He said, yes. They said, yeah. So go around the airport and give Shabbos candles and challahs to people. I mean, simple. That's what God wants you to do. You know, and so many times in life, hindsight is twenty twenty, But it, wherever we are, that's where God wants us to be. You know, whatever situation we're in, that is where we're supposed to be. And if we have that mindset, if we bring those around us up with us, if we see the good, you know, hopefully it's going to be the last Tisha B'Av we have. You know, we, we break that pattern of baseless hatred. We love everyone around us. I don't care what your name is, what your color, your skin is, what where nationality you are. It doesn't matter. You're made in God's image. The Torah literally says man is made in the image of God. We're all in the image of God, even your most annoying child, which I won't tell you which one it is for me, but <laughs> even he's in the image of God. That gives it away. You got a one out of two chance now figuring it out. But Bezrat Hashem, may we always take that with us, that, that positivity, and may it change our year and our, and our lives forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Roy. I think you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh, thank you very much for your beautiful words. Uh, this yeah. has been an amazing day, packed, and uh, you were the last one and you spoke so beautifully. So thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your fast. And um, we, we together, after uh, COVID-19, uh, we can come together again in Jerusalem, Bezat Hashem. 
as one, as a people together uh, with the idea that we are closer to Hashem, we're closer to that longing that, we're deep in, that we deeply want and we can embrace that meaningful lifestyle that we all deep from within desire and yearn. And that's what this day was. It sparked within us a sense of where am I, who am I, and that sense of yearning for growth and meaning. So uh, that's that's been a really beautiful day today, uh, as hard as it is to say that, but it really has been a beautiful day. And thank you so much for being here. And like I said, um, enjoy the rest of your fast because soon it's going to finish. So when you know it's almost over, it's okay, you know. So. Uh, Thank you. Someone asked me, are we going to do this next year? I said, I hope not. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, I just want to thank also my wife who's behind the scenes here. Um, also making this organization happen. Aishlit is a, an amazing community. If you're out there listening, watching, subscribe on our YouTube channel. It would support us and um, join our age lit community in Los Angeles. We have an amazing community for young professionals. You can ask Roy if you don't believe me because I run it. So Roy could tell you how amazing it is. Very good. Yeah. It's his house back in the day. <laughs> yep, yep. Amazing. COVID. That's yeah. amazing. So, um, so thank God. Uh, please subscribe. We should only hear good news. We should always be together strong and find meaning in the lives that we live. Amen. 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 Adonai chadesh yamenu kekedem. May Hashem, and I said his full name, uh, bring us back and renew ourselves just like we always were. We don't even realize how strong and how powerful the Jewish people were. We still are, but how much energy and power we had. And we hope that we can have that connection, that energy that we used to have back then. Um, and that's my prayer to everyone. So everyone who's been listening, thank you for listening. Uh, Roy, thank you for being here. Thank you for being the yeah. closing uh, of the evening. And um, please stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, thank you. Roy. See you, Roy. Thank you.